Hello everyone. Thanks for joining the CCNP Dev Core course. You can see the paper code is 350901. In this course, we are going to learn five major sections. And you can see the weightage is 20% for each section. Starting with software development and design, then using APIs, understanding Cisco platforms for the programming, application deployment and security, and finally, infrastructure and automation. So I'm going to hit all these topics, sections and subsections one by one. Please go complete all these modules, all these videos, and you're going to complete your CCNP dev core. In section one, the total weightage is 20%. And the section you can see that is going to deal with software development and design. So we are going to understand about the software development and design methodology. Let me show you the list of topics here. Here you can see uh, the list of topics here is starting from 1.1 .1 up to 1.12. So one by one in upcoming sections, you'll, you will find that I'm going to describe all these methodologies and whenever it is required to understand with the labs as well i'm going to present the lab as well okay so let's uh, start with 1.1 .1 subsection 1.1 we have to understand about concept of front end back end and load balancing okay now the concept is very easy uh, it's something called client and uh, server type of relationship but what is happening in the production network that you have three tier architecture so if we check any of the data center or any of the application design you'll find that you have something called front end front end belongs to client so whoever is logging to the devices they are putting their input information that is a front end Okay, and in three tier architecture, it is referred as a web. Okay, then you have the back end. Now, the back end, it, it will be the collection of app applications and DB because, anyways, you have to store those queries, you have to store those input that is coming from the client. So, all those transactions should be a store. So, that's why the DB will come into the picture. But the application layer is something that is purely belonging to the programmers. They have to develop, maintain the applications. And we will see in upcoming sections that the client to server relationship or the front end to back end communications that is going to happen. Uh, it should be designed in a way that there should be uh, performance. So there should not be any performance system. It should be scalable, available, high performance, resiliency, all those parameters we are going to check in upcoming section. Okay. So now we understood that we have client side that is nothing but the front end and there the language may be used. And these are the easy type of encoding languages or uh, the language like HTML, CSS, JavaScripts. These are the front end. And these languages, frameworks are React, Angular, and so on. Others are there. Now, when we are talking about the back end, that is nothing but the server side. There, core application development, core, core software development will come into the picture. And you can see the development languages are Java, C++, Python, PHP, so on. So uh, application-related uh, um, programming languages. Correct. Now, so what we are going to discuss here in this section is that, okay, uh, when we are talking about that you have the users, that means you have the front end, but chances are that you may have good amount of requests that is coming from the users. And then suppose if you have limited number of server, for example, if you have only three servers, and what if all the requests will go to server one only? Suppose thousands of clients, they are sending their 10 of requests. So that, that means 10,000 of requests is going to only one server. It is not properly load balance, etc. Correct? So that means you will get the performance hit. You're not balancing the requested coming from different, different clients. 
correct so in that case you need a one load balancer who is doing their magic and what i have done just after this video i have added one of the video related to next uh, nsxt that is the vmware data center solution nsxt so nsxt related load balancer video uh, taking this point into consideration that you should understand the load balancing concept so 10 minute video after this you can go and watch you'll understand the uh, intricacies you can understand that the terminologies used the inside the load balancer so what is the whip what is the pool of addresses uh, how they are doing the load balancing what is the methodology all all those important points i try to hit here in this particular video after this video you can watch it so yeah you can see here the design that you have uh, with the front end that's your client and then you have your application servers and then you have a dv so three tier uh, architecture correct you have app i'm oh, sorry you have a web app and dv so this is a web and then you have app and then you have db correct so you can uh, check this now when we are using the load balancer again you will find in this video so you will get higher ability uh, and reliability reduced downtime redundancy flexibility and efficiency now this is one of the design but still we are looking for some more uh, real time design some more productive design because if you go and check the enterprise architecture big big uh, enterprise network you will find that those clients and those servers they are geographically distributed anywhere means they can be anywhere somewhere in asia europe um, americas anywhere so client may be anywhere servers may be in anywhere they may be physical they may be over the cloud etc so in that case to do the load balancing from one location is not practical it's not a good design as well so what we need that you need some sort of caching servers you need content delivery network near to the source and who is your source actually source is nothing but your client so near to your request you can think like this so near to the request you have the cache servers a caching servers where a load balancing is other thing a caching so request a response some sort of caching will be there so requests and responses they are cached to the local uh, server geographically located anywhere you can see the cache here uh, one cache but yeah it's it's actually near near to the web tier near to the client tier where you have the client correct i suppose if you have client at different different geographical locations so different different caching servers are there and if you have any knowledge of aws type of caching uh, you will understand more and more so they they have nice structure uh, application structure will understand that they are providing caching servers uh, near to the client okay and you can see that the caching is there and then you have the backend in backend you have the uh, application and you will find that actually this is the web cache so that's why it's a web the caching and then everything is going to the web so before the request will reach to the uh, actual web server you have the client cache and then it is going to the main request and now everything is in the back end it's like a, a distributed type of architecture where you are caching so here you have the speed correct and for all the client to reach here it may be round trip timer issue or latency issues etc etc so your request is going to the caching server and from caching server it is going to the back end where you have the actual web that's your distributed system web app and db it is in the same place but you can understand how things are working correct so you have caching server so the request uh, response will be faster here and then behind the scene in the back back end uh, the web cache and the actual web they are doing the communication and then it is going to the app and the business transaction will be the faster so this is one of the design by default it is there in the aws type of uh, technologies okay all right so let's uh, stop here
next topic we have nxxt load balancer in this particular session we'll study that what is the use of load balancing means what's the benefit that load balancing is offering inside the nsxt and what's the architecture most of us we know that what's the use of the load balancer in a network because we have popular uh, load balancer in a market so for example f5 basically the use of the load balancer is that it is offloading the load so suppose if we have multiple users and suppose if we have servers now suppose we have 10k uh, user request that is coming for the application access and in between you don't have any device who is going to do the balance of the load for the query that is coming uh, to these servers so that means there are chances that all the 1000k query can go and hit one of the servers suppose this is server 1 the server 2 the server 3 and rest of the servers they may get unutilized so they are they don't know that the query is for them because all of the query is handled by one of the server so there is no mechanism in between that someone can take those queries and then on behalf of the users so suppose these are the user query or user request on behalf of users someone can do the load balancing so not only that they can ba balance the load and we have advanced mechanism advanced algorithm to balance the load apart from that suppose if one of the server or two of the server is down so if services are unavailable then still the load balances can handle that okay so let's see that uh, what's the architecture first of all what's the use we have so we have something called whip i will uh, cover this whip in the upcoming slide uh, what is happening that in between you have load balancer he is working for user request and then he is distributing those requests so whatever request is coming he is doing some sort of load balancing method in between for the server so in between the load balance is working like this uh, the technical term here you can see that uh, external request that is coming that will be balanced with help of the virtual ip so so for outside user they think that their destination is the virtual ip but virtual ip take those requests and then it, it will uh, equally distribute the load among the different type of servers in a pool we'll see that all those terms what benefits we have we have two main benefits one is a scale out and the high availability a scale out means that you are balancing the load across say physical server or vm workload or the containers the other benefit we have is the high availability of servers so if any of the services are down this load balancer will obviously it will report that hey this particular server is down you do something to bring this up uh, meanwhile i am balancing or i am sending the user request to the other available servers so that's the high availability we have apart from that you can see that we have advanced mechanism advanced algorithm that the load balancer can handle or equally distribute the load across the pool of servers or server pools correct so let's go and see that in nsxt what type of load balancing architecture we have this is the architecture representation inside the nsxt that means uh, tier 0 devices or tier 0 label they are not supporting load balancers uh, if you want to create load balancer it should be tied with tier 1 that's the first important point so load balancers are tied with say, tier 1 and tier 2 say for example routers and one load balancer is tied with only one of the uh, tier 1 router that is the first architecture thing that we should note and uh, remind the other thing here you can see clearly that we have virtual server in the upcoming slide we'll discuss about virtual server you have pool and you have monitor so what is happening here that you have virtual server and something say related to ip plus some tcp udp port number that's the virtual server virtual server you can see that can be mapped with a certain number of pools but the monitor you can see the monitor one or monitor two etc we'll see in the lab section but monitor is mapped only with one of the pool uh, 
or I will reiterate this that pool having one monitor, but monitor can have multiple pool. You got my point. So that's the point I want to uh, make here. So for example, pool, you can see uh, pool one or pool two. So pool is mapped with one monitor, but uh, monitor can have, so I can write like say one to N. One monitor can be used by uh, different type of pools. So here also you can see one monitor is used by different type of pools, but one pool be tracked by only one monitor. It's not like pool two is connected with monitor one and monitor two. So that's the thing we have. So architecture point of view that one tier one having one load balancer, one load balancer can have multiple virtual servers, one virtual servers, one virtual server can have multiple pool, one pool will be tired with one of the monitor. All right, so knowing these facts, let's go and see the definitions of all those uh, things that we have here. You can see clearly load balancer can only be attached with tier one gateways, not tier zero gateway and one tier gateway can have only one load balancer. Apart from that, we have virtual server. Virtual server is something that outside client, so client can see the VIP and this VIP is nothing but the combination of IP and TCP UDP ports. So in our example, we have uh, VS1, 2, 5 and 6. That is nothing but basically the combination of IP and the port. Then we have pool. Pool is nothing but you can group different type of servers inside the pool. In the lab section, you will understand that how you can create the pool and you can group together. Monitor. We have multiple tracking mechanisms. So monitor is nothing but the tracking mechanism and uh, we'll see that we have different type of monitoring option, but uh, one monitor. So one here you can see single pool can be used only one monitor, but the same monitor can be used by different pool. Okay, so one to one, um, one to many. So pool having one monitor, but monitor can have different pool correct all right so knowing all these facts and the figures let's stop here next topic we have to understand the application scalability and the application modularity so let's understand both now when we are talking about the modular approach at that time what we want we actually want that our application should be developed in different different models rather than they are part of one monolithic big program or big project if you have programs in different different models then it's easy to maintain it's easy to troubleshoot it's easy to innovate okay and you will see that the modern operating systems modern SDN system and I have taken one example related to Cisco ACI SDN solution and after this video you can go and watch ACI object model where I have explained about the classes and models that we have inside the ACI. Okay, so you'll understand more and more about the modular approach and its practical usability inside the ACI system. Okay, so after this video please go and watch the modularity example related to Cisco ACI. Now coming back to the modularity approach, you can see that we can create the uh, small, small models, modules. And if we have these small, small modules, it's easy to manage, easy to improve and easy to troubleshoot as well. Okay, so that's the uh, modularity approach we have. Now here I have listed the benefits of the modular approach, like it's easy to replace, the smaller independent projects, understand and easy to understand troubleshoot. Um, we can do, do the testing easily means all sort of important uh, aspects we have. One use case we have that suppose if you have a small, small functions, then these functions can be called inside different, different programs, different, different projects whenever we are using it. So same function can be re reused in different different places and same type of approach we are using in the api call as well remember for api you'll find to get the vlan you have different api to get the layer 2 vlan you may have different api to get the interface status you have different api to get the switch port you have different api and if you want 
to add these inside same project to get the information about the VLAN and in, uh, information about the switchboard. We can club all these small, small APIs in one API and you can print out the result in any type of CSV or PDF. So different type of uh, output format, you can get the result. Okay, so more about the modularity you'll find after this video, that's the ACI object model. Please have a look on that after this video. Now let's continue and focus on the other part of this section is the scalability. Now, when we are talking about the scalability, so once you completed your project, now your project should be a scalable in terms of administrative scalability. That means that uh, it can be consumed by the more organizations or users. Then functional scalability. That means you can add more and more and more functions. So small, small uh, program, small, small modules inside your main routine or inside your main function. So generally we are defining main as a function and then you can have function one, two, three, etc. You can add it. So administrative scalability, function scalability, geographical scalability, is for very important because nowadays the businesses are across the globe. So you should have the geographical scalability of the code, then load scalability, you can go and use the load balances. And again, in this section also, I will show you one distributed architecture load balancer in the upcoming slide. But in the previous section, and we have one dedicated video for uh, load balancing and scalability, you can have a look on that as well. Then uh, generation, Scalability means you should adopt the new generation, new innovations, new product inside your uh, program, and then you should have the mix vendor approach. So different, different vendors you can adjust while you are uh, doing the scalability. Now, if you go and learn more about the scalability, we'll find that we have two approach. One is up, down. Sometimes we are telling this is a, a scalable, Vertically means north to south or you know, up to down, down to up, etc. And one is horizontal, that means you're going east to west, correct? In, out, out, in, etc. Now, these are also uh, tested models inside our networking. That means if you have one fixed system and if you want to increase its performance, so you can go and add CPU memory storage, correct? So this is something like vertical, uh, vertically, you are improving the system. But problem here is this, that you are not, you, you don't have a distributed system. Means you are not a scaling like this. You are improving one resource capability, but you, you don't have the multiple resources where you can do, where you can go and do the load balancing, correct? Because your approach is single system going to enhance. The problem with this is that, there should be one limit. After that, you can't increase the CPU memory or storage. But if we have this scaling horizontal approach, that means that you can go and add the CPU memory. You can do the load balancing if you have uh, more use of CPU memory or storage, etc. So always the horizontal approach is good, but sometimes you need the mix of both means you need hybrid approach. So you need one good system model with premium quality, but you need supporters as well. So that means you need the vertical scale, plus you need the horizontal scale as well. You need both the scaling methodology. Everything inside the ACI model is an object. And we are going to learn a lot about the object and the modeling and the object reference point. We'll see one by one all those things. ACI logical model overview, how it is. So if someone asks that, okay, what is the difference uh, in between the traditional network and the new network, like SDN type of network, you'll find that in the new network, we have something called database. So all these new network SDN type of network, they have the database controllers or the controllers can work as a database. In our case, in ACI, we have database management engine and everything we have uh, in terms of objects. Now, what is the other new thing we have in the new type of network that we have new interface to do the configuration for the object oriented uh, programming infrastructure? 
So now we have the API. Initially, we used to configure via CLI or GUI. Even these options are already existing in the new setup also. But we have the new option of this API where I can do everything that I can do via the CLI and the GUI. What type of models we have in the ACI? We have the logical model. So whenever a user will log in inside the Epic controller, that configuration is termed as a logical model. Then we have the resolve model. What is that? So when you want to push the configuration to the devices in between, it should get resolved. Then only it will go and program to the hardware because you are writing your program in high level type of language. Then it should be converted into low level type of language that machines can understand. So that is the resolve model. And then we have the concrete model. It's like suitable for NX OS type of operating system. So let me show you in the diagram. What does it mean? So here in the diagram, you can see that whenever I logged into the device, I am doing the configuration that will be the logical model. It will be resolved by the Epic controller before pushing to the hardware. This resolve model is again converted to the concrete model before pushing to the actual hardware. It's, this is something like hardware programming. This is something like NX OS CLI type of thing. This is something that internal conversion from the database programming or epic programming to the resolve model and then it is pushed to the hardware. Now here you can see that I have an arrow directly going from the logical model to the concrete model. That means there are few few commands in ACI or epic controller that is natively supported by the hardware. So for example, if you want to shut down the port or no shut down the port, you want to change the speed and duplex, etc. Like a small, a small things that you don't want to resolve. So already the Epic controller, they are treating the, those commands as a concrete model command. So concrete model sends notification to IX and uh, I and XOS for hardware programming. And that's true. Now, I already I told you that everything inside the ACI is uh, object and for that we have management information tree in short that is MIT. So object are structured in a tree based hierarchy. Everything is an object. Object referred as managed object. Every object has a parent with exception of root. Obviously root is root. Objects can be linked through relationship. And what relationship we have later if you study more about the ACI fabric you'll find that okay you are creating the tenant inside tenant you can define what is the application profile what is the application endpoint group what is the endpoint so now you can see that you have the hierarchy so now this is referring one tenant say customer and then everything is referring this tenant even inside tenant, you can go and create bridge domains. Inside that, you can go and create subnets, say subnet 1, 2, 3, etc. Now, again, subnets referring bridge domain, referring the tenant. And then we have the VRF who is referring. The BD is referring bridge domain is referring VRF. Like that, you can see that you may have direct relationship. You may have indirect relationships also. You may have independent object who can refer each other also like whatever we have a study in C language or C++ language what what are the relationship we can create between the objects either they are calling itself or they are referring itself like that all these things are possible because by the end of day it is complete programming so for example DNS entry how it is so suppose if you have www.cisco.com you have www then you have Cisco then you have com. It's like that hierarchy The other example we can refer is the SNMP So in SNMP also you have the string say 136149 etc So 914163 like everything is referring and reaching towards the root so like that we have all the uh, object relation and it will start from the root and then it will go down down it can have multiple paths to reach to the root as well
let us discuss little bit about the class so classes classes are what they are the play uh, they are not the placeholder but they are the containers you can think where you can put some instruction so or you can say better word is the template so classes are the template for creating objects contains initial properties and implementation behavior classes can be concrete and abstract we'll see what what is the difference between the concrete and the abstract but classes are template where you can put some instruction made up to of package name so for example i have package name say fv and these terms you will get inside the aci fabric so for example aci diag fnv read so fabric node vector read if you want to read all the leaf and spines inside the fabric you can use that command also so made up to package name like identify function area of class fb widget virtual and uh, jones class name represent a package class name it's like very straightforward thing that we have in the programming same type of references we have now these classes further divided into concrete and the abstract abstract is nothing but the base class so for example uh, you have tires and engines you have tires and engine from there you can derive a motor vehicle we are defining the tires and the engines so now we can see that okay classes i have abstract class and the concrete class concrete class can be derived from the abstract class so let's just stop here in 1.3 we have to understand the design consideration in terms of high ability and resiliency how we can go and provide the high ability and resiliency in our design and in our design considerations okay so first of all high ability high ability is a measure that will tell you that how long your services are operational and to measure high ability uh, we are measuring in terms of nines So, uh, you can see here three nine, three different type of nines, like ninety percent of time. That means that services they have ten percent of downtime, and in terms of days, that is thirty six point five three days. Now, how we are calculating this uh, downtime? So there is one formula. You can see the formula for availability is uptime divided by uptime plus downtime. Now, if we go and check the uh, three nine. Approach or three nine high level approach. So in that case, we have total downtime is for three point four point three eight. That means up to this much of down downtime, we are ready. Means our network is ready if we have ninety nine point nine five percent of SLA SLO that I am going to explain in next slide. That means we have agreement in between the service provider and suppose if we are the customer. So in customer and service provider, there are some sort of service level agreement that is called as SLA. And uh, as per that SLA, we have agreement that we are uh, we are ready for four plus hours of downtime. Now, if we are achieving five nine, and that's the highly available network or infrastructure. Where the downtime per year is only five minutes, five minute and twenty six seconds to be more precise. Okay, and again these are calculated with the formula uptime divided by uptime plus downtime. Now let's talk about SLAs and SLOs. SLAs, SLOs are service level objectives. So our objective to reach five nine means less than five minute, less than six minute of downtime. in a year okay so that means we have to go and sign agreement with the service provider that service provider please provide us 99.99959 of high availability okay and there are certain indicators as well inside the sla now that's our goal that we want 19 or 39 or 59 or 49 etc but how we can reach it the point being here is that our network should be highly should be designed in it in a terms that it should provide high availability and for the same reason 
we whenever we are doing the designing for network or whenever we are doing the designing for application, we want link redundancy. So in terms of network, we want link redundancy like either channel or port channel. We want device redundancy. So one is primary, other one is secondary. So if primary will go down, it's still we have the secondary or we need ISP redundancy. So suppose if you have the gateway router, you have two ISP, ISP1, ISP2. So if ISP1 will go down, you have the backup with ISP2 or maybe both are working as active active. Correct. Then we have site redundancy as well. Like you have data center DC, you have backup data center that is DR, DC DR type of approach means we want to reach high available in terms of application design, in terms of network design, okay? So the same line you can see that eliminate single point of failure, reliable failover. Now, suppose if you have any switch like 6500, for example, so there also you will put two different type of supervisor engine. So suppose if primary supervisor engine will go down, you have good switch over, you may have non-stop forwarding type of switchovers as well, okay? Then detection of failure as they occur. So you should have proper monitoring tool from where you are detecting in case of link failure, device failure, site failure, ISP failure, etc. okay? There is one other approach as well. We are putting the devices in a cluster. Suppose if it is an important server, so you don't want that important server will be a standalone. So what you are doing that you are creating a cluster, maybe at least three. So it is recommended from Cisco that if you have important uh, management server or important uh, server, you should have in a cluster at least three. So you have three devices in a cluster. If one or two will go down, still you have one uh, server to give their services. Okay, and cluster concepts, they are widely used in uh, in Cisco. We can create cluster for ASA firewall. We can have cluster of vManage or SD-WAN management devices like vManage cluster. We can have cluster of DNA. Okay, we may have cluster of ACI, SDN softwares. Okay. So cluster is one of the terminology that Cisco is using from long, long time. Now, next very important topic is resiliency. Now, availability, we know that you should have available availability of services, availability of network devices, et cetera. So it should not go down. Services will not go down. On other hand, we have a resiliency and it is the ability to provide and maintain an acceptable level of service in face of unexpected faults, challenges to normal operation. That means that you have you have tested your network properly uh, in terms of error occur. So you should have error handling mechanism in terms of uh, drastic changes in terms of failure, unexpected faults and uh, failures. Correct. Right? So you should go and examine your network that you can tolerate or you can work, your network can work, your application can work in un unexpected failures. And this is very important key aspect we have for application design. And what are the key important terms we have to achieve more resiliency in a network? Uh, parameter checking. Okay, parameter checking means that we are checking the object, we are checking the uh, code, we are time to time, we are monitoring our modules, patterns, etc. So they should be complete. So they should not be broken by something, they should not be attacked by uh, malicious code, malicious uh, calls, etc. Okay, so complete parameter checking in function and object is used to protect from broken or malicious calls, the calls and return value. And often we have seen this thing happens with the programming and the uh, modular approach of programming that we have. Okay, timeouts. The second methodology is timeouts. What does it mean? Timeout means, you can think like this. Timeout means that your, uh, your server should not be far away when you're sending the request and getting the reply, it will go for long or it will never return. 
So you are sending the request one time, second time, third time. You are not getting the response, response, response. That's the timeout. So we should check the nearest available server. So the request. Okay, the request should go to the nearest application or server from where we can get the response. Okay, so we should not wait forever. That's the timeout approach. Then the asynchronous communication, that means used to decouple the sender from the receiver and prevent failure due to falling or slow responses. You know, you can break the sender and the receiver communication uh, just to adjust that they should not go forever down forever I means you know that you have the uh, users you know that you have the servers but they don't do not communicate due to any backlog due to any error and then the other approaches we have and i like this fan out approach that means fan out and use the quickest response so you are sending many requests and once you are getting one response that will be the quickest, that, that will be the fastest. You are using that approach, okay? So you do, you think like this, you do the broadcast and when once, once you receive any of the response, uh, that is the fastest response, then you are sticking with that, okay? That's the fan out approach. Then fail fast, this is also nice trick. We have fail fast means that, okay, you know that the service will go and fail, but it should go and fail fast that means if you know that failure is occurring then we we can go and try to mitigate then we can go and try to fix that issue but suppose if we do not know is just to know that this service is going down in two hours or three hours that's not a good approach so if it is failing fail fast because if it will get fail fast then we can go and recover it Okay, then finally, the fallback mechanism. That means you have some sort of backup. So you're sending the request to the primary server. If it is not responding, then you can fall back to something a minimum. IC is using this type of approach, Cisco IC identity service, where you have a change in authorization, COA. That means that, suppose if you are doing some sort of authentication and your authentication is failed, still you fall back to some default value where you can use some of the resources, not everything, but some of the resources. So this is important that uh, after the fallback, after the failure of the authentication, after the failure of the primary call, how much default return value we have in terms of resiliency. So in summary, resilience tries to live through the failure with error handling and error correction. And while Ability's goal is to detect the work around the failure by replacing the broken um, uh, component. So that means that with resiliency and high ability, we try to achieve a bigger goal in application design or network design. And resiliency is a way that we can do the error handling, error correction, and availability is a way that our services are available for longer period of time. In 1.4, we have to understand about application design consideration, design consideration with respect to latency and rate limit. Now let's explore more on this. Latency is minimum, latency is zero, that's not possible because we know there are so many different factors which is causing the latency, correct? Now, first of all, we'll go and check the problems that we have related to latency. Obviously, it will lead to bad user experience because if uh, latency is there, if we are not able to open the applications, the web pages, if we are not able to give the input to the required uh, software application, that's the case. That's directly uh, impacting the business revenue, revenue as well, right? So we should have proper mechanism to cater the latency. Now latency, where it is having their effect, real-time applications, 
we know that there are so many real time applications such as stock trading applications such as online gaming etc where you can't afford latency where you can't afford network congestion in a way that it will lead to latency correct and not only network is a factor we'll see that there are other factors as well that is leading to the latency in the upcoming slide so real time application high performing computing application is streaming applications videos uh, video and we know that live streaming and video gaming online gaming where these application they can't afford latency because if latency is there if timeouts is there it will lead to not only the bad user experience but sometimes there will be drop Correct. So I'll give you an example. You're watching some live football match. And suppose if you have glitches, because latency will um, go and uh, produce glitches, obviously will change uh, the channel, correct? You will not go and watch that live streaming or maybe any live speech or something. Okay. So not only that, but there are good amount of application, which is, which is not able to tolerate the latency. So we should have proper mechanism to cater these uh, latency issues. Now, who is going to produce the latency? It may be application latency, means you're programming a structure in a way that going to one module, one modular program to other module of the program, it is taking time. You're not getting the proper response from one module to other module, and then it is uh, causing the latency. One example is that compiled code execute faster than the interpreted code. So latency may be due to poor design of application. That's one way. The other factors are OS and TCP stack. Now, some of the operating systems, they may generate latency because operating system is the key. So whatever a request that is coming to CPU, memory, NIC card, etc., it is going to the operating system. Operating system has to manipulate and give the instruction, correct? So choice of operating system for different application is also a key factor. So pick a specialized OS to improve this. Okay, then we have the NIC latency. This is the uh, network related latency where we may have the serialization delay. That means if you are in the lower bandwidth, such as 128 KB of ISDN, to so process 1500 bytes of packet, it is ta uh, taking 93 milliseconds. Now, if we are um, considering or comparing this with 100 MB of LAN, 100 MB of LAN speed is 0.12 millisecond with respect to 25 GB, this is the highest one. It's very rare that you will use 20, uh, GBs of data in the van until unless you have broadband, high speed broadband connection. But in a LAN connection as well, 25 GB is producing very less 0.5 micro second of latency. So it depends that how we are designing our network, what's the point to point communication we have, because we have two things. You have a local area network, and this local area network may be connected with the router. Correct. So you have LAN and WAN. So in the LAN, you may have low latency, but when it will go to the WAN interfaces, slow interfaces, it will go and cause the latency. In the same line, port to port latency is there. Port to port means that uh, routers to router, hop by hop, uh, latency will be there. So geographically, how uh, you your network is dispersed. Okay. And a good example for this is the cloth fabric. Maybe you know about the spine and leaf structure. So if you have a spine and leaf structure, the spine one and a spine two, and then the spines are connected with the leaf, there is no connection between a spine to a spine. So Example that suppose if you have your data plane devices connected in a fashion of leaf and a spine or in a fashion that um, you have IPsec tunnel between one edge, one location, other edge device in other location. So direct communication will happen. The point being here is this, that you're not introducing much head or headers or much routers in between, or maybe you have tunnels. So uh, packets are encapsulated and decapsulated at the end points only. Okay, so you can see that we have the application latency, OS and TCP stack, NIC latency, port to port latency, cable latency is also 
a factor if your um, server, client and server, they are located uh, geographically uh, across the globe, then obviously there will be latency in between that. Great. So now we have discussed about the cause of issue who is going to produce the latency. Now what we can do here to minimize the latency. Now one example I can show you directly here and most of the companies they are using this approach. So if you are using real time applications, you will not go for TCP rather than use UDP. We know that problem with UDP is this that the UDP, they are unreliable protocol means they're not doing retransmission, but this is the best for video conferencing, real time application, etc. Okay, so choice of protocol is important. TCP, UDP, or maybe any other that we are using either in the LAN, in SAN area network, in WAN, or in any other type of network. Correct? So choice of protocol, transmission protocol is important. TCP, use TCP if it is reliable, if it is a broadcast type of network or real time, use UDP. Then other, what we can do, design of the network is uh, required proper designing. Then how much bandwidth you are giving to the LAN, how much bandwidth you are giving to the WAN, the choice of operating system is important. How much less number of hop counts you have. So do the proper tunneling mechanism is also very important. Okay, there are two more I have highlighted here. One is the pagination. So making several calls for a smaller amount of data rather than one call of complete set. Means do a smaller, small transactions of data rather than sending big file. Then you have the lazy loading, that loading resource on demand rather than during initialization, which speed it up. Okay, now finally, there are some uh, points related to rate limiting. Correct, because this section belonging to latency and rate limiting, when we are uh, talking about rate limiting, you think like this. So someone has done unauthorized or tried to do some unauthorized access. Now suppose if we do three failed login, we have option to give delay. So after three, uh, uh, after three unsuccessful login attempts, wait for five minutes. And after five minutes, you are validated you only do two login attempts. Again, after doing two login attempts, wait for next 10 minutes like that. Now this rate limiting is there in the CCIE exams as well, you know. If someone will fail, he have to wait for one month. Next time he'll wait, he has to wait for two months. Next time he'll fa fail, he has to wait one year like that. There are so many different certifications. There you have the rate limit. So rate limiting we are doing first for security, a second, for quality as well, you know, because you want to measure the quality as well. Someone will not try, keep trying, 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 and it will lead to the uh, DOS attack. So some, someone is keep trying accessing the system and it will lead to the uh, denial of service attack for the other uh, legitimate users, correct? So uh, you can see that we have a list of uh, points here. Let's uh, start with the first one. REST API calls, it will go and return HTTP 421, too many requests. So it will go and stop those requests. Network traffic means if someone is doing DOS attack, so stop that. Stop brute and force attack means, you know, rate limiting, these are the benefits actually. So brute force attack will stop, DOS attack will stop, REST API call, they also give, get the rate limiting and data protection will be there. Obviously when you are blocking the, when you are trying to block the unauthorized access, you are putting the rate limit. So we are providing the uh, data protection as well. So popular rate limit mechanism, uh, mechanism or uh, token backend. Why this is important we are talking here? Because as an application developer, as a network engineer, um, who is going to do the application development or who's going to use the scripts related to, related to DNA, related to sd one et cetera. The first stage while you are doing your programming, you have to do authentication with your management server. So suppose if uh, I want to run certain program related to take the backup of the devices, first module will be authentication. 
our first thing will be do the authentication. Now, when you do the authentication, by default, some of the systems will give you 60 minute token. That means with this session of the program, you can run your program constantly for 60 minutes. After 60 minutes, you have to generate new token. And suppose you are doing uh, your script is taking, so suppose you run one script and it is taking more than 60 minutes. Suppose you are taking backup or you're uploading something, anything with your script. Now, after 60 minutes, if you do not have proper mechanism to regenerate the token, then your script will fail. Okay, so this token is also important. It is one way it is providing the security. Other way is that uh, our script is reliable and uh, it is getting the token for that particular time. Okay, one example for this token, you can understand the OTP, one-time password. So when you are doing the banking transaction, you are getting one OTP valid for maybe 30 seconds or maybe 60 seconds or 120 seconds. That means after 120 seconds, again, you have to revalidate your credentials. Okay, all right, so let's just stop here. In this section, we are going to discuss about the maintainability of software. What are the steps involved inside that? Now we know that once we have the software, the cost for the software is not that the initial development, rather than it is something that how we are making that software up and running or operational, correct? So that means that cost involves in fixing the bug, keeping it operational, investing, investigating failures, adapting for new platforms, modifying for new use cases, repaying the technical debt and adding new features. Uh, that means that uh, it's like uh, operation. It's like how we are manage, managing and operating inside the production. Now, if we have poor code design, if, to, if we are not following the modular approach, then it's actually difficult to manage and the code will not give its desired output. Okay, so while doing the designing, all the steps, all the key aspects, we should manage, we should maintain. Okay, now software manageability refers to ease of performing all the tasks. And suppose if we have poor code quality, undetected vulnerabilities, excessive technical complexity, poor documentation, excessive dead code, and so on, it's difficult to manage it. Okay, so what is the best practice? Now I'm going to explain you about this solid approach and with help of solid approach, at least we can hit the best practices again you can go and check the other approaches as well for the code manageability. But while developing the code, we should develop the code in a fashion that it should be modular. So implement modular design. What does it mean by modular? It means you should have your code. So one code will do one task. I'm going to uh, show you all these steps in the upcoming slide. But yeah, implement modular design. It should be object oriented. All the classes, functions, sub functions will be properly explained. Develop the naming convention. And then you should do proper version control. Who is doing the change? What changes? What time? Any alter, altered change? It should be visible to everyone. Okay. So for the manageability, uh, we, we are following actually the solid approach, solid S-O-L-I-D, uh, single responsibility principle, open close principle, Likov substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. What all these principles are telling that your code, whatever project we have as a software development, so suppose I have one project, correct? And inside that project, obviously you should have your code, first of all, single responsibility principle. That means one function or one module, one block should serve one purpose, correct? So that's the first stage, make it simple. Single responsibility principle single, single approach, and everything will be glued inside one software package or one software code, correct? 
Now, what is uh, open close principle? Now, think like this. Suppose if you have to add new features, suppose if you want to add new capabilities, suppose if we have new use case, what you will do? You need to write new code. And suppose this uh, usability belonging to already existing code. Correct. So do not do any edit, any modification in the parent child in inheritance, rather than write complete set of new program, new module, and then connect here. So use the same shared library, use the same shared function. Uh, do not do changes in the parent, but create new class, not class, but at least create new module and then do the changes inside that. So do not touch the existing code. New innovation, new use cases, new requirement should be in the new uh, program, should be in the new module and then attach with the existing program. Okay, now what's this list scopes substitution principle? It's almost the same thing that we have discussed in our previous discussions that uh, uh, if you inherit from the child object rather than from the parent, the code does not require changes in it. That means that do not touch anything in the existing code, create new code. If you want to do inheritance, you can do the inheritance, create new code and that new code, you refer with the existing libraries, existing functions, okay? Now third, uh, fourth principle, interface segregation principle. So do not mix and mug up with the existing code. So one code is solving purpose to all the users. That's not a good practice. Rather than go, create, if you have many client interfaces, then go create many client specific interfaces rather than putting everything in one interface. Okay, so that means that if you have 10 use cases or 10 different clients serving 10 purpose, then you create 10 different modules for them because in future, if you have to do any change, for any specific change for any of the client, you will not do change and it will affect to all the 10 clients one client will be affected, one client will be modified, modified, correct? And finally, this dependency inversion principle, what it is telling, this is also very important. And the principle is high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstraction. You should not create the interdependent module in a way that if we have any requirement, so high level module will go and call the low level module. In this case, they will increase the latency. In this case, the overall code performance will be degraded rather than create new, new modules that will go and refer the same libraries, same functions. Okay, so these are the solid approach. These are the five solid approach. Create nice and clean code, create, create single purpose code. If you have new requirement, write new code, refer to the existing libraries or main program. And like that, we can go and manage this. Finally, when we are talking about the code quality, so we should have the proper naming convention. We should have proper comment in it. Do not repeat your code all the time. You know, sometimes uh, we are same code we are putting again and again and again and again, rather than create new function. And whenever you have that requirement, point towards that function. That's the drive. Do not repeat yourself. Always use the same shared libraries and tools. Do the proper testing. Once your tested code is up and running, then do not play around with this. That is fixed. This is my code that is fixed. Now, if any new code will come, I will enhance here and then I will point to this code. So tested code, do not change it, work with it. And prior to the production, do the proper testing, do the, uh, do the testing in the lab and then use inside the production, correct? Uh, use the linters that tools that analyze source code to flag programming error, bug, stylus error, et cetera. Okay, so we have discussed a lot about the code operation, manageability and quality. Please follow these principles to manage the code. 
next section we have to understand about observability and what's the use related to observability. Here you can see in the diagram that observability, they have three major components. So let me highlight here and let me change the color as well. Let me use the pen. So you can see that it depends upon metrics, either it's a performance or throughput metrics. It depends upon the log. It depends upon the traces as well. Three major components we have related to observability. And we are going to discuss all these three components one by one. Okay, so three pillars are there, logs, metrics, and tracing. We know that uh, logs are very important. Logs, they are something that uh, that will give you the idea related to system, that will give you idea related to whenever we are running any, any of the program, it is giving us the logs related to that program, correct? So um, suppose if I have one software, if I have one script at least, and if I'm running that in that script, I am taking the log that what time this script is starting, uh, at what time it is finishing, at what time it is uh, completing task one, task two, task three, how much it, it is completing and after how much time it is failing as well. Means so all those things we can uh, encode uh, inside this script and according to that, it will give you the output. So let's let's check more about that. Log should provide much information about application execution flow, the state, variable value, API call, parameter and responses, database calls and responses and so on. Means it will give you the information that we can go and put inside the program because we want to see all those uh, workflow, etc. Now in case of microservice application, each log stream provide detail only about a single instance of service. And that's the problem because in uh, distributed application system, you may have multiple microservices running on and uh, the log is providing log related to only one instance of service. Okay, so we have to look for other options as well. So other option, we have the metrics metrics and what's the use of metric metrics are best suited to triggered alert metrics are numerical measures recorded by the application over intervals of time such as counters gauze or timers okay and good thing about metrics uh, metrics is that we can sample it means we, you have good amount of data uh, with that sample we can do the aggregate we can do the summarization as well Okay, now here you can think like a metric for routing where we can have the summary route or aggregate route, but this is related to applications. This is related to software packages and programming. The third major component we have is distributed tracing. And this is a little bit enhanced. So whatever we have a study in logs and matrices, a distributed tracing will give you much more information because what is happening, whenever we have distributed testing, it will go and assign a global unique ID and the record containing this ID generated every time request execution reaches certain instrumentation point in the code. And I have the list of the important uh, information that is getting via the tracing. So with help of tracing, uh, it will tell you that which service did a request go through? What did every microservice do when processing the request? If the request was slow, where there was an bottleneck? If the request failed, what was the error? How different was the execution of the request from the normal behavior of the system? Means what is expected and what is the outcome, okay? Then where some new service call also, where some usual services are called, means your program flow is working properly or not, at what time it is failing, if it is failing, what are the error, if there are any bottleneck, it will tell you the bottleneck, means complete flow. And in that flow, if you have any error, it will tell you the error. Now we know that we have one well-known uh, fact that we can go and do the monitoring for the application flow or design as well but where this observability will 
fit in the into the picture so you'll understand that there is a relation in between monitoring because we are doing the monitoring for our packages our application our programming so here you can see the important point that observability is like traditional monitoring in fact observability is a superset of monitoring okay you can achieve certain tasks with monitoring but observability will give you more insight about the application about the flow because again if you go and refer this diagram you'll find that you have a real time comprehensive instrument uh, instrumentation performance metric throughput metric enter error count log dependency map and processes it is giving good amount of insight inside the program okay so like a scalability a resiliency that we have covered in the previous section observability is a system property and when we are doing the observability inside our application design so the important points we have a complex system is never fully healthy we know this fact distributed system are very unpredictable it's impossible to predict all the state means after which module which module is coming after which module which module is coming what is the interlink dependencies etc failure need to be addressed at every each and every phase related to design to implement testing deploy and operation ease of debugging is critical to maintain and do the evolution of the programming these are the constraints actually we have and we know that with help of observability we have the solution as well because it is asking these questions and it is giving us the you the traces related to these uh, errors failure bottlenecks and the workflow okay now summing up everything in, in in a wider picture so with help of logs metric tracing and other uh, important uh, contents or attributes that we have related to observability uh, what is happening that it will give you the status of the application component uh, services the health of external system hardware status loads user action okay and during implementation pay attention to these low level elements to achieve better observability means even we can improve the observability as well use language specific logging libraries implement event and state logging as detailed as possible logs execution result log api request and response log transaction and uh, query status okay so what we have discussed here is that what are the important pillars we have inside observability we know about log and matrices where tracing is something that we can integrate in inside our program to get better insight to to get to know about the workflow and important aspects inside the program uh, these are the suggested methods that we should use and these are the outputs that we are getting from the observability best practices all right let's stop here in 1.7 we have to understand the importance of logging one of the protocol that is widely used for logging is syslog what i have done i have recorded one video related to aci application centric infrastructure syslog where we'll go and understand the terminologies used the strategy used inside the uh, inside the syslog with respect to logs and the syslog so please go watch this 6 minute video and then we are very much completing 1.7 now the syslog messages are from years we know that in cisco routers and switches we can have syslog so over the screen we can watch or we can see or we can store those information to some syslog server as well so we can send these messages to the external server as well and one of the popular one is the solar wind correct the solar wind not only the syslog server but a different type of alerts events also we can view if we enable those here you can see the severity level from 0 to 7 that means we have 8 we have emergencies for system usable alerts critical error warning notification informational and debugging 
obviously if you go to the debugging that means you want to see each and every log message and that's not required that actually you want to debug you want at least the debugging level label syslog message but your warning label or notification label messages will serve the purpose correct so uh, we'll understand that how we can go how, how we can configure this inside ACA fabric because again the configuration part is easy you have to go to the fabric and then you have to uh, go and create the policy for syslog one important thing here to highlight that we have these different type of syslog messages so we can have syslog related to audit log events false session uh, logs correct again we are going to uh, do the configuration and then you'll understand that how and where you can put these values where where we'll get all these options here in this slides you will see some of the uh, important steps that i'm going to show you in the lab as well correct so we have these four type of uh, uh, syslog messages that we can see so what the fault will do fault means that generic system issue equipment uh, alerts configuration related faults environment issues network flap etc then events mean link state uh, transitions lock uh, contract hits audit log mean know that who has done uh, what at uh, what duration etc correct then we have the session log uh, means uh, which particular session has again um, how much will go to the audit so who has done what will go inside the audit but again uh, who has the session is internal user or the risk api user etc etc so broad range of syslog messages we have starting with the device label user label audit log etc correct now again it depends upon us that what type of messages we want to see according to that we can go and enable those messages and then we can watch or we can see that correct how we can do the configuration that i will show you in the lab section now there are some prerequisite that when you are doing this enabling this is log message so you should have the at least you should have the OOB contract or OOB management configured that we have done in the previous section. And then uh, we can go and enable the syslog uh, UDP 512 inside the contract. So when we have created the contract at that time, we can go and we can put or we can allow the port UDP that is for syslog messages. Uh, this is one of the best practice, but if you do not enable it, that will also work with the default configuration but we can go inside the filter and then we can uh, allow this particular port number udp you can go to the tenant management security policy you can create one filter to allow the udp 514 and then you can edit your contract in between the provider and the consumer and then it will serve the purpose for the syslog again how we are going to do the configuration relate related to syslog that i am going to show you in the upcoming slides you can refer these slides whatever i am showing you here just for your reference purpose i will upload there with the recording and what configuration we need let me quickly go and log into the fabric and inside that i will show you those configurational steps now there are some caveats but again it depends that which which release we are working because in the release 4.xl find most of the caveats has been removed it is a good practice that we can use port number 514 in case of out of band management or in case of in band management uh, configurations uh, again you can see the point number three is that if you want to enable the login of the contract permit deny events and send those to the OSIS log server you will have to change the facility filter for the default facility to informational correct so again we know that syslog message has eight category and one of the categories is informational so 
if you want to check the hit counts for the contract then you need to enable the facility to the information there. correct you can refer this link here now let me stop and in next section i will show you that how you can perform this particular step inside the ACF fabric in 1.8 we have to understand about the choices of databases we have for application design from our previous discussions uh, we have discussed about three tier architecture that means that we have a web we have application and we have db now the third portion that we have uh, as a db that we are going to discuss in this section but we know that we have the front end and we have the back end so your web is your front end that's that is facing the client this is where we have the client interfaces and the app and db we have related to back end so all the transactions actually will get stored inside the database now there are different type of databases as different type of requirements such as relational document graph columnar time series these we are going to discuss one by one but first of all what we want to do here we want to understand a different type of design available related to databases and what's the use of the databases we have obviously it is going to store the query so here you can see that uh, whenever any transaction is happening whenever any query is happening whenever we are calling any api the final thing that is happening is that it needs some sort of reference to a store somewhere in the database okay sometimes it is referred as a key and value so whenever you are doing the query in any type of database so uh, what you want to query it is going stored uh, with respect to key and value correct now again we'll come to this in the upcoming section in upcoming slides we have but here what we want to know that first of all we want to understand the basics of the database okay so databases we are using to store update and access the data and what type of database and database we need we want database that can store any type of data format either it is a structured or unstructured or semi-structured correct so th those are the data data database performance should be good uh, ability to execute complex queries data model should be flexible database robustness it should be robust reliable scalable etc means these are the requirements correct so if you go and check any type of uh, sdn solution that we have at this moment and just for example either it's a aci uh, fabric or it's a v manage inside test when we have v manage fabric or it's a campus lan architecture like dnac if you go and check anywhere you'll find that somewhere they are using shared databases somewhere they are using relational database somewhere they, they are using different type of mix of databases okay now why because you need high performance you need flexibility design flexibility etc but there are different different designs are there and those designs um, design solution that we have actually they are keeping in the mind that they should be available and they should be consistent so remember consistency and availability these are two very major aspect by which we have different type of database design models okay now i will we'll discuss few of them and then uh, in the next section we are going to discuss about types of database okay. so let's understand some more uh, terminologies used inside the uh, databases we have transaction so what is a transaction a transaction is a sequence of operation performed by database in a single logical unit now we have models for transaction we have acid model we have base model and we are going to discuss about acid and base both are uh, very much similar but let's uh, understand the acid model acid a stand for atomicity consistency for c i for isolation d for durability so a database that is providing atomicity 
that means that all operation in a transaction succeed otherwise every operation will roll back means until unless we'll get the sign off in between if anything will happen all the operations will get rolled off you can see consistency remember i told you the two factor availability and consistency these are two major, uh, major thing we have later on in this slide we'll go and check the difference between acid model and the uh, base model so atomicity means if it is not completed roll back all the operation operations consistency that means transactions result uh, in a valid state of database and all validation rules uh, constraints are met whatever constraints we have it should met means it should be consistent throughout the query process and when the read write operation happening to the database isolation transaction do not content with another suppose if you have multiple queries so transaction do not cross over each other so each request should get their response separately and then it should have the durability that means the result of transaction are permanent even in the presence of failure okay so you can see that acid model the name suggests that c for consistency again we'll go and check the difference between acid and base but there is other model as well base basically available soft state and then finally eventual consistency so here you can see that base model uh, it is giving you the flavor of both availability and consistency availability means your databases are available so any data request should receive a response because it is telling you that i am available but that response may indicate a failure or changing the state or uh, as opposed to the requested data soft state a system may be in the changing state until consistency is reached it's a dynamic and finally eventual consistency data may vary in value until the system reaches to the consistent state great so i want to uh, tell you the difference in between the uh, acid and the base model so here you can see the database system designed with traditional acid guaranteeing my choice of consistency over availability and i told you that here also you have consistency but here again is eventual consistency but acid the model itself is telling that it is preferring preferring consistency over availability on other hand the philosophy of base model is availability over consistency now the note here that in the absence of network failure you are reaching both the availability and the consistency okay now before uh, ending this video i just wanted to uh, uh, explain you a little bit about distributed database because if you go and check the aci database model you find that they are using shared database or shared database shared database means that they are mirroring their or they are replicating their entries whatever you have remember uh, cisco is suggesting that you should have a cluster of three uh, management plane correct so you use three aci or epic controllers inside a fabric or inside even in case of sd1 vman as, as well you should have three why because their databases should be used as a distributed database correct distributed database means if in if suppose if one of the um, management plane will go down that means if its database will go down still you have replicated two databases from where it will handle all the queries okay so that's a, uh, in in this world in the real uh, production in the real application design we have something called the distributed database where you have at least three in a cluster you may have more you know uh, so you can check the number as per the uh, as per the query volume as per the request volume the database can increase more and more in the real production you'll find that the database size will will be huge it's, it's a big database okay now so what we have inside the distributed database in terms of cap theorem cap is telling you consistency availability and the partition uh, tolerance 
So consistency that your database is consistent throughout, it is available throughout, and then it is partial tolerant as well. Why? Because if you have cluster of three databases, even if one or two will go down, as long as you have one database server, it will respond. Okay. So these are the very important things that the need of database, and it's a complex topic in itself, because I know that you have complete maybe thousand page book just to understand the database relation, database management. And there's so many good amount of books available to understand the databases, the restructure query and all those methods. Okay, here we are just understanding uh, for our um, application design perspective. It's just the design perspective. And for this particular syllabus uh, perspective that database, what's the use, why it is used, what's the flavors of database, what are the key components inside the database, what's the uh, transaction design model, what's the distributed design model. Because later, if you go and check all these things in the real production, you'll find behind the scene they're using all these terminologies. All right, so we are good to stop here. And in the next section, we'll continue from here. We'll understand more about the databases. Choosing the correct database uh, for the correct data structure is very important. And in this section, we are going to discuss about various type of databases options that we have that we can go and choose. One of the widely used, mostly used database is something called relational database, referred as SQL database as well where you have rows and columns. Now here you'll see that the columns, those are the field and rows where you have the actual record. Okay. So they are in the columns and rows, correct? C and R you'll find. And then uh, in the rows, you have the actual record column, you have the fields. Because in the upcoming section, uh, in the slide you'll find we have column wise, uh, wise database as well. Yep. So this you can think that you have rows. They are the important um, constraint here because they they having the records. Now in SQL type of uh, databases that we have the query language. So query language is there and that is termed as a SQL, a structured query language that is going to be used to retrieve the data from this particular databases. Okay. Now we have the relational database have a strong focus providing on the CA, that's the consistency and the availability, because they are for the structured data. So they are going to do the query for the structured data. And uh, their foundation is based on the consistency and availability. And in the previous section, we have gone through about the ACID. So we have the consistency that is there. We have availability as well. And we have seen about the ACID transaction, ACID and base in the previous section that we can go and refer. Okay, so we have a database that is going to solve the purpose for the structured data, which is going to provide you consistency, availability. Okay, now, What's the flip side? Do we have any disadvantage with, uh, with such type of databases? Yes, we have. This type of databases, they are lacking flexibility. So now if you want to change the schema of these databases, it's very difficult to change the schema in, in, a, uh, in a running production. Okay, now for that very reason, we are looking for some non-standard or um, databases for non-structured data structure as well, okay? So I'll come to that, but you can see here the SQL databases, the examples are Oracle database, one of the popular one, one of the most popular one, then Microsoft SQL, then MySQL, then uh, post, uh, post degree SQL, etc. I mean, there are a long list, but these are the popular ones, okay? Okay, so, so far we have discussed about the structured database, structured um, data. What about non-structured data? For non-structured data, the categories are document-oriented databases, graph databases, column-oriented databases, key-value databases, and time series databases. These are the examples related to non-structured data. Okay, so I'm going to discuss one by one about all these in this and the upcoming uh, slides. 
let's discuss with document oriented database a document oriented database is to semi structured information with any number of fields that may contain simple or complex values and they can do some sort of nesting as well means document structured database you have inside that you may have document structured database so documents may embed other documents like nesting or embedding okay documents in a database are organized into collections uh, such as table in relational database which are used to group the documents of the same type of schema or same type of database so document can embed documents and they can they will be used for semi structured uh, data or semi structured information but they are flexible with compared to the relational sql databases the examples are mongodb amazon dynamodb and coachbase uh, servers okay so this this is the example related to uh, document oriented database now third category you can see actually the second category inside non structured database is the graph database as name suggests graph that means you may have object and you may have relation in between that and that's true you can see that in graph there are two main component nodes and edge now node they are going to represent people business account this is actually the content correct this is the actual actual record so nodes are nothing but the record see uh, they are equivalent to the record in the relational database uh, databases on what about the age edges are nothing but the relationship so if you have two different nodes how they will connect so edges they are going to provide the connection in between them okay relational uh, relationship may be modeled uh with the relational database as well but queries may become slow and compli uh, complicated so what's the advantage and what's the disadvantage the advantage is this that this is for non structured database it may um, change means it may change means that it is flexible enough uh, it based on the nodes and the edges so that means if you want to do the query if we want to do the complex query it will provide you that query so let me explain here that in contrast with the graph databases information about the relationship is immediately available now to do the query in such type of databases it is easy now if you go and compare with the relation uh, relational databases queries may become slow and complicated but but in the graph databases you'll find the queries are fast and immediately we can get the result graph databases perform a quick search through the data related to an individual record however they are not efficient at processing high volume of transaction or handling query that perform the same operation in many data elements okay so you can see the advantage is the query is fast query is immediate but the problem here is this that this is not good for processing high volume of transaction okay graph databases are always implemented with another type of database like document key value traditional relational etc the popular graph databases include neo 4j orient db alanjo db okay so in the previous uh, uh, section not section but uh, uh, just now in this video only uh, we have discussed about that we have the relational database uh, this is the key relational database sql database is the key where you have uh, rows those are records and column those are fields now just flip of this we have column oriented database as well okay column oriented database that means that data is organized in both rows and column however fields are defined in rows and records are stored in column just reverse of that correct here inside the column you have record and fields are inside the rows but you go and check the relational database you'll find that uh, records belonging to row fields belonging to column so that, that's just the uh, opposite of that now why we are is the column database because this allow highly optimized data retrieval for analytics over a certain field 
such as you know uh, age to find the age to find some number to find the salary etc however other operations are suboptimal like add a record read a full record and so on popular column database examples are apache cassandra maria db etc okay next we have key value databases they are also very important uh, they are providing uh, great simplicity in data storage and then allowing for massive scalability of both reads and writes now because this is the key and value so search will be easy because you can search with respect to key and then you'll get the value data entries are stored in a unique key corresponding to key uh, corresponding to value because see key and value so all the values they are mapped via the key key value pair is there key value databases focus on simplicity speed and scalability data is not constrained in any way type format and so on but only basic data manipulation operation are supported means the, this is for basic uh, database operation and manipulation the popular key database are Amazon DynamoDB include uh, Redis as well. Okay, great. So we have discussed a lot about different type of databases. The last in the list is the time series database. Uh, they are specifically built for handling matrices, events, or measurement that are time stamp. Means they are valued with a time stamp. Time stamp databases have some unique properties that make them suitable for real time and historical analytics uh, such as data lifecycle management and those type of information this is typical database type to store sensor and telemetry data so if you have real time if you are looking for real time databases if you are uh, looking for real time monitoring databases then in that case time series databases suited best because uh, they have unique property that they can go and they can collect the uh, store the data related to real time or historical analytics data, et cetera. And they are widely used in the, the store sensor and telemetry data. What are the examples? We have popular time series database like in Flux TV and Amazon Time Stream. Great. So we have discussed almost all different type of databases that is there in our uh, curriculum that is there in our agenda. Let's stop here. In this section, we are going to discuss about software architecture patterns, such as monolithic service oriented microservices and event driven. In this section, I will go and discuss monolithic and service oriented architecture. And in the upcoming video, we'll discuss the rest of the architecture patterns. All right. So before even starting with uh, monolithic and service-oriented architecture, let's discuss a little bit about why we need uh, software architecture. The software architecture actually, they are refers the fundamental structure of software system. Now, when we are talking about software system, you can think as a project as well. So when we are talking about a project, a software project, in a project, why we need a project? Project is something which is going to solve certain use cases, correct? So if you have some requirement according to that, the development and application team, they are developing project. They are developing softwares, correct? Now, we are going to discuss about the software architecture who is going to solve the purpose or serve the purpose for the requirement. And that architecture should be reliable, operatable. It should be uh, efficient in terms of performance. It should be secure, compatible, maintainability means it should be maintainable and so on. Means in future, we can go and add new features. It should the architecture is such a way that it can incorporate new features, it can scale, it should have flexibility, etc. Correct. So those are the architectural points that we need software architecture that should solve the purpose, not only solve the purpose, that it can include the new innovations as well in future if it is required. Correct. So now the software, they should uh, meet the business requirement, uh, such as an if you have any change such as legal, social finance, competitive, etc. And it should be free, it should be open for innovation, it should be flexible for inno innovations, correct? 
So in that regard, we have different type of architecture patterns. We have monolithic service oriented architecture, microservices and event driven. Let's start and let's talk about monolithic and service oriented in this particular video. Now monolithic, as name suggests that you have one big giant software in which you have all the modules. So module A, module B, module C, etc. Correct. So that means that if some input is coming, it is giving you the output connecting all the modules in between. That means the growth of this type of architecture is vertical. And we know in our previous recordings videos that the vertical growth is good actually. Uh, but we are looking for horizontal growth. We are not looking for vertical because if we are fixing a, vert a vertical uh, approach, that means it has upper limit. It can't scale. It is not that much flexible. Suppose if you want to change certain architecture within the architecture, it is highly, highly, you know, it is possible, but it, it has high level of restriction. Okay. So what we need, we, we need, uh, we don't need actually monolithic architecture because it is not open for innovations, but still we have the monolithic architecture. Why? Because it's simple to develop, test and deploy. Now, some of the companies, what they're doing that initially they are starting with monolithic approach. Later on, they include this monolithic approach in the distributed fashion. You know, in, in, in service oriented architecture means you can start, you can test the monolithic approach, monolithic software, and then it should incorporate or it should be adjusted in, inside uh, service oriented architecture or distributed software architecture. Correct. Again, we will discuss this later on, but the restriction with monolithic approach is that it's difficult to scale. And suppose if something will break inside the code, it's a risk for the entire process. It's a risk for all the modules because something has been break within the module. First of all, you have to find out where the problem and then you have means you, you can think like this, entire system is in risk. So if you have only one source, and if that source is in risk, that means you know everything will be on, on risk. So that's one thing. The other technical um, aspect or technical restriction, you can see, say that uh, suppose uh, you have the user interfaces on the top, correct? And you have developed your program in C++ or C Sharp, et cetera. Now in future, if you have to create some other user interface and you know that flexible language is JavaScript, you can't do it because everything should be part of one big giant program. You can't add C++ with JavaScript means that restrictions are there. So it's not flexible in terms of programming as well. It's not flexible in terms of a scalable as well. It's not open for innovation, but on other side, it's easy to start with, develop, test, deploy, etc. So what companies they are doing? They are starting or they can start with the, the monolithic, but they, they want more and more modular approach. And in that regard, you can see that we have next option that is the service oriented architecture. Now what this architecture is doing or uh, doing here yeah, or can explain this architecture. You can see that you have one instance here in the monolithic approach where you have the presentation logic and database interface. But here you can see that you have one interface which is connecting with different, different type of services. So you have different services, they are, communicating with each other or they can overlap as well. But the point being here, and I will show you that point. The point being here is this, that you can have service oriented approach, different, different services. They can be developed and they can be integrated to, uh, to solve one uh, particular use case or number of use cases. The point being here is this, you can develop a software using multiple services, they can work together and they can solve one purpose, okay? Now, I have some listed point I want to explain here uh, while we are using SOA, service oriented approach, what it is doing. First of all, a standardization device contract. What does it mean? That service author to a standard communication agreement means you have services. See, I have 
service A, service B, service C, and somehow they know about themselves. You know, they can communicate. They have one common interface. You can see that uh, enterprise service bus is uh, ESB is one of the common interface. You have the user interface, so they can interact. If they're not interacting each other, at least um, they are providing some input to the common bus, and from there it is reaching to the user interface. Correct. Then service reference autonomy that means the relationship between the services is minimized to a level that uh, that they are only aware, uh, aware of their existence I, as i told you earlier that they know that a know about b b know about c and they are they are knowing each other at least they are knowing each other that's a loose coupling the service location transparency, what it is, that service may be called from anywhere within the network, no matter where they are present. So that's the transparency. Um, services are transparent. They can be called from anywhere. The service uh, abstraction, services act as a black box and their inner logic is hidden from the consumer. So you can see the benefits here, correct? So you have your logic, you are transparent, your different services can see each other, they have loosely coupled with each other, etc. correct? Service autonomy, services are independent and control the functions uh, they deliver. Correct. So services are independent. You can see services are independent. Uh, the programmers, the developer, they can develop the services independently and they can solve their purposes. The service is statelessness. Services are stateless. Finally, the service uh, composability. The services can be used to compose uh, other services. Uh, service discovery is also possible. Service includes some metadata by which they can effectively disco uh, discovered and interpreted. Finally, service reusability. Logic is divided into various services to promote the usability or reusability of the code. So long list of advantages you can see here. And that's we are looking for service oriented architecture. You can see at least one, oops, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine important points, correct? And that's the part A and part B of this particular section, monolithic plus SOA, service-oriented architecture. Let us understand microservice architecture and event-driven architecture. Now the microservice architectures, they are a variant of service-oriented architecture. And we know inside SOA, we have the applications and all those applications, they have visibility, they have common channel, etc. We have discussed this in the previous sections. Now on the same line, microservices, they are also managing multiple services. And these microservices, they're actually suited, well-suited for cloud native applications. Those are running in the controlized environment. That's the one very important thing. Now, next important thing here is this, that since we are uh, having large number of services, so both CI, continuous integration and a continuous delivery, with respect to DevOps, what we need, we need continuous monitoring as well to maintain such a large volume of services large volume of applications as well. So there are certain advantages, there are certain disadvantages as well. Let's understand uh, what are the benefits we have, what are the advantages we have with the microservices. Yeah, so uh, first of all, the modularity. We know that in the SOA, we have modular approach. We don't have monolithic approach. Remember in the previous section, we have uh, then they study about monolithic versus SOA. The nice thing about SOA is this, they are providing uh, the modular approach and SOA and microservices are very much linked, means they are very much similar. So the benefits, modularity makes the application easier to understand, develop, test and maintain. Microservices are easily scalable because they are implemented and deployed independently to each other. So all the services modules we can develop independently. So the scalability factor is there. There It can be scaled easily and it can be uh, 
improved easily as well. So that's why yes, while doing the scaling, we can do the development, we can do the testing, we can do the maintainability as well. All those capabilities are coupled or all those capabilities are linked because we are developing the uh, these application independently. Then microservices enable distributed development and very much similar like SOA. Uh, we have discussed in the previous section. And then finally, microservices can be implemented using different programming languages, database, hardware, and software environment. Okay. And this is one of the bottleneck, bottleneck for the monolithic architecture, where a choice of language is tight, choice of database is tight, because once you fix it, then it's very difficult to change. But that's not the case with SOA and microservices architecture. Okay, what's the downside, what's the disadvantage? This architecture introduced additional complexity and new problem to deal, such as network latency, message format design, load balancing and fault tolerance. And because they have such type of restriction, you can see that you have different services. And since you have different services, you have to do the load balancing. You have to queue some of the messages, you have to, synchronize these messages. So that's the point here, the message forwarding, load balancing, fault tolerance. These things will come into the picture. And if you have network which is not supporting that much bandwidth, then uh, the performance will go and it will go and degrade. Okay, so we have good amount of advantages, but there are some uh, disadvantage as, as well. Uh, one of the disadvantages is obviously the network latency. Once you have the latency in the network, overall performance for this architecture will reduce. Okay, great. Next, we have event-driven architecture. So let's understand uh, EDA as well. And it's very important in terms of definition. So uh, you will find it that how this event-driven architecture is working. Event-driven architecture EDA is based on production of, detection of, consumption of, and the reaction of events. So see, production, detection, consumption, and a reaction of event, okay? So basis of these PDCR, this architecture will form. Okay, now what is event? An event can be defined as a significant change in a state. So we know that one state to other state, whenever the state is going to change, significantly change, then there the event will occur. Formally, what is produced, published, propagated, detected or consumed in an asynchronous message called event notification. And not that event itself as event do not travel, they just occur. We know that event, they just occur. And the nice definition is this one, production, detection, consumption, and the reaction of event, correct? The significant change in the state is event. And according to that, we have the architecture. However, the term event is often used to denote the notification message itself. Now, how this will go and fit in our architecture, let's try to understand that as well. So in event-driven architecture, event creators produce event and know what event occurred. Okay, so creator know that what event occurred. Event consumer and processors are affected by event and process them according to their logic. Events are transported from the event creator to the event consumer. So someone has the creator and then someone has the consumer. So in between the creator and the consumer, event may propagate one place to other place. And we'll try to understand that architecture as well. Let's uh, focus on the fourth point and then I'll show you the architecture related to mediator and the broker. So events are asynchronous and may trigger when resources are not available to respond to them. The EDA also provides a storage for them until resources 
become ill that means that suppose event multiple events has happened and there is no response so creator has created the event but the consumer hasn't consumed it so what you can do as per the ed architecture you can queue those messages you can buffer those messages until it will reach to the recipient or the consumers correct now understand these two uh, technology terminologies we have that event driven architecture consists of two main topology one is mediator and other one is the broker the mediator topology is commonly used when there is need to orchestrate multiple steps to so see event has occurred and then suppose if you have multiple events then you have something called event queue event queue obviously they will queue different type of events and then you have your event mediator that will come into the picture so what this event mediator is doing that the mediator topology is commonly used when there is need to orchestrate multiple steps within an event through a central mediator okay multiple event notification the event mediator will consume and as per the event consumer so suppose someone has done the production of that then you have the queue then you have the mediator who is working as a orchestrator and then uh, different type of consumers they are consuming the those queued event that's the role of the mediator then what about the broker that's the other part of this so broker topology is used to chain events and responses together directly see uh, in the broker you have one common bus so event is coming to the common event broker bus and at the same time it is going to the consumers correct so the producer who is producing the event and then uh, you have the common bus you have the common channel from that common bus or common channel it is uh, event is processing or Uh, produced to the consumers and then you have the event channel in between that so event channel is handling those events okay so you can see that one way you are going and queuing the events and other way is something like parallel processing parallel processing where parallelly you are whenever the event is coming those events uh, are getting directly to the consumers all right so these are very important uh, architectures we have uh, we have discussed almost all four architecture in our uh, section and we are good with the uh, architecture in this section let's just stop here next topic we have to understand about git and github what i have done i have created playlist with four videos understanding the git means introduction with git then how you can set your laptop how you can set your lab environment so lab using gns3 then i have shown the git lab means how you can copy the uh, git uh, repository from the git hub you can see a small lab here that lab you can use for other uh, automation purposes as well in future and then finally one video related to git architecture and github so please go complete these four videos and then we are completing our section sub section 1.10 now the git and github we are going to learn and we are going to actually copy the code more and more we are going to search the different type of codes whatever public published by different programmer coders or network engineers and then we can utilize those codes inside our lab environment or you can again utilize inside the production environment now how it is going to work and here you can see the graphic we have the cartoon that oh is it is it how it is working now actually no idea we have no idea about that how it is working and even we are not worried about how it is working only thing we are going to do that uh, we follow some steps and once you follow the step we'll see that we have some steps to follow to create the code to upload the code to merge the um, libraries and all correct
so we'll go and follow that uh, again uh, if you get errors save your work elsewhere delete the project and download your fresh copy <laughs> that's the way that the network engineers are working when they have the programming related uh, projects okay so what are the things we can do it and here we have the list so made a change to code realize it was a mistake and wanted to revert back these are actually the problem with the application engineers or the programmers that you have done something you have some wrong um, syntax or code or some logic you want to change it last code uh, or had a backup with the uh, with that old code so you have the backup do you have multiple versions of the code uh, you have the difference in the code or maybe some was working with some of the program and the new code having new program you want to merge it you want to take the difference you have multiple copies you have the backup all these points are listed here and the answer is that your zit will do that so it's a public repository not only the public but but here you can see that you may have two type of copies so developer private and developer public so one code that you publish uh, for public use and you want that different users or uh, different programmers they can copy those codes and they they can utilize it to just check the authenticity or just check the uh, scalability and the nature of the program and um, they can improve it as well correct so it's just shared code and you can see that private is also so one copy with you and some portion or maybe some other code you want to share you can do it correct so again the final conclusion for all these steps that we are going to study is this slide you can go and have a the reference to this particular slide and you can check the link as well from where you can get all this information all right so let's focus more on this it under the hood how it is working you may have multiple copies you may have multiple versions you can go and upgrade or degrade we'll see that more and more in the upcoming session uh, how we can do the configuration obviously uh, in our lab I have one GNS. I have my network automation tool. I will show that how we can do it. We can go and do the ZIT config, global username, and the email address. Then my uh, ZIT is prepared. I can go and initialize the project. Initially, it will be hidden under the uh, ZIT directory. Now here you can see the flow. You have working directly. You can do the staging, and you, then you have the repository. We can go and follow these commands. Uh, ZIT add dot that means you can add the zit then you want to commit it you can do the commit so commit minus m initial commit you will do the commit again there are chances that uh, for a certain program multiple programmers are working at multiple locations you can think this as a branch as well so you have multiple branch uh, all the branches are independent and uh, in future you want to merge them so first of all there is a concept of branch correct so zit branch name let's say for example branch is testing you can commit with a new and then you have the uh, checkout as a masters the master is uh, very straightforward now in future if you want to merge different type of branches you can go and merge it so you have your independent first of all you can go and create the repository so you have you can add your username and password you can upload your project you can do the commit then multiple projects working as different location or branches that you can go and merge again if you want to uh, share your changes so you can go and do the push uh, origin master and even the branches as well these are the operations we are going to do obviously we'll understand more and more now this particular slide is important because this also we are going to use it or utilize it so in future uh, some public code is there running up and running in the uh, zit we can go and we can copy to the local directory 
even you can go and create publish someone can copy or you can also copy the others code then once it is in your automation tool in your gns then you can do certain edits you can do certain changes and you can run your own program in your lab environment or once it is up running you have validated in lab environment you can go and run in the production environment as well okay so these are the basic theories related to it obviously more we work more we are going to learn so let's log into the zit and uh, do all the steps follow all the steps that we have seen in this session Before we'll start the lab. I just wanted to show you my setup here Now we can go and install the GNS you can go to this link download the GNS everything is free you can create your free account and you can use it now GNS is running over the server over the VM so you need hypervisor uh, most of the hypervisors are free if you are doing the home lab so for example I am using a VMware Workstation Pro on that I am installing GNS3 VM although what I have done that I have created complete video that how you can go and install GNS3 uh, over the system so you can refer that video but uh, anyways most of the engineers know that how you can uh, use utilize GNS3 Now GNS3 is also becoming very popular and it's uh, Very enhanced at this point of time. So if you go and check GNS version 2.2.10.11 Now we have so let me show you that what version I have but uh, This is 2 to 10 11 is also present at this point of recording and in future you'll see that more and more innovations inside GNS anyways once you go and install the GNS uh, your GNS 3 your laptop you can see means I have done some adjustment although you will get in the right hand side of the pane where you can uh, check all these information so we are very much interested looking for the informations related to our devices our networking devices now when you go and do this thing means when you go and add the devices so for example i have added sdvan s device i have added network automation i have added csr asa etc and as and when required we can go and add more and more devices so for that what you need to do create click template so here you can see the plus sign click next and then you can go and search automation once your automation will come just click install and it is it will ask you next 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 and it will be finished because I'm already having this so it is showing an error but I can have actually multiples as well so I can go and create say 0 2 and done so now you can see that I have automation 1 and 2 that I can use it simply click drag and drop once you click drag and drop you can see here you have your automation engine behind the scene this is ubuntu machine and then i want to build my small network so i can go and use gns switch uh, recommended that you can use this gns gns switch because this is very lightweight okay then i can go and use this nat because i want to give the ip address natted ip address to my automation tool and that's very much done now suppose if you want to interact with your laptop then you can go and use this uh, cloud and then done now once we have this very basic lab setup running we can use these connectors we can connect so let me go and use this connection say here and then again we can go and use the connection like this and like this now in future lab you will see that we can go and change the um, design layout those things as well design layout that means simply you can change the symbol as well and in future you will see that i have changed as well in the upcoming videos at the moment it's okay now 
once you have the network automation tool and you want to provide the IP via the DHCP, so you can go and click edit config and um, you want this automated IP so you can remove those extra symbols and now if you go and start it will become green double click you have your automation engine now the font size is very small at this point of time so you can go click settings once you are inside the setting you have the general tab where you have the party launch the party go to the appearance make this font size that uh, you can work with so for example uh, i made this 16 or maybe 18. once it is there then you should go to the logging and uh, not logging but you can go to the sessions and you can uh, click default session and save it right i can click uh, save it and then i can click close and now if i Go ahead, let me restart this session, but you can see that it got one IP address. If you go and double click here, you can see the font size will get increased, correct? Now this is the initial basic setup that it is working behind the scene, but what we can do that I have certain codes that we should run once we have the first install. So apt get install. Once my automation engine will come, actually it is trying to get in connect, uh, connected with these links and trying to get in some of the patches or some of the updates. Because this is GNS 2.2.10, in the older version you have to do it manually. Even uh, when it is doing connecting with the uh, remote servers and updating the downloads or updating the patch you should go and use this uh, steps as well so here you can see in the back that uh, apt get update python 3 python 3 pip netmiko napalm simple json and then below you can see that we have this uh, apt get install git and then the virtual environment so even you can copy paste or if you want to type it you can do update it will take some time to do the update meanwhile let me show you what is behind the scene this is actually a very important page that we have so here you can see that in bottom line number 38 a zit clone http so i'm cloning the configuration or cloning the uh, program from the zit and then i'm going to this particular folder and then i'm going to the virtual environment that i will cover in upcoming session and i can run my code correct so that's actually very important to run the code now here you can see that it has some problem getting the uh, connection with the internet so once you install once you uh, run your system you do ping to the public ip and here you can see this is unreachable it should reach now sometimes it happens that some of the laptop you need to restart your vmware and gns3 after the installation so what i will do that after this session i will uh, reboot my laptop and i'll come back in the next upcoming session where we have to follow the uh, zit step correct so i'll update i will reboot my laptop i'll come back i will copy paste all these configurations simply you can do like this it's just copy and paste and you can put here so i can go here and put and it will run all the lines of configuration one by one so my python will be ready netmiko and appellum these things you will come to know in the upcoming python session then the zit will be up and running and at this point of time i don't want to enable or create my uh, virtual environment that first of all we'll learn about the theory and then we'll do that obviously in upcoming session we have so many codes to understand and learn so slowly we'll learn all these skills all right so let's just stop here let me go and reboot my laptop i'll come back with the same setting and we'll proceed further 
with zit related steps. Now we have to perform lab related to it. And for that, uh, better that uh, we can see the lab. First of all, I have created the lab over GNS that we have already discussed. And then I have certain packages to install. Even that packages you can also install. So I have packages related to Python, related to pip, related to NAPLM, NetMigo. Net Most of the things uh, I'll cover in upcoming sessions. And then we should go and do this app kit install kit. Now, once we have this kit in, uh, installed, obviously we can go and run the uh, commands related to kit. So here you can see that it is already installed. Then whatever we have studied earlier, I can go and do the configuration like that. So for example, global and then say username. I can go and give my name and then again I can go and give the email as well. So user email is networkers.com and then rest of the command if I have any uh, say directory say p1 is my directory name for example. And then I can go and create certain files, say nano p1 text, any name. I can go and save this. I can copy this p1 text to my p1. We can move to p1. I can go and check, okay, I have p1 text. Now I want to do the initialization so once i am in the p1 i can go and use uh, git init and then i want to add again these are the commands which are fixed and while doing the practice will come to know that what is the use of that again we can create some sort of notes a notepad and then we can reuse uh, those codes finally Let's do the commit and then I can do the initial commit, correct? So initial commit and here you can see the initial commit has been done. Now if I go and check here, you can see that we have dot git uh, p1. This is the way that we can go and do the commit. Now next, we have a study about the branch as well. So I can go and create a branch name is P2 and then branch is a P2 text. Like Likewise, we can go and continue, correct? And now we have the commit for the new working trees clean no branch master because we don't have the uh, master but yeah we can go and continue our configurations like that so we are already in master and then if you want to create the branches so we can go and create the branches so for example the branch now here you can see that uh, parent is not known so that's why this is throwing an error but yeah this is the way that we can go and uh, do the commit we can add it we can create the branches even in future if you want to merge uh, we can use the merge command as well as we have uh, discussed earlier in the slides all right, so let's just stop here and next session uh, we'll go and check 1.2 where we have to learn understand about the APIs. At this point of time, we should understand the Git architecture and the GitHub. Now Git or Zit that you're seeing here in the slide here 
we have four major component we have working directory local local repo and the remote now this remote repo can be github and we'll see that what's the official definition of github but it is something like your uh, web browsing repository you can go and create your account over a github as long as you're public you you can use the resources but if you want your private uh, repository you have to pay something companies they may have their private they may have their uh, public repository correct now this portion here that is the working directory staging area local repo that we have done the lab as well so you you can go and use the keyword uh, git add commit once you do the commit it will go and write to the repo so here you can see that we have the staging area we have the local repository and then if you want to communicate with the remote repo so that option is also there so from local repo you can go and uh, do the zip push if you want to get some update you can go and use zip fetch again we have the checkout and the merge option correct let's understand more about this now here you can see the summary of uh, the slides that we have or summary of the steps that we have already followed so we have a step you are in the initialize the step update change and diff now again you can see that workspace local local repo and remote repo and how and what are the commands to do the communication with so this direction is that you are getting the information from the repo and this direction is that you are sending the information from local to the remote repository all right so now let me go and explain you that what is the remote repository although there are few few popular but uh, we are using uh, mostly the github and you can go and create your account over a uh, github this is the web based type of repository that you can go and use so here you can see that we have the github this is the distribution version control system based on zit that is web based it's free as long as you have the public repository but if you want to go and use the uh, private one you have to pay some fees for that how we can go and uh, log into this let me show you that that how we can go and log in uh, let me clear the slide one all right so here you can see that we can go and utilize uh, the command here git clone uh, although i have one example here you can see that git clone https github ai devnet from where i want to uh, copy uh, certain codes and want to utilize in my program so if i go to my automation tool where we have installed the git and all the related packages that we can go and communicate with is it i can go and create the clone and best we can do the copy paste but let me type here and then the ai definite and then say getting started with Cisco ST van and obviously this is actually a good place where you can check the Python REST API integration okay so now here you can see that uh, it's unable to resolve let me see if I can ping okay so my network is down at the moment but yeah, you can go and utilize this command in future we have so many labs and where i'll show you that how you can go and use this command and you can create your local repo it means you can copy from the remote end to your local system you can do the changes and then you can run execute the programs all right so let's stop here in 1.11 
mostly we have to understand about Python packages and uh, Python dependency management. So for that, what I have done, I have created videos to understand basics of Python, their release, sub-release versions, etc. Python conceptual hierarchy, and finally the Python virtual environment that will very much covering the dependency management. That means you can create your own virtual environment with any type of release, Python release or sub-release, and then you can work in that. That will not affect your global uh, Python packages, okay? Because you have your own containerized uh, environment or virtual environment. Now, when we are talking about software versioning, you'll find that there are multiple ways that different companies, they are showing their software version. One of the popular way that it can show the year, dot, month, day, etc. For example, Ubuntu 18.04. Now here, 04 represents or stand for the month. And 18, actually, it is standing for the year, 2018, April, that is 18.04. Okay, so like that, different, different, even Cisco images or different, different Linux version, different, different SGN packages, they have releases and sub-releases. Somewhere you'll find 3.2.1, somewhere you'll find 5.0.0, etc. Okay, so ACI, like that DNA or DNAC like that. So different packages has different type of methodologies. So you please go and complete uh, this section 1.11 means you have to go and follow these three videos and you're completing section subsection 1.11. After that, we are moving to the last section in this section one, subsection in this section one, that is construct a sequence diagram that include API call. So what I have done, that I'm going to cover this complete subsection, the last one in section one, 1.12, 1 in the section 2.0, where you have to understand only APIs. Section two, 20% weightage is for understanding the API error handling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so this I will cover in the next section in 2.0. So that means. If we are completing these two, uh, three videos, that means we are completing very much our section 1.0. Let us understand Python. We know that the importance of Python language and nowadays it is used everywhere. So either it's a networking or machine learning or artificial intelligence, you will find that uh, the use of Python is huge. Why it is this much popular? First of all, this is the interpreter level language. The codes are easy to learn. Again, uh, if you compare with the traditional programming, so for example, C, C++, Java, and then if you go and compare the Python, you'll find the result inside Python is very fast because it's almost like interpreter. It means you are doing the inline type of uh, uh, coding you are giving input and you are getting the output. So not only that we can do the inline type of programming, but we can go and create a well-documented program and then we can run this as a script as well. So options are there in Python and it's very lightweight, it's fast to execute and it's widely used uh, inside different type of operating system. So for example, in our case, you will find that uh, most of the Linux operating system by default, they have this Python running inside the box, or even it's very easy to install the Python language. You will see that I will go and install the Python. There is three, four commands that you want to do that for the installation. Uh, in Nexus OS, Python is there. You can go to Nexus OS, you can write uh, Python and you, you will move to the Python cell or Python interpreter. All right, so here you can see that you can go to the Linux and you can type Python and you are inside the Python. So what does it mean that once you are inside the Python, so here you can see that uh, I have uh, my network automation tool, but uh, before going there, I want to show you that you should use these commands. I think the first two, apt-get uh, update and apt-get install, 
to do the installation for the Python language so I can go here and do the installation because already we have Python up and running so it will not run much even if some minor uh, updates are there it will go and do the update otherwise uh, we are running Python that's the latest version correct so you can see that you can go and copy paste all these commands and you'll see that your python and then the uh, integrated modules are up and running so once python is getting installed in the linux machine you can go and type uh, python here you can see that we are in the python cell once we are there uh, at this point of time we can assign the uh, values and then say y equal to x plus 4 and then say print y you can see that how easy it is to operate but in upcoming session you will see that we have uh, big big scripts related to networking a device ssh and configuration and open and close a file and run these scripts in different type of uh, for a while conditions Okay, so those things we will see in the upcoming session. Now let's come back to the Python. So it's very easy to use and it's something like common to most of the networking devices. So that's why one Python can do the automation for uh, most of the networking devices and not only the networking devices, but there are other use cases as well in other technologies as well. So what are the benefits we have? It's a free and open source developed portable easy to use learn object oriented and functional named after Monty Python Cons is that uh, it's not a program that is written in hex or binaries that means it is not written in low level uh, code so that's why it's compared to low level program it is taking much time to do the execution now again if you go and compare with tickle Perl, PHP C C++ C hash all those things you'll find the Python is uh, a winner because it's uh, easy to learn and execute as well now to run this program Python program we have n number of option one option that we are seeing here that will be the best one that I can go to the Python and then I can write this script this is the inline way but I can go here say for example let me go out from here and then i can create a file say test.py that's the python extension and then you can go and write your script here whatever script you have and then it will get executed so at the moment i don't have any let me show you if i have any other script up and running so i have say nano and uh, let me show you this if i have any old script that i just wanted to show you so here you can see that i have few of these scripts that is already up and already there that i can show you the format and syntax but at this point of time i just wanted to show you that the extension is dot py and it's very easy to uh, build and again it's very easy to execute as well so i can go here to python 3 because we are focusing on python 3 and then i can run say wlc1.py if i press enter then this program will get executed and then we'll get the result although how i write this program you will see that uh, its complexity is there that you will learn in upcoming session okay so it's easy to use and uh, easy to execute and there are several uh, IDs and all so here you can see that you have ID you have Komodo Python win PyCharm etc. There are so many uh, What is ID what is integrated development environment that uh, you have one notepad type of uh, uh, Say editor where you can edit the program and then you can run it so i have one id here and by the end of this session this video i'll tell you that from where you can go and get it
so first of all here you can see that i have my cell it is looking like this again if i go and put x equal to 10 and print x so here you can see that how it will it is working and then again if you have any script you can go and open not like this you can go and say create new file and once you have this new file this is your id both, both are the id and then again you can go and assign say equal to 55 and print say x and then you should save this so if i go and save this as a say 55.py once i save it then i have option to run this so i can go here on top run say run the module and then we'll get the output here okay so various ways to write the program the best option we have that we should use the uh, linux and then in gns obviously we have the automation option that we can use uh, we can use that and again we can connect with the various networking devices now here is some low level term about python so how the task is executed so first of all we'll go and save the program as dot py extension then it is going to convert it into a byte code that is the pyc that's the internal conversion and then we have the runtime pvm so it's something like from high level to low level how the program is getting executed behind the scene and here you can see this runtime is nothing but the python virtual machine pvm and again uh, with compared to c and other uh, languages you'll find it's easy to use and it's using some sort of bytecode method to execute and run the program the installation is very easy Either you can go and use the Linux that we are using in the GNS3 or you can go to the link here that is the python.org. You can download the version related to Windows or Mac OS, etc. Although in Mac OS you'll find this Python is already there. Even in most of the Linux system nowadays, Python will be there. Windows you can go download the software install and I have shown you the IDE as well. But once you install that, then you can check that as well say we can go and run the uh, python program in windows so this is showing this is i'm showing in my laptop that it is looking like this say for example y equal to 99 again i should assign from here say 99 and then print y and it will give you result so various ways to execute the program and it's very easy to install it's very easy to learn also and easy to implement also so that's why python is widely used everywhere at this present time now next topic we have a python conceptual hierarchy we know at this point of time that we can go and write the program and then we can save as dot py extension now what is happening that whenever we are writing the program we have modules obviously you have the blocks and that block is nothing but the module inside that module we have the statement of expression and those statement that contains expression they are nothing but objects so everything in uh, python is an object we have so many built-in objects as well. We can write code uh, to define the objects as well. And there is actually no concept of that uh, you have, uh, no concept of that you, uh, you are using some old expression or something like that. Because if you see here the notes, you'll find that Python is considered as a dynamic language one way to understand is it to see that python does not require variable that's the thing that's the uh, game changer you can say that that it does does not require variable but it's a dynamic dynamically we can go and assign the variable 
correct? So suppose x equal to 5 we are assigning dynamically uh, means at that particular instance you are going and creating one variable and you are assigning it. You will find that because it is supported or natively supported inside Linux. So most of the Linux operating systems, it's very easy to install and use as well. So here is one example and it's not required in Python 3 that you should go and write like this. But what we can do that uh, we can start with uh, this uh, shebang. This is termed as shebang, but it's not required. Let me quickly show you this the same program in Python 3 because Python, Python 2 is now it is announced officially that is that will be out of support out of live you can think us ul etc so there is no longer support for python 2 in upcoming uh, time so what we should do that we should go and focus more on python 3 and the syntax correct so let me show you here that how this program that we have look like let me write one program. Let me go and write here. So what is this that simply you can go here and you can give say course equals Cisco networking programming. That's the course because this is the string so you should close inside the quotes either you can use single or double quote but you should not mix a single with double double with single etc and then you can go and print now in other versions of python you have some issues like this but uh, when you are using the python 3 you should use the syntax like this so print the course and here you can see that cisco networking programming now here you can see the example is with the old version. If I go here and use a print course, it will not work. Okay, because it is telling that print is a function you should go and use in this format. Now next we have three very important uh, terms here or you can see the uh, help utility function that help, dir and type. And this is actually very uh, important to understand all these three so help means uh, let me quickly read out this help means that we have the python in inbuilt document about the object dir means that what methods related to that object and type obviously means that what type of a string or what type of a, uh, function or expression you are using or what type of object you are using to be more precise so here if I go and say for example if I type x equal to 1 and then if I go and type x so here you can see that type is integer okay likewise if I go and do dir for x so what methods related to x you will find that these are the methods like avs add add bool seal class del attribute TIR etc. So these are the supported method with the integer. Suppose x equal to a That's the string then I can go and use say type uh, x And now here you can see that initially x was 1 now x is a So we are dynamically assigning the variables and then here you can see the type is now a string and if I go and type say dir is uh, say x so you can see the methods related to a string methods related to integers and then methods related to a string then finally we can go and use the help utility say help uh, int so it will go and tell you the int related object this is the class int object and the methods inside this class all these options inside this class it is telling that you can do all these things likewise i can press up arrow and i can go and check say str string and then inside the string add contains equal format length etc all these methods it is telling that we can go and use inside this particular object 
okay so that was the important information the same explanation here also just for your uh, reference you can go and read it then finally uh, we have to go and study about Python data type. So in upcoming session, we are going to learn about the string, number, list, dictionaries, boolean, and file. Although you'll find that all these um, important information that we have here as a basic understanding of Python are easy, and all these concepts that we are going to learn here we are going to use in the advanced section where we'll go and configure the network devices uh, there are so many operations that we are going to do so we'll tell it configure we'll ssh configure uh, we'll use various methodology related to ssh and configuration as well okay so these basic understanding and knowledge of all these uh, data types or the objects is important in the upcoming future videos now this is useful and we can you can correlate this with router vrf type of thing like you have virtual routing forwarding instance that means one router don't have only one routing table but it can have multiple routing table correct like that in same python application or python interpreter that we have in our system i can run multiple versions program with multiple api so rather than installing different different python flavor in different system we can test uh, we in our virtual environment environment we can test different versions of uh, programming code uh, with different set of apis correct you can go and check this link as well here you can see the explanation let's suppose if you have uh, epic 1.1j and you are running uh, epic 1.02m as well and you are checking the api codes related to both the uh, epic or aci controller you don't need to install the different different python package to check this rather than you can work in a virtualized environment and then you can run these programs all right so how we can use the uh, uh, virtual environment here you can see i can go and log into my automation tool i can go and check the git installation and uh, before doing this we should do the app get update once you do the update after that you can uh, check the exit installation then uh, after that you can see that we have command app kit install python 3 uh, v virtual environment we'll go and do the cloning for one of the sites that we are going to use in upcoming sessions so we can uh, reuse the code or we can change the ips or certain places in that code and we can utilize in our program as well so let's this get completed although we have done these steps in the earlier sessions as well it can be very faster so we can wait for next 15 seconds here all right so it's almost done then i can go and do the git installation here you can see now we are getting the option once this is done let's wait here then what i can do that i can go and do apt get install python 3 when and this will also take some time done you can see it's quite fast now i'll go and do the cloning for the git and this will be the big url so github.com ai devnet say getting started so let me type the entire code here this is long string even you can go to this url and verify the coding and all it's very easy to use uh, with the web browser so i can go and type the complete string started 
and Cisco ST WAN REST APIs kit. You can see it is doing the cloning and it is asking the username and the password because we have said that I have the username and password and it is not found. Great. Let me try once. So you can see that cloning has been done. Maybe some place I have some spelling mistake or typo. All right, now I can go to this folder and you can see that we have so many programs that is there for our reference. Now, say for example, I want to run any of these program, even you can go and check. So this is for API related Python program. And I can go and check the others as well. So for example, login, what login is required? Do I have to set some environment variable or I have to go and manually put the login and the username? So at the moment you can see that I can go and run this Python program. This is actually the Python program. So I can go and run the stvan.py and few of the things will be missing. So don't worry. You will see in the upcoming section that how you can actually go and install the, uh, these modules. While doing the installation, you will see that there is a requirement file as well. Correct? So first of all, what you need to do here is that you should go and check this requirement file. Now, here you can see that uh, at the moment, we are running this program in a Python library. It's not in the virtual library. Now, if you want to utilize the virtual one, what you can do, uh, step number 42 we have done, but here you can see these are the requirements. So Python 3.6, virtual environment, activate it, and then whatever uh, requirements are there, we should go and run this so before running this code I just wanted to show you that what requirements are there that you want to install so these are the packages these are the libraries you want to install that will help this particular program to execute properly so here we are putting the virtual environment and then it is going and installing all the requirement file correct so let it be completed. Now some of the places you can see that we have error. Now for those code, what you can do, you can go and search it and you will get the proper uh, direction to install these particular packages. Correct. Now again, if I go and run my Python code, that is the Python 3 stvan.py. If it is not there, then we can go and run. So now you can see clearly that we are in the virtual environment. And we can go and run the program. Okay, so few places we have the error. We'll correct these errors in the upcoming section. The target for this particular session was just to tell you that you can run the run execute your program in the virtual environments. Okay. And I, still, if you want to check any of the small programs, so I can show you say, for example, nano hello dot py. And then you can go and print hello. Correct, and you can run the Python 3 hello.py and here you can see the output, okay? 
So let's uh, stop here. Now we reach to section number 2.0 where we have to learn understand about APIs, APIs in detail. So I'm going to cover all these topics uh, starting from 2.1 up to 2.5, 2.5 one by one. And we are going to understand more and more about APIs and their use cases. Okay. Now, before even going there, we have one topic left in our previous section that is understanding the API, API call, basics of API actually. What I have done, I have created two videos, API part one and API part two that will cover REST full API or REST API. So you please go and watch 26 and 27 number videos. And then we are completing 1.12 because this is belonging to API. So that's why I have linked these videos in section number two. So please go watch these two videos and then we'll go and start from section 2.1 from upcoming videos. Now, before understanding the rest and the other API methods that we have. The question here is that what is API? Now the answer for that will be long. So let me start from here that we know that as a network engineer, we have started as a CLI means we are doing the coding with CLI. Now when we are talking about CLI, the simple funda is that CLI is a human so we are the humans, we are interacting with the machine, correct? So this was something like human to machine interaction. Now again, we have the GUI just to make things simple. We can go and do the point click. So we have the GUI, most of the appliances now they have the GUI as well. Even the complex CLI, it's very difficult to uh, memorize its uh, error prone, etc. So we have the GUI where those CLI commands are preloaded. In other terms, we can think like that also. And then again, behind the scene, it is calling CLI and then it is going and running over the screen or running over the machine, correct? But API is the game changer. Why? Because API is machine to machine language. So this is something like machine can understand to one machine to other machine. Now think like this, when we are talking about CLI, CLI can't be user for other machine, means CLI is giving the, while the CLI we are giving the instruction, but one API can be user to other API or one API can feed the other API, etc. Okay, so that's a big difference we have and that's the fascinating thing happening in the industry at the moment that everyone is looking towards API. So here you can see that API is a way that a machine can talk to machine and it's really fast. We are the only users with respect to CLI, but now in terms of API, machines are communicating to each other and there are n number of example. One of the example is suppose if you are looking for the best hotels a list of the hotels nearby your area. So your hotel programming can go and query Google and then Google will go and uh, give the result and behind the scene, everything is working in terms of API. So as a, as a user, I triggered one API in my mobile. Um, one API means again, you will think that the HTTP web browsing. In loose term, you can think that is also a type of API because in HTTP, we have several method like get method. So whenever you're seeing anything, or whenever you're doing any query, that will go via get method. So HTTP get, give me these results. That's the get. Um, equivalent to CLI is the show commands. That is also get method. Even SNMP is also using SNMP get methods. So get method is something that you are doing the query, you want some result. So now here you can see that one API can trigger other API and it is endless and seamless. So n number of API can trigger n number of API and then uh, some correlation program is running behind the scene and then it will give the result, correct? And that's again the, in, in high term, that is the machine learning and other stuffs. So APIs are 
the engine of innovation and that's true now is it difficult to learn api is it just scary the answer is no it's not difficult to learn api because if you know how to do the web browsing you can play around with the apis the four popular method uh, for rest and rest is a one type of api uh, that full form is representational state transfer which is using get post put delete uh, now this thing i'm going to cover more and more in the next recording so separate nine to ten minutes for rest where we learn understand a little bit deep inside how the rest is working but in a nutshell it is something like we are doing the web browsing and uh, if we want to see something we can use the get method again you think everything is an object if you want to update the object you can go and do the put method if you want to create a new object you have to use post if you want to delete an object you have to use delete correct so these are the methods we have inside the rest because it's very simple uh, so that's why rest is quite a popular now again there is common uh, mistake or there is confusion around that okay then what is the use of xml what is the use of json those things you will understand in upcoming session so you have data model you have encoding you have transport you have protocol these are again a, a suit of protocol these are again the stack that we should understand at which level what is there so network layer so for example if you correlate with the uh, tcp ip layer so network layer functionality is different with respect to data link layer or uh, transport layer or session layer etc so all the layers they have their own function correct likewise the xml and json they are working as encoding methods then there is transport so for example ssh can be transport maybe ssl tls those can be transport so there is other transport method there is again data model like yang so that is again in a different level etc so we should understand in the protocol stack where they are residing and then how they are working correct all right now again uh, when we are talking about the rest method and this particular example is very important and that's why i have taken this so here you can see that you have the different portions so first portion here is the server or host name then what resource you are looking for so you are looking for api for zero code the encoding is json means the output will come in json format and then the parameter so you have one the second and the third request and this is one of the api example again what i am going to do that next two videos will find related to rest and grpc so we will understand more about these apis because in future we have to do the python programming for these apis as well let us learn rest rest is a representational state transfer what it is doing and there is some misconception that this is very difficult to learn and understand but behind this in what it is doing is that simply that how we are accessing or surfing the web browsers the same way the same method the rest is doing so in the diagram you can see that when we are retrieving any website we are sending the get request and then we are getting the page html page now same way we can use the protocol rest we can send the request as a get means we want to retrieve it we'll see that what methods or what verbs we have so we want to read or retrieve the information and then we'll get the information either in json or xml format that's how easy is this correct now more uh, hands-on lab will do more and more will understand about that so i am planning to show you the lab in the next session that how you can do the lab from scratch all right so the rest is the method that is going to use various type of verb or methods what methods that it is going to do i'll show you in the next session but it's very much similar that how we are accessing the web browsers again remember 
that we have the encoding in form of JSON and XML. What methods we have? Uh, we have this CRUD method. CRUD is nothing but create, retrieve, or read, update, and delete. So actually the methods that we have is the get method that you want to retrieve or get some information, is put method that you want to uh, update an object, you have post that you want to create new object and finally you have delete that means you want to delete the object correct so these are the methods that we have um, being used and these are the top methods means the widely used methods that we are going to use inside the crud so crud is nothing but the methods or verbs inside the rest this is a stateless client server model that's true. Again, we'll see in the upcoming slides. Developed by W3C, proposed by Roe Fielding in 2000, and nowadays it is widely used. Even if you want to do the automation in terms of uh, configuring, monitoring, uh, other stuffs like certificate management, uh, creation of object, deletion of object, and all those things are possible with the REST. Uh, API obviously you need to encode or you need to embed this method with some other methods. So for example, I'm using Python to take these REST API uh, objects or data and then I'm converting with Python language in my table format. So I'll show you this lab in the upcoming session. Uh, same way you can also use and how you can use it. I'll show you. So we have the CRUD method. We have the create, retrieve, or read, update, and delete. And here you can see that's an uh, interesting diagram. And it's a very important diagram. So when you are creating, you are sending the payload. Let me go back. And that's very important because you want to send some data. You want to create new object. When you are retrieving or reading, uh, the Success code is 200. This 200 is nothing but your code method. So you are retrieving the information, you are uh, sending query, and then you are getting some payload uh, payload information. Correct. Finally, if you want to update, you are updating with the payload. Finally, if you want to delete, you can go and give the reference, and you can delete it. So delete is the easiest operation. Then you have the uh, get operation. Then you have the put, and finally the post. In post, obviously. Uh, we should be very careful while creating an object. There are chances that you can create the same type of object so that you can use certain other keywords uh, that the objects will not uh, collide or suppose if same object is there, if you're not using the force command, uh, that means it will not get created because already you have the existing object. So those things should be taken care. This CRUD method we have, and we can do all sort of thing related to get, post, put, delete, and we have the patch as well. Uh, but mostly you will see that we are using get, post, uh, put, and delete. These four methods will serve all the purpose that we have. Okay, so get that means you're retrieving the data post means you're creating new object put means you are Updating the object and again here you can see patch means update and modify so slight difference in between put and patch Put will update and replace a resource Patch again the name such as patch will update and modify the resource Now what methods we have and what type of output will come into the picture again? We'll see in the next slide when we have the lab section so once you go and do the REST API call, you will get these information. So first of all, you have the HTTP verb, means what you want. You want to get the information, so you can use the get method. Then you should go and use the full URL. I will show you that how it look like. Then there is some optional thing that body if you are making certain changes. This is optional in what format you uh, want the output again uh, if it is a post method so we have the method plus the payload and if it is a get method we are doing the request and we are getting the output plus payload correct so you will find that you have the header you have the key values 
that will be there but we will look for the data field and these data fields that we can go and convert uh, with python language in some readable format correct so again you have the content type you have the uh, acceptance uh, you can go and run the api i will show you again what are the tools available we have so here you can see that we have the curl method which is a very popular tool uh, we can go and use the web based method that the postman but the thing that i want to use is the python language python language uh, so because python can interact with a number of devices because now we have so many plugins we have so many inbuilt programs as well and we have so many uh, resource code in the github as well that we can go and utilize obviously, obviously we can go to the postman and we can do the query i will show you uh, in the next slide all this information i'm going to share in the next slide so before ending this recording i just wanted to uh, tell you that if uh, still if you are in the windows machine and if you have your power cell so you can go to the shell once you are in the cell here you can see the font size is very small if i can go and increase the font size font and make this 24 all right so now once you are here and you want to check this curl method it's very easy you can go and use the curl and there are so many uh, options we have with curl that you can go and explore so i'm doing curl google.com and then you can see that we are getting the uh, result 200 is okay that means success you are getting the content related to google page here you can see that the get request related to google we are getting with the curl method okay in section two we have to learn about apis apis error handling so let's learn one by one all sections and subsection about synchronous and asynchronous call i have recorded one video after this video you can go and watch dedicated video related to api synchronous and asynchronous calls or apis now in this section we are going to understand about the robust way that rest api error handling uh, with respect to timeouts how it can be useful how we are going to utilize what's the use case why we are using it so the idea behind this is this let's suppose if you have one management pc from where you are logging to the server server means your orchestrator or maybe your automation server inside that server this server may be dnac this server may be we manage this server may be cisco epic controllers or aci correct it may be any type of sdn or orchestrator or automation server that with help of your scripting like python or ansible you are uh, executing the script over the server and these servers they are connected with the network devices like routers switch firewalls etc any type of networking devices that may be managed by the dna or we manage or uh, aci controllers okay so that's the idea now in this flow where exactly our timeouts rate limit will fill or fit in we are going to discuss about that okay so i'll come back to this diagram let's understand that first of all what this rest api is doing to create the request to execute the request to get the response so first of all uh, we have this script with that script we can go and create the request now that request so you have your script for certain uh, networking devices that is hosted either inside the box itself that may, uh, may be dna or maybe we manage because nowadays these servers you can run the python script over these servers as well or you have any pc from that pc 
we are sending the request to the server and then this server will go and execute those requests to the networking devices okay so then that transfer the request over the network to the server means you need network connection here to reach out to the server first of all because maybe my management pc this is my management pc uh, it may be in box or out of box means maybe in the same network or maybe in different network but to reach to the server you need network connectivity now this server who is managing the endpoints is managing the networking endpoints to reach to the certain networking devices it also need required network connectivity correct because maybe uh, this server is hosted inside your out of band management or in band man management ip addresses means same subnet or different subnet okay so that means you are creating the script you are sending the server server they have to go and execute this script to the networking client correct now there may be chance that we may have network error we may have a api error network error means that maybe some firewall in between maybe some loss latency jitter maybe some delay maybe some congestion maybe any type of networking issue like layer 2 or layer 3 issue so for that uh, with the first request you are not able to reach to the server or maybe with the first request from server you are not able to reach to the networking devices that is nothing but the network error api error means you have some wrong code you may have some change in the version maybe version 1 api will not work as a version 2 api or maybe some software package changes so programming related issue software related issue version related issue that may be fall under api error so from your side you are very much clear that i don't have any api error then you can go and check the network error now network error that means that again i told you that maybe firewall issue maybe congestion maybe um, loss latency jitter network issue port unreachability etc we know that there are several networking issues arise for that you are not able to reach to the server from server to the client so again you can see if you go and break down the network error you find that we may have network issue we may have server side issue or even further you may have server side issue you may have client side issue as well at the moment you send the request to the network client maybe that time the network client is rebooting or some something happened with the network client maybe high cpu memory process utilization etc so server end network end you may have uh, cpu spike may have memory issue etc okay so what we can do here the strategy is again clear and clean uh, you can see that we can go and set some sort of timers like connection timeout initial wait and wait reset so what's the flow let me quickly tell you the flow here and what we are doing in this case i have given one example with this uh, running a startup config diff where you will find the script in detail but i'm going to give you the logic here what we are doing say server and then you have client so in the programming what we are doing that we are sending the api request now once you are sending the api re request via the network this network is the media and suppose you are not getting the response because you are waiting for the response correct so request and response but since you are not uh, getting the response you will wait so that means you have set the wait timer for example i have wait timer for 10 seconds now i have sent the request waiting for 10 seconds for the response i haven't got it then what i will do i will set some sort of retries that means i will go and do the retry for three times three times and all the time you can go and wait for 10 seconds that is one strategy 10 second 10 second 10 second after 30 seconds you will find that i have reached to my maximum wait time now i will not retry there may be some issue with the network or you can use some incremental wait timer as well so first time you have waited for 10 seconds next time you can wait for 20 seconds next time you can wait for 30 seconds that means total wait time you are offering 60 seconds 
Okay, so the strategy is straightforward. You are putting the wait timer, you're doing retries, and you may have expon exponential back off timer as well. You can go and set some uh, exponential back off timer. Here you can see the snippet of the code. So what we are doing, we are setting the maximum retries. You can set 20 as well. The default time, uh, what is your uh, exponential back off timer as well. And all these things you can go and fit inside the logic, get the task response. Okay, and here you can see that retry interval is one means, uh, this is also important means after how much seconds you are doing the retry. Okay? It's a one second or maybe um, two seconds, etc. So all these parameters should be fitted inside a good code, good script um, that will do some sort of fault tolerance, some sort of error handling mechanism. And I have pasted one example here. You can go and see that complete code. You'll find that inside the code, how it is working. Okay. All right. So let's just stop here. Synchronous. Now in this type of API call, what is happening that it will wait until the API will get executed. That means that these APIs are working one to one. Now you can think this that this is working in a manner of queue. So uh, one call is coming and it will wait until it get completed. So then the next call will get started. Correct. Rather than asynchronous can have multiple calls. So at a time multiple calls can happen. Now there may be pros and cons for both uh, asymmetric and asynchronous and synchronous that uh, suppose if you have any error in the call API, uh, if you have heavy load on a system network bandwidth related issues, etc., and you can't run multiple APIs at a time. So you can think in both ways. There is plus and there is minus for both the calls. Now few of the programs like Java, C, C Sharp, they are using synchronous method. On other hand, Java is script, they are using uh, asynchronous method and actually the asynchronous method is the common de facto now it is uh, in our API calls we are using asynchronous uh, API calls. Now what is happening in this case is that suppose if we have multiple runs and if we have error correct so you should know how you are going to handle that error. So we can go and try and we can catch the error and then we can publish the result. Correct. Now this particular slide that you're seeing here at this point of time, I'm taken from Cisco. Cisco, what Cisco is telling is that synchronous API calls are blocking calls that do not return until either the change has been completed or there has been error. That's the key here I'm telling that if we have the error and suppose if you are doing the call that is asynchronous it's not synchronous because anyway synchronous has to wait till the execution will happen so suppose if i have 10 uh, api calls that is going on and if i don't have error handling mechanism all 10 there are chances all 10 can uh, throw an error and that is not good Correct. So we should handle the error inside the asynchronous call. Now for asynchronous call, the response to the API call is returned immediately within a, a polling URL. You can just think like asynchronous calls are just, we are surfing the websites. You are entering some URLs, you are getting the result. Correct. Now again, in heavier load condition, it can be more efficient to submit multiple calls, async calls, and periodically check the result. Okay, so the key here is that, okay, we understand the synchronous and asynchronous calls, correct? Key here is that how we are going to handle the error if it is there. Now here you can see that the program and I have given you the link as well, reference from where I have taken this. So asynchronous think, here you can see in the diagram, it's uh, quite clear. So you have, uh, 
API calls one, two, three, and four. And here you can see that you have the recovery as well. You have recovery as well. So what exactly this is? This is something like uh, try and catch. You are trying something. You are catching the exceptions, and then the result is coming. So simply, suppose if you don't have exception rules in Java, it's quite popular that we have the exceptions rule or we have the exception handling. Suppose if you don't have the exception rule handling rules, then simply the program will exit from that block. So that block will run and it will come out. Even it will no, even it will not go down and check the other options. So, but if you know that what type of errors or what type of exceptions you have, so block code execution. Say for example, block one will happen, two will happen, three will happen, four will happen, and whatever try methods you have it will go and try for those many blocks and then it will exit out if they are not able to find the error if suppose if block number uh, three up to this so this is error this is error but block three is ready to go the code will execute from here and then again further onwards correct so that's the power we have with error handling when we are doing such type of async calls we should have the proper error handling mechanism configured in 2.2 we have to understand about rest api errors actually there are two types of error one that we can recover and one that can't be recovered that will be unrecoverable okay so uh, we are going to check the types that we have for recoverable and unrecoverable uh, errors. In unrecoverable errors, you'll find that the error code 400, 401, 403. That means either you have some programming error or maybe you are not able to generate the right token, the API token, uh, even the token is generating, it is expiring um, while the programming code is executing so what does it mean suppose you are generating the right api token but your programming request and replies they are going uh, for for example 10 minutes but the token that you have generated is valid only for one minute or two minutes that means while your script will execute if you are not generating the token within one minute for 10 times you will get there means your program will not get successful correct and then you can increase the timer by six as well like 60 minutes uh, that you you want to run that program for 60 minutes but your uh, token is generated only for six minutes correct then you have the forbidden error that means you don't have the authentication authorization to run such apis maybe you are not the root admin and then you are executing those type of script uh, you don't have permission uh, so uh, the forbidden error will come into the picture apart from that there are recoverable errors as well and we have discussed about this error in our previous section maybe you have network issue network error network congestion maybe firewall blocking the port or maybe it is opening for very short duration you have to execute the program etc so in case of networking error um, if the server is busy or if your network is slow etc maybe any any type of case then you can go and use some sort of mechanism to uh, do the error handling you can increase the timers or you can do the retries etc so here you can see that some codes related to recoverable errors like 405 408 uh, 429. 429 clearly you can see it is telling that too many requests. Now, if your retries are uh, maybe you can increase the retries in an integer, maybe 10, 20, 100, etc. But if you increase your retries for 100 times, that means for one particular request, 100 times you are requesting, it, it is itself a type of um, denial of service type of attack, correct? So we should have some sort of balance how many uh, requests we are doing from server to the client side. Correct? Then timeout and uh, a few of the mechanisms we have discussed in the previous section as well. Now, a few of the platforms such as Cisco WebEx, um, they are supporting error code 429. Uh, that means 
And the point being here is this, that these type of methods are there inside the rest, correct? But in a program itself, you have to write the code so it can support means They are not the inbuilt methods that, that can do the fault tolerance or uh, recover from the errors automatically. You have to write a code in a way that it should work. Otherwise it will not work. That means you have to write your uh, program in that efficient manner. Correct, otherwise it will not work. You can see here the control flow related to REST API error handling. So suppose if I am uh, using my HTTP GET method and you can see all uh, four listed uh, issues here. So for example, if I have network timeout, then in my programming code, I should retry. Correct, and this uh, this flow we have discussed earlier. So you can set your retries maybe three times for 10, 10, 10 seconds. So after every 10 seconds, you will go and retry up to three times. In coming 30 seconds, if you're not getting the response, that means um, gone, means you can throw some error. Then second, uh, HTTP 4 to 9, that means too many requests, then you can wait. So if the server is getting too many requests, then it can wait and it can do the retries until unless it will get some success code. Then suppose if you are getting the HTTP 401, that is unrecoverable recoverable error. 401 is unauthorized error. So in that case, drop out that request, means uh, throw the error, correct? So handle error. It is throwing the error that uh, the a script can't processed further. Finally, if you're getting the HTTP code 200, that means success, that means you can process. So this is the overall control flow. And while giving one example related to the unauthorized uh, issue or error that we have, how to generate the API token, I have created one script here. I will attach with the file notes. Let me go here and let me show you here. So if I can go here and I can show you that program that I have, the name is backup API, but let me show you the program. So what it is doing here is simply generating the token. Now this show, a token may be used for other functions in the next phase in the same program. So if I can show you the program, this is backup related program where first of all, it will go and generate the um, token and once it will go and generate the token then in the next phase so let me show you the token generation program first so you can see that it is generating the token it's getting the token from the library printing the token and this same token it will use to get the backup for next piece of cycle from the next uh, programming cycle correct great so this is the way that we can understand the flow related to API error, you have to recoverable and unrecoverable errors. Then you can see the code related to unrecoverable errors, 400, 401, 403. And for recoverable errors, you have 405, 408, 409. And then you can see the complete uh, flow control related to that. All right, let's just stop here. In section 2.3, we are going to understand about how we can optimize APIs using cache, HTTP cache. Now there are other methods as well, such as compression and pagination. We'll see that pagination in the next section. Okay, in, in section 2.4, we have to understand about pagination. Let's focus on the caching and cache control. Now when the load will increase, uh, we want to optimize our application and there are two ways. Either we can improve our hardware, means add uh, the resources like CPU, memory, et cetera, or we can go and optimize our applications. Now, if we are optimizing our application, that means uh, we don't want to call all the resources all the time. So what does it mean? It means that we know that we have client and server client and server relationship. Now, if client and server, they are doing the transactions all the time with 
full capacity, full resources. That means that you need more bandwidth, you need more processing time, you need more resources, correct? Rather than instead of sending complete payload or complete resource. So we know that we have header and then we have payload in all the cases, in, even in the uh, network transactions as well, like uh, you have headers such as source IP destination, IP port numbers, protocols, etc., And then you have the actual file, actual content, that's the payload. Here also you have HTTP negotiations first, uh, HTTP, you can think like HTTP API negotiation first, and then you are exchanging the payloads, correct? Your methods like put, get, um, delete, etc. whatever methods that we have inside HTTP. So instead of doing the actual resource transaction, if you can negotiate with the headers, correct? And if you are able to write your code properly or your API is optimized properly, then you will negotiate with your validators, um, with your headers actually. And in that case, uh, you can save the bandwidth, processing time, and the process utilization, etc. That's the overall key we have with the cache control. So in that cache control, what is happening? And I'm going to give you an example, for example, Chrome. Whenever we are accessing any a website, and suppose if you access first time, it, it may take some time, but what these uh, web browsers are doing that they have first few pages cast inside the browser. So now all the intelligent browsers, they can do some sort of caching. So once you are sending the request to the actual website, www website, you are sending the HTTP get request Correct. You are doing some sort of request. And since you have the cache, so, uh, it will not take much time to open any site behind the scene. Again, the process means inside the website, what you want. You want to watch the video, you want to see some content, etc. Again, some processes will going on behind the scene, but your first page will get opened. That's the caching. And caching may be different. You know, caching may be that your browser is doing some sort of caching, or maybe you have some proxy in between, or maybe you have some gateway, gateway devices, they are working as a cache, uh, cache servers, etc. Maybe some uh, cloud hosted web servers, they are uh, working as a cache server. Okay. So there are different ways that caching can happen, and it is listed here. So caching may be implemented different places at client, for example, web browser, locally at the organization proxy server, on the server side as a, stand, a standalone reverse proxy or as a gateway, API gateway. Okay, so th these are actually the caching mechanism that already something is cached there. And when you're sending the request, you're sending the fewer amount of bytes in terms of headers, and then you're getting the full resources loaded on your system or you are getting the response on your system. Now there is problem with the caching that suppose if the request or suppose if the content that you want to know, if it will go expire, correct? So you don't know. So you are doing some caching, for example, suppose I am opening some website www.a.com and it is cached in my web browser, but if someone has done, so suppose if the creator of a.com, he has done some changes in the, in the first two, three pages that I have cached in my web browser, then I don't have the newer content, correct? So what is the guarantee that the cache that I have is fresh? The cache that I have is new. The cache that I have is actually I'm requested. Correct? So that's why we have something called the validator. And we are going to discuss more in the upcoming video that what's the E tag, what's the validator use, et cetera. But we want to make sure this thing that the request that we are doing via HTTP, we are getting the exact content that we are looking for. Okay. And there may be a refresh timer. So for example, API calls, they may have refresh time of 60 minutes or maybe 60 seconds, it depends. 
So we should have the exact content that we are looking for. And that's why we want to, we want the content should be refreshed. Okay. So a stored, you can see here is stored resource is considered as a fresh. If it may be served directly from the cache as a web server cannot contact caches and client when resource changes. That's the point that I'm telling that if your resource will get changed, you should put some sort of expiry time on that. And suppose uh, if your expiry time will get expire, this content, this cache content is termed as a stale. And a stale doesn't mean that it's invalid. But somehow we have to do the validation for the stale content. Correct. And then the validators thing will come into the picture. We are going to discuss more and more about the validator in the upcoming section. Now, the point being here, an important point being here is this, that when we are validating the content that is stale, or that, that may be old. So when we are doing the validation for the stale uh, resources, and if we are validating that with respect to HTTP headers only, remember the header thing. So that, that will be considered as a cheap because you are not using complete resources. You are simply setting the headers, correct? My headers, my first initial bytes, they are going and checking that the stale entry is still fresh. The stale entry is something I'm looking for. It's a new entry. It's a something I'm looking for, correct? And uh, then the validator will come into the picture. So what validator will do? So validation can only happen if the original server previously provided a validator for resource, which is some value described a specific version. Means again, I will explain this more and more in the upcoming section, but you have something cache, correct? And the cache entry should be fresh. If it is not fresh, then it will be a stale. Now, if it is a stale, then who will do the validation, correct? And how in the validation you'll come to know that's the new entry or it's the old entry. So in validation also you'll find that there are multiple methods. Maybe validation will do, and with respect to headers, we are doing the validation. So the validation that we are doing, it may be depending upon the version one, version two, version three. It may be depending upon the timestamp or hashes of timestamp or hashes of version control or versions, revision numbers, etc. Correct. So uh, then your e tag, that's the entity tag, and other things will come into the picture that we are going to discuss in the upcoming section. But this is the summary. Correct. So what you want, you want to do the cache. What are the methods for cache? Either your web browser or uh, your server or proxy servers or reverse proxy or maybe API gateways, correct? Now, once you have the cache, you need to check your cache is correct or not. It is fresh or a stale. If it is a stale entity, then you have to do the validation. When you are doing the validation, then you have the e -tag entity tag will come into the picture and we have different, different diagrams with help of those diagrams. We are going to learn more about the e tag validations and uh, other important aspects in the upcoming section, correct? So this is actually the flow that we should know. And in the upcoming section, uh, we are going to discuss more on this. All right, so let's just stop here. In this session, we are going to learn about conditional headers and validator. From our previous recording, we know that we have two types of validator one dependent upon the last modified date, other one dependent upon entity tag. Now, when we are talking about validators, again, you'll find that we have two different types of validator. One validator is a strong validation. That means it will go and check byte by byte resources. Other one is the weak validation. There it, it will go and check minor differences like different air ads or footer with a different uh, date. Now, the important point here I have highlighted that HTTP uses a strong validation by default. Now, before going to the use cases, we should know about conditional headers and what type of criteria or matches we have. So inside HTTP conditional headers, you'll find that there are several conditions that uh, 
that will be depending upon what type of validation we want, a strong validations or a weak validation. But uh, these conditions are very much important to understand the optimizations related to HTTP or to understand more about HTTP request. Uh, it is not true that all the time, whenever we have client and server request and response, they are related to resources. Sometimes we are sending the HTTP request with few bytes, just the header, you can think as a header. So we are not sending all the times all the payload instead of we are doing the communication with respect to headers and where these conditional headers are very really important, okay? So let's understand uh, if match. If match, as name suggests that if it is matching, so if it is matching with the distance resource, then it will be successful. This performs a strong validation. And if it will not match exactly, because these are the strong val uh, validation that should ma match exactly whatever they're in the client and the server, whatever they're in the client and the uh, distance resource, if it will not match, that means resources are not matching. Again, I'm going to show you the examples related to this as well in the upcoming slides. Now, if modified since, that means suppose your client and server and your client having the version 1.3, server having 1.3, that means they, they are not modified, correct? Suppose your version is 1.3 and server is 1.2 or 1.1, still it is not modified, means it's unmodified. But suppose if client version is 1.3 and server is 1.4 or 1.5 means higher than the client version, that means it has been modified. This is the condition. Again, you have the if range, whenever you're down, downloading some resources and if you have downloaded 10 bytes, the so next time you'll set the condition that I need from 11th byte. That's the range statement will come into the picture. Now examples, I'm going to give you a few examples related to uh, use case examples. Uh, one is related to cache, another we'll see related to uh, downloading option. Okay, cache update. So we know that browser can have the cache entry. Now when the browser having the cache entry, so we know that after some point of time, it will become a stale, correct? A stale entry. Now stale entries are there in the browser and do my stale entry, they have the latest copy. Or do my stale entries having the latest update from the server, how we can um, check that. Correct. So for that, we can send some sort of empty request with the HTTP, and then the uh, server will send the response uh, with the last modified date and tag that, okay, you have a cache entry. First of all, I have the cache entry. And next thing, we, what we want, we want to see that the cache entry is not modified. If it is modified, I should have the updated value. Correct. So for that, you can see that we can send something called the header with the uh, header with the conditions, and that's the conditional header, correct? So in the first request, you can see that uh, we are not sending anything related to condition. It is blank request, but in the second request, we are sending the request with condition, header with condition, with if modified since, if none match, and we know uh, what does it mean. Now, if we're getting the response from the server that nothing has been modified, that means my STL entries are still usable. Okay, think about the use case. If something happened from the server side, correct? And we don't want to send and check these updates all the time because we don't want to waste our resources, sending, waiting, sending, waiting, etc. correct? Instead, what we want that we send some request and we uh, we get the update. Rather than, rather than we are sending the request and we are getting the response, what we want, we want to send the request and we want the uh, response in terms of, not for the update, but in, in terms of new update response. So this is nothing but new update response. 
Okay, and that can be set with the conditional header. So you can see that if modified since, if none match, so server is telling, okay, uh, new date and new entity type. These are the new timestamp, uh, date to an XYZ2, correct? And this is the use of the conditional header. Um, instead of sending the full value, instead of sending the full amount of resources, we can send the opaque string, we can send the conditional header, with the header itself, we'll come to know where we are. What about the cache in TSS tail? If anything we change from the server or from anywhere outside, um, we will get to know. And the second use case we have about the partial download. We, we are downloading something from HTTP sites, correct? And suppose if you have done 50% download and you want some sort of resume capability that maybe after one hour, you want to resume after one hour, you want to download. Now, when you do your um, download again, you don't want to start from zero, correct? You want from 50% of where, whatever bytes you left. From there, you want to start your download, okay? So this is again very important um, aspect related to conditional header. Uh, when you want to resume your download, what you can do, uh, suppose if you have resume up to 23783, next time when you want to download, you want to start from that point up to the end of the file, correct? And it can be done with the with uh, with respect to the um, conditional headers that we have. The only catch here is this, that suppose if you have stopped downloading at this point of time, and after 30 minutes you are downloading, make sure that the server hasn't done any change in the download that we are downloading is so those files that we are downloading they should be uh, they should be the, the same file it's not altered modified from the server side so here you can see that then you are sending the conditions if unmodified if it is unmodified now if it is failed then you have to re-download the file you can see now we are doing the restart the download restart downloading the whole file if there is any um, any any change. Now again, we are sending the request again here and you are getting the response, response that something has been changed from the server side. If you don't want that, what you can do, again, you can use the conditional header that simply you can tell that I have downloaded up to 23783. And in case if it has been modified, you simply start the new download. That means, again, the use cases are there. There are optimized use cases. There are, there are different type of use cases, but you can think that you have your HTTP and then you have your conditional header. These are the, these are the tools that we have. We can use these tools and however we want to optimize our cache, we can go and optimize. All right, let's stop here. In section 2.4, we have to construct the script, and I'm going to show you that uh, script where it will go and support pagination. Why we need pagination? The simple answer is this, that we want to improve the overall API experience. We know the evolution of networking and it started with CLI where we used to execute so many good commands with respect to CLI and we are getting the result. CLI is always good for troubleshooting. Then we have the GUI experience where we can go and uh, create, means we have the defined workflow and with those workflows, we can go uh, point click, 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 and with help of graphical user interface, we can go and do the configuration. Actually, we can do all sorts of things with GUI. And there are nicer GUIs with all the STN capability, uh, capable devices such as this Tvan V manage, ACI AP controllers and DNA, uh, DNAC controllers, etc. In Cisco, non-Cisco product also, uh, which is supporting GUI. And then we have a third generation called API. And this is one of the fastest growing uh, application interface we have in all the SDN products. Why APIs are important? Because it can be integrated with software. It can be integrated with any type of programming language and it can give you the fastest result. 
that anyway is not possible with CLI and GUI. Now, when we are running API and when we are doing the request with respect to API, at that time, there are chances that we can get a lot many pages. So one request, for example, if I have 2000 networking devices, 2K networking devices, and I have an API who will give uh, these networking devices IP addresses, management IP address. That means that you have 2000 line at least. So one sort of API will give you 2000 lines. It may be big. And not only the management IP, but you're looking for serial number, you're looking for unique IDs, you're looking for associated neighbors, you're looking for other informations as well. So that means your pace will increase, increase, grow, grow, grow. In that case, what we need, we want to need that somewhere it should stop. Somewhere it should break and we should get that portion. Suppose only you are looking for first 10 entries or 20 entries, then you don't want to scroll down all the 2000 entries, correct? And it is very much true when we are checking the logs, log entries, uh, we want log for only 100 items or 200 items, etc. So at that time, we need to, uh, in our API, it should go and support the pagination because we want certain block of the requested item. We don't want entire entries, whatever we have in the API output. While using pagination, obviously, it will go and improve the response time because we are not taking 2,000 entries, but we, we want just 10 entries. Right? And then it will go and save the resources, obviously, because it will take a less, less compute time, it will take less networking resources. Okay, so there is one example, and I'm going to show you in the uh, programming as well, the script as well, that you have an API, your API version one or two, and then you can go and set the offset. Offset means from where you are starting, and then limit 20. So after 100 entries, it will go and give you 20 items. Okay, this is the meaning of this particular API. Uh, we can go and use offset and limit from where we are starting and how much we want. Uh, and then we can get those entries. Let me quickly show you one of the API that I have here. I'm going to attach this API with this recording so you can also go and have a look. This is one of the API related to getting the events and you can go and check how we are getting the events and then getting the events and then doing the printing now here you can see here we have the api construct where we want to limit this to offset is zero starting from beginning and give only two output but i will go and increase this limit uh, three four five so i can show you the result and then it is taking all those uh, audit logs and in those logs uh, it will go and filter out the description the events like event time device name device ip etc that means i want selective output even i can go and print this in a csv format as well if i want correct so this is the magic behind the scene that the api is supporting the limit option the offset and then even we can go and do some more filtering like order by uh, time and order uh, description, etc. Yeah. So let me go and show you the result. So if I go here and I'm going to execute that script, where you can see that the limit that we have is uh, two. And if I go and make this three, save. Obviously, this time you will see three entries. That's for the filter that we have in the program. I can say three entry. If I go and increase the limit to five, and then offset, I'll give two or three. So after two entry, go and print five items. Right. I can see one, two, three, four, five. Like that is working. Okay. So you can see the simple use of the construction that we have related to limit and offset that we can provide the pagination. Once we have the pagination, that means that the resources will be saved, compute will be saved, and the output will be faster. 
okay all right so let's just stop here in 2.5 we have to understand the steps in oauth2 three legged authorization code grant flow now in this section we are going to learn that in between the client so we have the client we have the server and we have the user so in between our user and the server we have the third party client and if this third party client need to access the resources how this authorization will come into the picture so we are going to learn the auth flow and how this auth flow is going to give the security in between the user and the server now when it is talking the user and server let me quickly show you the diagram so suppose we have the end user that is termed as a resource owner and he want to open any of the resources hosted anywhere in the cloud and for that i have one client software installed in my laptop or in the user laptop so what this user will do it will go and open his client software you can see the client here and then he can go and access the resources in this example is the google resources so he want to read some uh, google docs he can go click his google document client and then he can go and access the resources correct but here you can see that uh, the end user in between the server and the end user we have two pieces and we need to understand these two pieces we have first of all the client and secondly we have the authorization server so that means when the resource owner he want to access something over the resource server and he don't need full permission in he, do, he don't need full uh, admin permission to access the resources rather than he need uh, that access for a limited duration so what this client will do it will go and generate some sort of token and with that token the client will go and initiate the api call to the resource server and then those resources the end user will get and then he will read that document correct okay. so i'm going to explain you complete workflow here but we need to understand that we have four components here we have the resource owner who is the actual end user we have the client means which particular client software we are opening we have the resource server from where we are getting the document and in between the resource owner client and the resource server we have something called the authorization server who is going to get uh, give us the token who is going to give us the ids and that token that id will be uh, limited for um, a duration with that duration we want to access that particular resource so from the resource owner to the server these tokens will come into the picture correct now let's go and understand this little bit in detail and here we have the complete workflow you can see that the resource owner so here is the resource owner wants to access something he wants to read something so what he will do he will go and do the request to the client means he will go and open the google docs in his laptop so read my book from google doc or google book now the client will respond that you need authorization token means i need actually authorization token can you get me the authorization token from the authorization server so client is responding to the end user and then what end user will do end user will send that request to the authorization server so here you can see a3 this is the step number 3 authorization server i need uh the client id i need the redirection url i need the access token etc means you can see here the list of things that he will send in his request response time scope client identifier state and redirection url so this is the communication the a3 is the communication between the end user and the authorization server now authorization server he will give him the auth code authorization code and 
inside that auth code, he will redirect the user towards the client. Okay, so here you can see that step number actually A, inside A we have A1, A2, A3, and you can see that the B, that means when A3 will end, the server will give him the permission and then he will redirect the user inside C that you can usually I am redirecting you towards the client. So now once the step number A, B and C will complete it, uh, completed, then the client and actual authorization server communication will start. And that's why this is the three leg OAuth 2 version that we are discussing here. So now the client and the authorization server, they will do the communication directly. And then the client, so inside step number D, the actual client will ask the authorization server for the authorization code for a certain duration of time and with, uh, with the redirect URL. Once the authorization server will give the access token on behalf of the end user, because actual requester is the end user, that is the resource owner, correct? So once the step number A, B, C, D, and E, here you can see access token will get completed. Then a step number F will start. That means the client will go and uh, send the actual API, so authenticated API calls for uh, the Google read or the Google books. So now the resource will get open and then the client and then actually the actual end user will get the resources. Okay, and then he, he can read the book uh, during that particular duration of time. Correct. In between, you can see that one other step, uh, step is highlighted here. Why? Because there are chances that token will get expire and this thing we have discussed in our previous sections as well that tokens may get expire so in between the client and server they will do the validation of their tokens and they will regenerate the token so the end user the actual resource owner can read the book uh, during that uh, duration as well okay so you can see that this is going to provide you the extra layer of security in between the actual resource owner and the actual resource server, correct? Because these tokens are getting generated for a certain duration, for a certain task, and uh, it has a redirection URL as well. Once you go and close that particular app, once you go and close that particular book that you're reading, then this process will get completed. And then the, uh, the actual resource owner and actual server, they are get separated and obviously they are safe now. All right, so this is the step related to or to three-legged authorization. In section three, we have to learn about Cisco various type of platforms and associated APIs with those platforms. Here you can see a long list of topics that we have in section. APIs related to WebEx, then APIs related to uh, firepower device management. This is the firewall product of Cisco. Then APIs related to Meraki, Intersight. So few of them are security product, few of them are data center product, few of them are uh, LAN product like DNS center, going to manage the LAN devices. Like that, we have to understand APIs related to this. Now, it is possible that um, engineer who is working in the LAN, he don't know about the compute or the data center products, or maybe um, engineers who are working for the data center because different, different engineers, they are working in different, different uh, reasons, different, different groups inside the organization. So maybe they are working in one product vendor and then there are chances that uh, they may know those uh, other product as well but they are not actively working correct now here we have to think as an automation engineer because when you are going to automate everything for your organization irrespective of which particular branch you are um, means you are supporting land van security etc 
the idea being here is this that the automation engineer should do the automation for all different products okay and that's a very important point that we have so automation engineer he has to work with lan engineer van engineer security engineer uh, collaboration engineers wireless engineers etc okay so that's why uh, here you can see the importance for the automation engineers will increase because they have the multi domain knowledge and then plus their uh, automation skills like python plus apis plus ansible etc okay so in this section we are going to learn these products and apis one by one although you can see the agenda here is just to uh, construct the apis related to cisco platform correct but what i will do i will give you uh, one video is related to the technology as well. So for example, um, FTD, security product. So I'll start with what is FTD, why it is important, and then you'll see API related to FTD. Okay, so this approach I will try to use for all the sections and subsections. So it, this section will become a little bit easier to understand and uh, complete. All right, so let's uh, stop here. And the next section, we'll uh, start with 3.1. In 3.1, we have to understand about chat ops with the WebEx API. Now, this section is important because you will see in coming year 2022. Uh, so in coming year and upcoming years after that, 22, 23, 24, you'll find that the organizations, they are moving towards automation and automation is one landmark after that they will try to innovate inside the automation that means they are looking for artificial intelligence uh, machine learning inside the uh, inside the infrastructure uh, operations they are going to look about the bots as well you will see heard these things used again and again and again bot now what's the use of bot means that you may have a webex that you can go and use as a bot so these uh, Webex or maybe a Microsoft Teams. Now, why we are using this for collaboration, correct? For messaging, for video conferencing, calling, etc. Nowadays, uh, they become a little bit robust. Means they actually crossed their collaboration uh, limit, and they are going to use as an operational tool as well. So while you are doing the chatting, while you are receiving any message, but you are doing some operational stuffs as well. Okay. Why? Because everyone is using chatting and everyone is connected with the teams whenever we are working uh, inside the organization, we have group teams, etc. Correct. Now, the point here is this that if we can innovate our WebEx in a way that it will work as a centralized infrastructure management tool it can work as a tighter collaboration it can it can it can provide some sort of transparency uh, so any event will happen anywhere in the infrastructure with the uh, webex chat window will come to know now suppose if you want to do some troubleshooting you want to know about the device details about the image compliance about a certain device etc Everything is possible. You simply go to the bot, you can ask him, bot, can you tell me serial number with this device? It is in inventory or not? How many devices in this particular region, etc. Means you'll get good amount of information simply with the chatbot or botnet, etc. Okay. Uh, that's the thing we have. And it is one of the successful model uh, people are using at the at the moment because these tools now they are integrated with APIs and APIs we know is a machine to machine interaction. So with help of one machine that that may be my Cisco WebEx, I am sending API instruction to my Cisco DNA that is other machine. And then I'm getting the in information about the top issues, about the high utilization, about the inventory inside the DNA managed devices, etc. And same is true with Teams, with other product as well. At least I have checked with the WebEx and Microsoft Teams that they have something called a web hook. And with those web hook, we can get the information. It's a machine to machine interaction. And then you have some sort of uh, 
you can say some some sort of connector you have you can do the connection and then you can get the information whatever it is coded in a program you can see that um, the chatbots can be used to get the notifier means you can get the events you have the controllers means you can do some sort of uh, installation you can do some sort of post type of method so you can think like this get means getting the result you can do some sort of post method or put method means you can update and some personal assistance as well okay now when we are talking about a specifically webex uh, chatbot or webex bot then you have to follow some instruction step by in, uh, step by step instruction and easily you will enable this inside your system correct now let me quickly show you one of the nice uh, link here so you can go and check uh, the github uh, dns enter web uh, bot and here you can see the steps so what are the steps you need first of all you need a webex team account here you can go to developer webex.com and you can create a new app while creating it will ask you uh, you want to create bot you have to select the mid option bot once you go and register you'll get some sort of access token so once you go and register once you go and give the icon etc you'll get one token here that token will be used inside the program okay now this is one that we are going inside one of the machine and we are uh, we are creating the bot and we are getting the access token but there should be some workflow correct and what is the workflow so let me quickly show you the workflow what is happening behind the scene and this is the link i have opened so the workflow here you can see and this is very important to understand that you have your webex where uh, you are going and you are enabling the bot correct but from my system i have to go to webex and webex will uh, send the instruction to maybe cisco dna dna with the apis etc and then you should get the result here correct but my machine is a local system correct and webex may be hosted somewhere in uh, cisco cloud or somewhere in the amazon cloud anywhere it's, it's a public hosted cloud application that one of the agent i am using in my laptop correct so what is happening actually we need some sort of a web server in terms of i'll show you that list in terms of flask etc or micro containers so that will go and create that tunnel in between my private and public infrastructure get the instruction from the webex and finally it will forward to the bot that i have created and bot has been created to the webex okay so different different pieces are there i am sending the request here correct to my bot bot i need the device list from the dna and obviously my program is connected with dna as well that is not shown here in this diagram but behind the scene i am sending because my laptop is in the private network and it should have the tunnel in between the uh, webex and the uh, flask or any type of micro container where it can do the communication get the result and finally it will uh, publishing the result inside the bot and uh, with help of bot i am getting the result in my um, in my webex right little bit tricky but once you and go check this video one or two times you'll understand the flow while you are following the flow you should go and check this particular link as well so you need some sort of ng rok uh, type of uh, you know software install in your laptop and if i have here i think i have so you can see what you can do oops ng rok http 80 online and you can see my forwarding key if you are registered user means if you are paid user they will give you one constant url and if you are not then all the time the url will get changed after 2 hours you can see every time you will go it will generate new url so here you can see that ngr okay and this you have to use inside the script either this link or this link because you have seen the diagram that webex is tunnel to ngr okay 
correct? Then you can see that you have to go and if you are doing some chatbot or uh, WebEx bot for DNA, so give the DNA credential, give your WebEx token. This token has been created here in this step. So here you will get the token, correct? And then finally, here, this link, you have to go and give the config file here. Only these two informations and then your uh, WebEx will work behind the scene. So once you go, uh, whatever chatbot name is there, there you can go and uh, type list device. It will give you the list of device configuration, etc. It will give you all those configuration. Now the programming is here. You can see the uh, Webex bot programming, the APIs, webhook, everything is here. You have to go and follow these instructions. Apart from that, you can see the config file. A config file is here. Here you can go and give the tokens, etc. And here you can see that you have the dnac.py. This is the dnac APIs that you have. All right, so just go and follow these steps and you will uh, get the result. Uh, here you can follow the slides first, then go and check the URL second and then check the programming, all the steps and you are ready to run your uh, WebEx botnet program. In 3.2, we have to understand about Cisco security product FMC related APIs. What I have done, I have created three videos. First video is going to explain you about next generation firewall. And then upcoming two videos are related to FMC related REST API and their use. So please go and watch these three videos and then we are very much completing our section 3.2. And next generation firewall, Cisco has acquired a company called Sourcefire. Uh, governed from Martin Rosich. And uh, you can see the number of dollars that Cisco has uh, spent in 2013. He was actually the actual coder or developer for the IPS, this North Signature. And uh, at that time, this many 42000 active members uh, was interested for Snort Engine. Okay, so uh, that's the reason Cisco has done the acquisition, but again, we'll go and check the features. What exact reason behind acquisition of uh, next generation firewall? Cisco already have their ASA firewall. We know that ASA firewall is, is great. Uh, it can do uh, up to say layer one to layer three, layer four inspection. We can create uh, VPNs. It's, it is very stable. We have CLI, we have CSM, we have ASDM. That's a GUI option, means we have both the CLI and GUI option. But it is not doing the IPS related task. So the firewall, although you can insert some module on ASA firewall, some external module or the embedded module inside the ASA firewall, and then it can inspect the uh, signature, but you have to update the signature in very traditional fashion. The ASA firewall then integrated with this uh, firepower and we'll see that more about the history and what is the present and the future scope but here you can see that apart from ftt firepower threat defense we have asa firewall we have uh, next generation ips devices we have asa firewall with firepower services okay so you have a standalone that means the product is a standalone ips ids device and then you have mix of ASA firewall plus IPS IDS device. You have a standalone ASA firewall as well. Now ASA firewall, they can't do much of the signature uh, inspection. That's the IPS IDS inspection. That's the one main reason that Cisco has acquired this company. Not only that they can go and check the signature, but we'll see that I have that list. I'll show you that. So here in the diagram, you can see that ASA firewall and then you have the acquisition of uh, firepower. And in between, you can see that uh, the ASA firewall, you can insert with IPS IDS module, and then you have a standalone FTD who can do ASA plus IPS IDS. So 
uh, although the project seems quite confusing but you can think now that you have perimeter firewall so for example ftd 2100 that's quite popular at this moment but ftd 4100 ftd 9300 etc these are the standalone boxes with the capability of l1 to l7 content filtering or uh, the firewall capability plus ips ids plus uh, some next generation firewall capabilities okay so no need to use asa firewall rather directly we can go and purchase ftd again they have both the form factor either the hardware or the software so virtual form factor is there for ftd as well now here you can see that what is the main use of asa they can do l2 to l4 stateful firewall filtering uh, they can go and create ACL routing application inspection and what IPS can do they can go and uh, do this signature inspection they have application visibility visibility control you are filtering advanced malware protection and now both best breed has been combined inside FTD so whatever capability that ASA has and the firepower has now FTD will provide you all with full-fledged services correct and again you can see the ladder here it's the evolution so you have the ASA firewall that was quite popular and most of the means you will you can see still that ASA, uh, ASA firewall is in use almost all the companies they start using PIX firewall and then ASA firewall again from PIX to ASA there was one generation and again from ASA to next generation firewall there is a generation so here you can see that the next generation is the firepower 41 uh, 4140 9300 etc and then you have the virtual form factor as well all right so let's uh, stop here i hope you can understand this evolution of um, next generation firewall hi in this section i will show you that with help of restful api how i can replicate the configuration from one firewall to the other firewall okay so let me first log into my fmc and then i'll show you the what is the configuration i have for one of the firewall and then we will log to the api explorer from there we will run some scripts or you can say the apis that to copy the configuration from firewall 1 to firewall 2 so let's go and first of all let's log to fmc i'm inside my fmc and let's just check the devices so i have the devices and in this firewall 1 click here to edit just to see that what configuration i have you can see i have isp and lan side and these are the ip addresses if i go to routing let me check that what routing information it has so ideally we should have a static route pointing towards the isp side let's verify that inside a static route you can see we have the static route okay now what i'm going to do that i'm going to log into api explorer so let me log to the api explorer so i am inside my api explorer and if i go to devices i will check that what type of apis we have so one api i have something called device copy config request and we'll check this api uh, what type of program it has the second api i have is the device record so first let me click here to check the example of the configuration for the copy the configuration let me click here to the example because this time we have to write our own api so let's click here to the example and it will pop up what is the uh, test type of configuration we have for this it is coming now here you can see that uh, you have one source with uid or uuid then destination or the target with the id 
and if you want to share the common configuration you have to use copy share policies okay so from here to here I want to uh, say replicate the configuration let me do one thing let me quickly copy this because we are going to use this script and then we'll populate the source and the destination IDs uh, to do our API based configuration so let me copy this let me open notepad and let me paste this configuration here what I want to change is the UUID so let me do one thing let me close this first because I want the um, the source and destination say firewall 1 and firewall 2 UUIDs so that for that reason I need to go to this device records let me let me click here to get so I can get the UUIDs so press here to the get and once we'll get that so here you can see in the right hand side let me click here to get it is fetching the device ID informations now you can see this is success and if I scroll slowly then you will come to know what will be the ID so the program let me do one thing here let's copy this program as well to the notepad okay and we'll check this program as well so this is something uh, some API that we have get some information and we'll check what is the programming or the code for this and then the UUID will copy to the first API that is the first program that we have okay so let me quickly go here to the new page let me simply expand this let us paste this now here let me expand this more yeah so here it is telling okay link item in the item the ID type devices self URL the name is say next generation firewall branch one oh, I am very much interested with this ID okay so the ID with the branch one I actually I am interested with the ID of firewall one so I can copy that ID to the firewall two okay so let's do that in order so let me copy the ID of say firewall one here and then I'll paste this to the template let me drag and copy this first copy and then I'll go to my other program this will my source so let us paste this here and then where I want to send this to the firewall 2 ID so copy that as well and then paste this in our template program so once I'm done with this copy paste and you have to do it carefully let's do it slowly so once I'm done with this copy paste then copy the entire program first and then go to the API now here what I want to do I want to post this information here in the first API so click here to the post okay and then in the right hand side where we have the API console 
in the body put it click here to post and if you get successful message that means you are good parallelly what i want to do here let's log to fmc and check this that from uh, this place it is getting the information or not inside my fmc if i check the deployment status if i check the task device configured copy is complete to next generation firewall 2 that is one verification now if i go to the devices and if i check the device configuration it should copy whatever there see it has copy all the configuration now you can see that these ip addresses are belonging to the ip addresses of my firewall 1 that means i need to change these ip addresses okay so as per our topology diagram i will change this ip addresses okay so let me go one by one to the interfaces and let me change the ip addresses so first of all i will change the ip address for the isp side let me click there go to ipp4 and the ip address to the isp site is 19818133.123/18 slash that is correct okay then let me change the lan side as well let me click here edit in the lan side ip address is again 19819.10.123 okay as per our topology you have to save this before moving further we can check the routing information because we have a static route as well so go to a static route check the static route information i uh, it's bit slow to popping up but still it is coming now isp side to f uh, fmc hq wan gateway like this we can verify it so isp side interface that's correct what is the gateway address because uh, we need to verify the gateway address as well okay so once these are figured out then click okay so we are very much done we have we checked that according to our configuration they have uh, copy the configuration from one place to other place uh, no problem on that now one other thing i want to tell you here before doing anything that if you check the configuration here you can see the copy share policy i haven't changed this copy share policy should be true and what does it mean so if it is not true let me first save this because i am going to edit the policy again uh, one more time but this time we have changed the api so let me edit and let me deploy this configuration i want to reply to next generation firewall to deploy while it is deploying it let's go to the policy and we'll check the what is the policy for firewall 1 and firewall 2 do they have common policy so let me click here to policies and access control so one option that i can check from here the other option that i can go to devices 
and if I am here in the device you can see for firewall 1 and firewall 2 by default they are using the same policy so no need to change that they are using the same policy say in case if they are using different policy and if you make that true so they will pol uh, they will copy all the policies as well okay so now it is okay it is uh, very much done means we are very much done with the configuration of one and two and you can see that with help of api how we can replicate the configuration the minor changes we can edit it manually okay so before moving further let me again go back to my api explorer and uh, this time i'm going to show you that how you can check your success message or your deployment messages okay I'm back to my API Explorer and if I check the ID value here so this is the ID value here let me copy that ID first what actually you can do here that you can go to the stats in the API info portion in the stats you can get the stat if you give the ID and if the ID is correct then if you click here to get you'll get the information about the ID so I haven't given the correct ID value so that's why it is throwing this error no problem again we can go to the devices You can go there again now this time again if I push here then it will push the values that I don't want to do but the story is this that you can go to the status you can put the correct ID there I think I have the ID there in the notepad so let me uh, take the ID from there go to the notepad We'll take the ID oh this is the configuration so we don't have the output ID but yeah if you put the ID value then it will show you that uh, whatever success message is there it will show you that successful message okay so this is the way that we can push the configuration with help of API from A to B in this section we'll learn that with help of Python how we can create the policies plus how we can register a firewall to the FMC okay so let us log into the FMC and check what type of uh, access rules we have and once we run the Python script we'll, we'll check that that how we can do that then again we'll uh, see those policy changes and plus I will delete one of the firewall and then again I will uh, add them with help of Python script okay so let's do it I am inside my FMC and you can see that I have only three policies say base policy branch one and minimum access policy let me go to my internal Linux server so let me log to that I'm logging to my inside Linux server with username and password now here I want token to authentic authenticate with my FMC API so for that I need this get token keyword once you type that then it will contact with the API uh, FMC API generator and it will give you two keys one key is something like X auth token access and that will be valid for say 30 minutes and then the second one will be valid for 90 minutes okay now let me go and create one policy from here and to create this policy I will needing this uh, this token so let me go to make policy let me copy paste this token what I want here I want one block type of policy and that is for all the junk type of traffic let's say junk ACP is the name press enter here now you can see that sending request to create policy create was successful 
Now, if I come here and let me refresh once, so I can go to the policies and I can refresh this page. Once I refresh this page and come back, so let me go to the analysis for the moment and let me come back to the policies. Now you can see access policy and if I click here to the edit, let me click that. Then you will see that uh, what is the rule inside this junk access policy. So I have this policy called junk access policy. It is it is inside mandatory and default. So that's okay. That's all our purpose. No problem on that. Now next what I want to do here. I want to add one of the firewall here. Okay. So before doing that. Let me go here and show you that uh, that what is inside this uh, make policy. Okay, so for that uh, I can go and check say more user say user local binary and then I can check make policy. Uh, this is the Python script which is using the REST API to create policies and you can see that uh, first of all I have some library and then the username and password. So the overall construct you can see here that is not that difficult. It's simple Python programming which is creating the policies. Now what I'm going to do here next that I want to go to my FMC and from here I will go to the devices. Let me delete one of the say next generation firewall too. Let me delete that. Yes. I want to delete it. Once it is deleted. The process is on. Then what I will do parallelly I will go to my party so let me create one new session here new party session here I can go to my next generation firewall too let me log in here Once I logged in inside this, then let me check the manager status. All these things I have done in the basic lab. So now we can see that no manager is configured. Now I'm going to put the manager configuration. Config manager. Add. And then the DNS of that. and then the password the default password now once it is done and then again if you check the show manager status so let us uh, this process be completed now again if i type show manager It is in pending status. Okay. Now what I'm going to do next. I'm going to execute the Python script. Uh, Python script name is run API script. Then what this script will do. I'll show you that. In a moment, but before that I want to run this script. So I want to run API script. Let us run this script and parallelly I will show you the Python configuration as well that what exactly it is doing. Okay. So although it is running. 
now it is asking that to specify firewall to register which firewall you want to register let me show you this script here this is the python api script now in the configuration section would you like to register managed devices yes no enter the name of new access control policy so all these things it will ask one by one according to our policy even it, it will check the license the access policy okay once it will do all those things then it will configure the interfaces with the IP addresses configure on it okay so all these thing will uh, things will happen let me go back to my Linux here so I want to configure NGF2 firewall 2 yes in the name of new access control policy what you want say my new access control policy now you can see that access control policy is created attempted to register ng firewall 2 status code is 202 post was successful registration is in progress so it will show you that registration is in progress and will wait till it will do all its functions and plus it will configure the IP addresses as well parallelly if I go to my FMC and if if I go to my status task remove all the older task now here you can see that uh, I started the registration of uh, next generation firewall 2 is showing that registration process is on we can check it parallelly communication with uh, NGF2 establish discovery is in progress discovery of device is in progress and here you can see that it has done all these steps now initially it was the post now get was successful interface discovery is in progress so first thing was the registration then the interface discovery okay so we'll wait for some time to you know let this process be completed we'll wait you can see the process is going on once it will do this get discovery then it will start configuring the interfaces okay and we'll see that how many interfaces it will find now you can see that interface discovery completed although the process is slow and on the top you can see that health policy applied successfully now it has found two interface and now it is configuring those interfaces okay so likewise uh, it will do its job now put was successful okay so here you can see the with the run of this Python programming post first then get and then finally we have the put that is successful now again I can go to my devices so let me go to devices because initially I have deleted that now you can see that I have my device here but what importantly I want here let me go to the policies say my new access policy out of order so what I want for that let me click here to deploy and that pro that is still in progress seems still it is in deploying so we'll wait uh, till we'll get the final ok and then we'll deploy it once we'll deploy then we'll move to the next section so let me close here because
In 3.3, we have to understand about Meraki API. What I have done here, I have created three videos, one with basics of Meraki API, and then two videos related to APIs. Um, you'll find in video number 43, it will explain about different type of Meraki APIs, such as location scanning, MB Sense, external captive, webhook, et cetera. And then finally, one video is there uh, with respect to Meraki API and Python scripting integration. So please go watch these three videos and then we are very much completing section 3.3. .3. All right, so let's understand the Meraki API and the power of Meraki API. Now this is true, this slide is true for all the APIs for all the technology like SD-WAN or maybe DC automation. So maybe I am, an, uh, I am a network engineer or developer, partner, integrator, service provider. I want networking protocol stack to integrate application. So nowadays that's the co uh, common normal means that nowadays we are thinking the application and then we are thinking about the network means how the application will help to build the network but initially it, it was just like flip like initially it was that you have the network in infrastructure and you're running your application on top of that so whatever restriction that we have with the network those things that application has to be here but things are changed now uh, now we have to think application in a mind and then we need to design a network so that's why we need programmable networking a stack or network programmability and that's why we have sdn and then that's the power means inside the sdn we have the power of these apis and you will see in the upcoming slides that how much innovation have been done inside api and so many apis have been added and with respect to meraki what are the key apis we have will see so now you can see that we have the api for almost everything either it's a uh, analytic, either it's analyzing, either it's whatever we are doing. And what type of API we have? We have dashboard API, webhook alert API, location integration API, the API related to cameras, API related to, uh, related to captive portal. All these things we have a, in, in the API. APIs are controllers, so be careful while you're using it because again, uh, if we don't know that which API we are running and suppose if the nature of API is post or maybe delete, so it can delete, maybe it can delete entire network or it can uh, do uh, no destruction, uh, destructive things as well. All these links are important. So I already told you that in this section, I will show you various URL link resources. So here you can see that we have the developer community, Meraki. Uh, this is also very informating. informative. You can go to the GitHub resource. We will get the library. In the lab section, I will show you that how you can go and enable the API. So we'll see that in the lab. We have other resources and uh, useful places where you can go and learn these things. How you can go and run the API, I will show you in the lab section. We have the get put post or delete method. Um, that's the restful API calls and that is true for other uh, SDN solution as well. We have dashboard, captive portal, scanning plus Bluetooth API, webhook alert, alert and MB sense API that we're going to discuss one by one in the upcoming session. Now here you can see the growth of API in last 12 months and it's a huge and we should focus uh, into the growth of API and we can uh, take the advantage of those inbuilt API plus new APIs as well in our infrastructure. So APIs are there for analytics, automation, marketing. Marketing means that uh, related to uh, query, uh, certain maybe certain location because again you are using location API and location API can uh, give you the location of the resources. Then uh, trigger location based on the application, uh, asset tracking, BLE device and all. So it means that API is there, uh, powerful API is, is there just to 
provide fast speed and not only the fast speed execution etc but it can be used for analytic automation and other stuff again we have nice resource in miraki.io you can go and have a look inside this miraki.io in the upcoming section we are going to explore more and more about the uh, these link and url that you are seeing uh, the dashboard api related uh, url and again we have always on sandbox as well where i'm going to perform the lab task so this particular url the username and password you can see on this screen this is always on la sandbox means you don't need any vpn or anything to log into this sandbox box and explore the miraki capabilities and features this is there in the cisco definite that I. so let's learn these all one by one again i told you that um, all these course you have the reference so automation course you have great reference at github plus cisco definite sites as well that you can go and refer now what is location scanning api now this is very much that you want the location and then the output will come in the JSON format So here you can see that all the devices via the Miraki It is going and communicating to the cloud and from the cloud portal We are fetching the report. We are fetching the details related to AP Mac client Mac or SSI timestamp and then we are storing these inside the backend server correct so very simple and straightforward uh, you have to go and enable this feature inside the miraki and then you will get the location and that's why that's why the name is location scanning api so all those details will get now again uh, here you can see the long list of the details that we are going to get in the json format so ap mac ap tag floor client mac ipv4 information basics information seen ssid etc again uh, this list is for the reference these are the information we are getting in the json format so here you can see that you have the data and the key you are getting the information in the json format now how to enable this to enable this is very easy and straightforward you can go to the miraki dashboard here you can go and check the always on Miraki dashboard. I have already shared the link and even in the uh, lab section. I'll show you I'll log in there and I'll show you You can go to network wide general setting and then you can go and enable the scanning uh, API It's very easy once you can enable so here you can see location and scanning uh, Analytics is enabled the scanning API is enabled then you can have this URL so you can go and and give the external URLs how it is working again this is something that we are doing the query so all the information is getting collected over the Miraki cloud from there we are doing the query and we are getting the information so get is nothing but the show command uh, via the CLI over the Cisco devices so HTTP get return of validator token HTTP post post of json and then we have the uh, verification of post using secrets and all this data so it's like we are querying to the miraki cloud and we are getting the information and if you want to save those information uh, you can save it i'll show you a few of the examples related to curl even we can go further and uh, use the uh, web browsers as well for the api get queries again we have the bluetooth scanning api we can go to the wireless bluetooth setting and we can enable that as well again the bluetooth uh, api data information here you can see that the information we are getting in the json format these are the details like ap mac ap tag ap floor etc we are getting great now let us continue this discussion and understand the next piece of api that is the mb sense api now in Miraki, we have a strong support of a smart cameras and these cameras having smart sensors, a smart chip. So they are giving the video feed. They are giving the video information and with help of APIs, we can collect those information. So we have REST API and MQTT API. 
that's the telemetry um, API and then uh, we can get the information so here you can see that information related to historical aggregate current snapshot real-time feed correct all these things are possible from the api's now here again you can see that if you go and check you have the link so api doc api doc api doc so api doc related to mv sense api doc related to link uh, api's uh, api docs related to snapshot api correct so you can go and refer these now what is very important here to understand is that we have two different methodology of api one is the rest api that we study and cover a lot before this session we know what is rest api how it is working and then we have one real time of real time api uh, uh, mqtt that's like uh, telemetry uh, api and mqtt the nice feature about this is that it is something like subscription based api means it is fully working uh, in push model so what does it mean we have discussed this about in the telemetry section that uh, we have snmp that method that is pull method means when you need you are sending some query and you are getting the information and then we have some sort some sort of live type of api uh, which is uh, using the pull method correct and it's quite frequent you have to set certain tuning you have to do some sort of subscription and then you will get the information so mqtt is very uh, important here and again you can have a reference or you can have a difference between rest and mqtt but mqtt is uh, referred here to do any type of query in the mvsense MVSense has a number of endpoints which provide aggregate data on the following people detection, light level leading, the people uh, detection metadata can be viewed. So, here you can see in the diagram that this has the information related to live feed. So, we have the people detection, we have the light level reading, and all those other informations, right? So you can surely test that and then one slide I have given just to give the reference between the rest and MQTT and again MQTT is a subscription based method and which is using the push pushing uh, messages and it's actually preferred over the rest based API. Okay, we have certain use cases as well a use cases related to when uh, we have the live feed related to MVS smart cameras. Okay, here you can see my notepad uh, steps. That first of all, we need to generate the API key. Now, once we have the API key, then we can go and test related to the organization and the network. So we'll go and run certain get commands, and then I'll show you that how further you can go and do uh, multiple tasks. So let's go and generate the API key. Let me log into the uh, Miraki dashboard. All right, so here I am inside the Miraki dashboard. Once you're here, you can go to the organization and settings. And once you are inside the settings, if I scroll down, here you can see that we have this API access option. Go and hit profile. And once you are inside the profile, you can get the key. So if I scroll down here, you can see that I have some old key. I can revoke that. So let me click revoke. And then I can regenerate the new keys that I want to use uh, for various tasks. So let me scroll down. Now here you can see that uh, the keys are not there because I want to generate new API key. Let me copy this. I have a store the new API. Now I can go back to my notepad and uh, I can put the new keys here. All right, so let me go back to the keys that I have 
and should be copied let me generate new and copy and then paste to the notepad yes same way i have generated the key and i am pasting here because in the lab we'll go and use it so let me quickly go and change those keys here you can see these are the curl method to run the api and let me quickly go and delete and add the new key in these methods all right so i have generated that now i want to use the curl method in my automation tool so let me go and open that here you can see i have the automation tool and enter now now you can see that we are getting the my organization and related output because we are running the organization related api likewise i can go and check the network related stuff as well with this curl this api and yep here you can see we can paste that information and we can wait because the query is happening behind the scene and we will get the result so here you can see there is some issue maybe some name resolution or some other so i am not getting the result all right so we need to verify this why this is not giving us the result maybe the organization and then the uh, network id that i have given so you can verify this what network id you want to check i can use any network id here you can see i have long list of network id and one is for the devnet so 549236 i can see 549236 and that should give you the correct output okay uh, although if you go and check the complete url so there is some difference in that all right let me check with any other network id i can go and i can put that and let's run this command so at the moment we are just doing the testing because our main agenda is to do the configuration of network so it is telling that not able to resolve api.miraki.com and let me go back and run my organizational api one more time so we are getting the result here and this output we should do some changes here like uh, instead of the url here you can see that we can go and change the url so what i have done here i have done a small change here instead of what uh, script i have built i have uh, changed this and i use this n149 and let me quickly show you here that you have n149 http here so i have used this and then i have mixed with the same uh, url that we have correct and then here you can see that we are getting the output it's just the get command that we can use and we can get the result great so now we are at this point and i already told you that we have the useful links from where you can go and check the uh, api miraki api integration and related examples so you can go and copy those folder inside your api engine so let me quickly show you here 
that I have my dashboard API path Python and if I go here you can see that we have the examples we have the generator Miraki etc now if you go to the examples and once we are in the example you can see that we can go and have various examples that we can go and run as a Python script so for example if I want to run the organization wide client or maybe AIU organization wide client so I can use this and enter now here uh, I can see that we have some issues related to the API token and that's actually important to understand because they're telling that we have the API key error we should define the API for this and that's why we have this API export so before running these API uh, you should generate the API and then you can set that and next you can run this program now while we are running this program we can see that we are getting the robust output this is related to all the clients and it is generating the report so we are getting the report and once the report will come then we can go and check the report output the result output somewhere you can see that we are getting some invalid error and if i go and show it the output now so you can see that we have so many csv files got generated i can take any of the csv file and then i can show you that the client related output that we have okay so here you can see that we have the full result now what we can do that uh, we can go and uh, copy these files maybe inside the windows with help of files or any other program and then we can open this in the csv format so you will get the output in the excel correct so all these are uh, excel file output where you have the uh, various fields that you can check inside the excel sheet great so once we have the variable set and then if i can show you the program so if i go here and run this so here you can see that either input your api key we have set that api key uh, with the export mirake dashboard and then this function is for uh, this program is for list the network clients so it will go and list all the network clients and then it will print those network clients in the csv format correct so here you have the full program and the output is in the file name dot csv that we can go and verify correct so this way we can set the variable and once we have the variable set we can run this program and then we can get the output okay so these are just the uh, verification apis uh, what we have done that we have verified few of the api first of all we have used the curl methodology and then we are using the api python integration to verify whatever information we will get uh, we want we can get that in section 3.4 we have to understand about intersite apis i have recorded two videos to understand this first related to intersite architecture overview and then the intersite script please complete these two videos and then we are completing section 3.4 let us talk about cisco intersite architecture overview and here we can see that with cisco intersite we can manage say UCS manager, IMC that is the integrated management controller, the Hyperflex uh, connect, the UCS director. So these things we can manage from my intersite. And what are the benefits say with respect to cloud management? 
we have benefits such as the cloud based data center management then we have global multi site data center edge management we have recommendations a recommendation engine that means that all the time behind the scene this cloud based controllers they are updating themselves we have real time analytics machine learning means these are the benefits or you can say the innovations inside the cisco intersite that these uh, they have these capabilities then they have the forecasting capabilities now this is with respect to say cloud managed then with respect to devops uh, they are doing the continuous integration uh, continuous delivery service are added with no disruption to the customers means customer even they don't know that what type of integration or patching they are doing behind the scene uh, to you know up the scale or to enhance the capability features of the intersite then finally we have the continuous monitoring so all such features we have in the cloud based intersite now here in the diagram you can see that not only we have this option or the capability of cisco enter site as a saas software as a service but we have this option of on premises as well so on premises i can manage my hyperflex my ucs cs series unified computing systems ucs mini etc that's the one thing and here you can see it is something termed as a management as a service where we have the features of telemetry analytics policy based orchestration we have app store we have secure and uh, com compliant option A api driven devops enable so this is again very important means continuous innovation is going on continuous uh, application development is going on with respect to that and then finally we have uh, you no know, connected with that tag means we have uh, very good backend support from cisco so all these things we have with this cloud feature with this cloud management feature you can say finally what type of services we have will learn this in the upcoming lab so here you can see that uh, we have profile service we have policy service in profile service we have profiles with respect to server fabric hx a cluster and the node profile and with respect to uh, policy we have vnic policy firmware policy server bios policy storage fabric policy then we have hx, uh, HX cluster policy so we have policies say, with respect to ucs and plus with respect to hyperflex okay so these things are there finally you can see that intersite continuous integration and delivery so we have integration say in terms of built test release operate and here you can see that microservices devops independent del uh, delivery always on rolling upgrades horizontal is in scale so these things even the customer they are not knowing these things but the developers they are developing the services or you can say the microservices and they are con continuously patching these services inside this uh, life cycle so we have this built test release and operate and it is going on so all these services say service 1 2 3 4 developers they are developing these services they are patching this inside this intersite okay so this is the overview of what type of architecture we have for this particular cloud based managed uh, software now here you can see i have one small program related to api authentication this program name is credentials.py this particular credentials.py i am going to call in other function other program so uh, let's go and understand this now we know that how this api integration with script working with our previous examples where we have learned about different type of uh, authentication mechanism and suppose if you know programming related to dns dwan or aci you may know these uh, steps now here what important thing is that you need two thing you need api key id and you need some sort of secret key file as well now this secret key you can see it is stored in this location in my local laptop from where i am going to run the script and then the api key id we need to generate 
okay so with respect to api key with respect to uh, the secret key that we have so api id key id and secret key we are going to do the authentication so we have the authentication program where these keys are going to be used okay and once this will get authenticated that means uh, we can go and proceed for our next uh, iteration or our next section in the program so suppose this credentials function where we are going to do the authentication i'm going to build one other program as well related to alarms dot example and here you can see that i'm importing the credentials i'm uh, i'm importing the sdk that's the uh, inter site correct so you need to do pip install for inter site to get all those uh, packages all those library function etc from the inter site okay so you can see inter site api uh, cond underscore api like that you will get all those information but you should have to do the pip install for inter site Okay, now here you can see that how this authentication process is working. We need URL and for that URL, we need the API key ID. We need that file where we have the secret key. Okay, now how we can generate this, uh, you need to go to the uh, intersite and inside intersite, you can go to the settings. And once you're in, inside the settings, you can see in the bottom, you have the API keys where you can go and generate your API key ID. Once you go and generate this, it is giving you option to generate, to download the secret key file as well that I have already generated and I have put inside my folder in this particular location. Okay, great. So let me show you, first of all, I'll go here. Let me clear this and I want to show you that this credential.py it will not give any output. Seems that there is something wrong here in this, but anyways, we'll, we'll go and we are going to correct this as well. So it is raising one exception. That's the error exception telling that uh, you do not have the API key ID here. So in this credential program, you can see that we have the argument parser and you can see these argument parsers are nothing, but these are the help. So help related to URL, help related to ignore TLSC by default. If you're not giving any URL, it will go and take this URL. Okay, then if you want to ignore the TLS, you can use that. If you have to give the API key legacy, if you have the legacy key, otherwise you can go and give the API key ID, then you have to give the file location. And these argument passes, they are going to be used. Okay, they are going to be used while doing the authentication process. Okay, so let's go back here and see the help function. And here you can see in the help function, it is telling that you should go and give the API key ID. And so let's copy this. And then I, I have my API key ID somewhere so I can go and copy. So let me go and copy this. Put, in, put here and enter. You can see now there is no error because now the authentication is working. How we can verify this? So I can go and run my other program that is related to get the alarms, okay? So here you can see that we are in the format. We are getting the alarm in terms of label name, file name, line number, messages, etc. This is the main function. And in the main function, you will see that we are calling the credentials. So client, client, credentials, correct? Importing the credentials and the config credentials. So this is the authentication process means now the valid user, they are getting authenticated with that uh, system with the intersite. And then we have the error, try and accept. So API instance, then the search period, then we have the query filter. We are querying what type of uh, uh, alarm we have. And according to that, it will go and run the output so let's go and run this now here also we should give the api key id because we have to give that 
So I can go and let's copy and paste this API key ID. Enter. Oops. Seems that it has some problem reaching to the destination. And it is telling that uh, this port is unreachable. I think I need to close my VPN. Let me close it. And let's try one more time. It's going on and now you can see that we have the output. So creation time, description, MOID. We're getting the alarm power state of two chassis. Chassis two in input file. Actually, in this intersite, I have only one UCS manager, and the power alarm related to that severity is only one alarm we have. Okay, in full production network, you may see good amount of alarms. In section three point five, we have to understand about UCS API and their integration with Python script. What I have done, I have created two videos understanding UCS Python SDK software development kit, video one and video two. So please go complete these two videos and then we are completing our section 3.5. In this section, I'm going to explain that how UCS Python software development kit works, what are the steps involved and how we can go and create our XML logs and from that XML log, how we can convert that into the program. So first of all, we need the package. You can see we can go and use the pip install UCS SDK, UCSM SDK, and this will get installed in our system. Now, once it will get installed, then we are ready to integrate this inside our script, inside our Python program. So here you can see one of the query program where we want to use the UCS manager SDK and we want to use the handles because first of all, we want to log into the device. So logging to the device testing should happen first. And then we can go and do any type of query. This is one example related to query, but in upcoming section, we will see that how we can do the post method, how we can do the other operations. So what I want with this query is that the query compute blades and print the number of object return. So it will go and tell you how many blades are there inside the UCS and the number of blades, because this is the Python function, this, which is telling that is string length and the blades. So this is one part of this particular program. The other part, what we want, we want to print some of the output related to blade, such as DN, serial number, and the model. And finally, I want to print the dump in, in terms of XML, the dump output format okay so we are going to run this particular program it's a small query program and we'll verify the output how it looks like so i have my script inside this particular folder ucs underscore code and then i'll go and run the example zero one and you can see first of all first of all it will try to connect with the ucs manager once it get connected it is printing the cookie you can see here the number of blade found 10, let me scroll a little bit up. So the number of blade found 10 has the compute blades that we have. And then you can see that uh, the DN number, serial number, and the uh, other output that we have. Then you can see that we have the XML dump as well. This dump, XML dump, if you want, we can uh, use different type of methods are there to convert the XML to JSON or CSV, etc. And we can get the desired result. Okay, is it enough? Great. So next thing I just wanted to show you that how you can create your program uh, with help of uh, 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 recorder. We have something called XML recorder. With that XML recorder, it will generate the log and that log can be used inside the uh, uh, inside one of the program to generate the full code coding inside the program. Okay, so first of all, you can see that once you log into the UCS manager here, we are inside the LAN manager and uh, VLANs, but uh, obviously if you want to reach here, you can go to the main page from there, you can go to the LAN. Once you're inside the LAN, you can go and click to the VLANs. 
let me go to the LAN so I can show you the VLANs. Okay, now you need to press in your system, in your laptop or uh, in your keyboard, Control, Alt and Shift. If you press that on the top, you can see the record, record XML will, will start. So what you do, just click there. And now the XML record is starting. Now what I want to do, let's go and create one of the VLAN. I'll go and create VLAN. That's the normal operation because this is a GUI way, but from GUI way, I, I'm just, uh, I just wanted to show you that how you can generate the equivalent code. So the VLAN name, say VLAN, give any, any name to this uh, VLAN, and then I'll give the name one, two, three, just for example. And the ID is one, two, three. VLAN ID, one, two, three. And let's go back here, VLAN one, two, three, okay? Uh, ID is one, two, three, and okay. So that means that this VLAN, this is a basic VLAN I want to create. It has been created. We can see here listed VLAN one, two, three. Now you click a stop XML record, give the name, say VLAN one, two, three. That's it. Okay, click okay. So we are creating the log. You will see that uh, it is uh, submitting that log here. Initially, I have created something called new Mac pool, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to save this log file show open the folder if i can show you this log here you can see this is the log uh, just to create the vlan now from this particular log how we can go and convert this log into our program so i need to copy this uh, because i have my programming folder here i want to put that uh, inside my programming folder so you can see I have other example called example 08. And in that example 08, I just wanted to give the name because oops, I just want to use that particular programming. Let me copy. Let's go here, dot, dot log. And I should have that file present in this particular given folder. So I should go back here. I should copy this particular log, copy this, go back here. And then we can go to this folder that where I have the code. Let me put that, it is copying. And then I can go back to my programming section. Let me do clear and then I can use python.exe. This time example is 08, that's my program. And now you can see that we have the generated script. So it is generating the script. Now this is script I will go and use, oops. I'll go and put in my exam folder. I have one exam type of uh, uh, script where I can go and put this. So you can see that please review and generate the CMLets, the start of the Python script and end of the script, what it will do. Once we go and put these line of code in my format, in, in my example frame format, it will create one, two, three or whatever we, we can go and give the name and ID. But this is the uh, programming output that we have. Okay, so let me quickly go and open the example folder file that I have. Let me see if I have in this folder, something called example, I don't have, so I need to copy from my other folder. Let me quickly go and uh, do that. So I can show you the, uh, how so this is script I'm going to use inside the framework that I have. And let me show you the framework. So here you can see I have one skeleton script. Uh, in, in this particular skeleton script, I'm going to add those inputs that we got from the log. So this is the input. Let me copy and paste here. Let me go to the skeleton script and put here. I'll do one thing. I'll make this as a, I'll may, uh, change this number. Let me make this uh, 193. And here also I'll make this as 193. 
And let me save this program and then we'll run this. So let me click save as, and this is VLAN 193. Uh, let's give some name. PY, let me save this as a Python file. And then I will go and run this program. So now it is saved as .py. Let me do CLS and we can go and run Python exe and this is VLAN 193, enter. Meanwhile, let me quickly go and log into the UCS where we can go and check this. So still this program is going on. Let him complete. Once it will get completed, I will go and log into the UCS box. Once I am inside the UCS box, then we, we should go and verify that uh, it should have VLAN 193 created inside the UCS. Okay, so I'm doing the remote telnet to my UCS system. And let's wait when we got the access. So then I will go there and I can show you the result. So here we have, and you can see 193 has been created. Okay, and VLAN 193. Great, so this is the way we can go and uh, create the log uh, with the recorder and that recorded log, we can use our program to convert that into a script. So we have used, we have used this program convert to UCS Python, correct? This function, this is uh, converting this particular log into the program. And then we can use in the program and you can see how easy. We have few more examples. Let me show you the examples. Uh, in this example, I'm going to show you the query uh, with respect to these queries. We can go and do the query related to UCSM and the query filter that we have, it will go and check the DN model and serial number. We can create query with respect to any type of compute blade and not only compute, but we can go and do the query to the entire compute system or UCS system. So here you can see the filter expression, UCSB, and these are the regular expressions. The expression and description, likewise, we can go and specify the exact model as well, like B200M4, B200M4, etc. And then once we have the query, once we have filter, then we can go and selectively print the output. Okay, so this is one of the query example. Let me go and run this. This is example number two. Python exe example two, I run this query. And in the output, you can see that uh, first of all, the query related to any. So you have the query model and regular expression, then it is matching the exact model. Then it will go and check the other query. So we have three queries. Now it is checking the other query. Let me press enter so you can see model. And then this is the fourth query. And maybe if some of the patterns are not matching inside the UCS model, it will show that this is not matched. Okay. And in the result section, you can see that DN, you can see the model and serial number. Great. In the previous example, we have seen that how we can create the VLAN as well. So here also you can see that if you want to create the VLAN, and let me change the number. So two, three, one, and this is two, three, one. Let me save this, this is example number five. This is also one easy, nice example that we can go and create the VLAN. If you go and run this program, 5.py, let me confirm that this is 05.py, it's working behind the scene. Meanwhile, let me go here and let's check that do we have the VLAN 231 created or not. So if I scroll down, 231, I can see 231 has been created here. I can see here, VLAN ID and the name has been created. And yes, the task is successful. Now, in case if you have to create um, 
good amount of VLAN, number of VLAN in a single instance of program. So that is also possible. You can see the example number six, where we want to create the VLAN, say VLAN 111, 301, 401, 501, etc. Means we can go and list those VLANs. We should go and create that. And in the meanwhile, we can go and check. We should not have two, 201, 111, those VLANs. So let me go and delete few of the VLANs from here, from the list. The deletion process is, you can see it's time consuming. So why not let's create the VLANs. And this program that we have now is a 06. So I can go here and run this example 06. Python dot exe. Okay. And it should create the VLANs. What VLANs we have? We have 111, 301, 401, 501. So let's see here. We should have 111. You can see. Then we should have 301. You can see 301, 401, 501. So now we have group of VLANs that we are creating and within no time all these VLANs get created. So these are the power of scripting. In 3.6 we have to understand about DNAC API and related to that API we have a lab to get the information about uh, wireless health information. Uh, you can slash it as a wire as well. So wire wireless information. Now, In case if you are new to DNA, um, how the DNA center APIs are working. So that's uh, the reason I have created complete playlist. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 videos. Now in these 14 videos, you will get the complete information about DNA APIs, how workflow, APIs workflow works, etc. And I suppose if you are aware about DNA programming and all those stuffs, then you can directly go and check video number 65, where you will get the troubleshooting plus assurance related uh, video where I have explained about health information and troubleshooting. Okay, so suppose if you are new to DNA, you please complete all these 14 videos just to complete this section subsection. But if you know all those related information, if you have knowledge, you can directly jump to video number 65 to complete this particular section. Okay. All right. So let's just stop here. We can see that section 4.2 is going to deal mostly with the theory. So let's start with section 4.2. First of all, describe the features and capabilities of Cisco DNA Center. And Subsequently, we have to understand about the Network Assurance API, Intent API, Multi-Belt Support, Events and Notifications, correct? So let's go through one by one and let's check first of all the features and capabilities of DNA Center. Now DNA Center is a big platform and we know that the evolution of DNA Center, there are so many things behind this DNA. So first of all, we have Epic EM and whatever good thing inside Epic EM that has been already there inside the DNA. And now DNA is keep adding the new, new features into it, correct? So one of the nice thing we have with the DNA center is that we can do each and everything with respect to the APIs. So here you can see that the capabilities that DNA center has, uh, it's, it's a combined uh, complete solution combined in terms of that we can go and integrate with the policy engine uh, that's the Cisco ICE so here you can see the ICE we have full automation capability analytics is in built inside that then we can go and integrate with Cisco umbrella we can go integrate with the still watch uh, with respect to ICE and DNA it can learn so we have the pixie grid feature inside the eyes and with that 
Uh, DNA scientists can learn the contextual information, and according to that, according to those information, it can run their algorithm with respect to artificial intelligence or machine learning, and then it can provide the solution. Correct. So inside DNA Center itself, there are correlation engines. There are multiple different sub processes that can analyze a particular event and provide the result. While using this DNA Center, uh, you can see here that it has the adapter. So you can see that we have the intent based infrastructure DNA Center and then it's open for different different integration either with Cisco uh, other product like ice still watch umbrella Cisco SD WAN, etc. Or it can be integrated with non Cisco um, vendors as well like Aruba or Juniper etc. Correct. So that's the true power we have with uh, with the DNA and in this slide you can see the summary that what are the things and capabilities we have with the DNA so we can go first time uh, in I think in any Cisco uh, SDN solution that we can go and integrate uh, the SDN solution with the IT automation engines like ITSM um, live actions are there W is there you know all those info blocks and other integrations are there so we can completely automate the IT process correct so whatever IT process automation we have like snow or uh, service now engine we have that can be integrated inside that so what does it mean it means that if any event will trigger inside the DNA automatically one ticket will get created to service now and inside that ticket all the steps will be involved so check step number one with these commands step number two with these commands step number three four with these commands and finally if you are not able to resolve then you have the uh, the contact means Cisco contact number will be there you can go and raise attackers Correct. So those type of things will be there in the integration. Then you can see that it has the business intent APIs that we can go and manage entire software inventory, network device discovery. We have the read based command runner APIs. Uh, we have the template runner programs. We can go and uh, virtualize the branches, plug and play, troubleshooting there good amount of business or intent based APIs are there. If we use those API in proper manner, that means we can drastically reduce the operational cost and we can enhance the troubleshooting capabilities. Then you can see that we have the third party integration as well, like we can integrate with Meraki, Stillwatch, uh, Cisco ACI, etc. And it is supporting third party SDKs as well. So in short, that DNA Center has full capability that it can be integrated either with Cisco or non Cisco vendors. It has full API support, everything we can program and with the script it can provide you the solution. And then it can be integrated with uh, IT automation processes as well. Correct? So these are the capabilities we have with the Cisco DNA. Let's stop here and in next section, we'll go inside section 4. Dot, actually, we'll go inside subsections of 4.2 and we'll go and check different type of APIs and features. This particular recording, after that, we have three videos. Here you can see that uh, we have DNAC API part one, DNAC API part two, and then your first lab related to API, DNAC first lab API, where you will understand the integration of DNA and the script, Python script. So th those are going to follow here, correct? I'm going to cover section 4.2 A and B. First one is the network assurance API and then the intent based API. So this video and upcoming three videos are quite important that will build your fundamental your basic knowledge that how it, exactly how these apis are working inside dna uh, first of all you can see the assurance workflow so uh, once your dna is up and ready then you discover the devices you do the designing and provisioning and in design again there are so many things like setting the site setting the 
global network configuration settings, creating the network profiles, authentication, etc. And then in provisioning, you are assigning those devices to the site. And then if we have certain templates, you are pushing those templates. So they are ready. They are DN ready devices managed via the DNA. And then the telemetry feature will kick on and your devices are ready for the assurance. Correct. Obviously, there is a separate uh, assurance engine we have inside DNA. Inside the same dashboard, you have the assurance option from where you can go and check the network devices, health, and other stuffs. So, if I can go quickly here and if I can go back to the DNA, so let me quickly go back to the DNA center where I can show you that you have the assurance tab and then you can see that you have the health. You can go and check the overall network client and application. These fields you have and these are actually in detail. You can go in detail. Um, multiple labels are there. You can go deep inside the detail about the devices, their trending, um, their failures, their tickets, each and everything will get from here. Coming back to our slides. And then uh, just I told you that we have the follow up three videos after this. So go complete those videos. If you have the lab set up uh, actually in this third video from here in the list, I have shown that how you can go and use the lab as well from where you can get the lab and the credential. And you can try your first lab at your home in your laptop or PC. So go for it, complete these, and then we'll go and check the multi-vendor multi support and events and notification before moving to section 4.3. Now coming back to DNA RESTful API, here you can see first of all the overall structure of DNA, where in bottom you have intent-based infrastructure where you have the endpoint devices on all IT-related devices, correct? Then we have the DNA center. That's the software that is going to glue the intent based infrastructure and the open platform. Now when we are talking about open platform, that means you can go and uh, integrate with so many different type of uh, open available softwares. Obviously that will uh, increase the agility uh, and that will overall that will increase the uh, performance of DNA uh, in terms of when we are using all of the capabilities. So obviously the total cost of ownership, uh, ownership will uh, get reduced. The overall end-to-end -end net network optimization plus visibility will get uh, very much improved. Now here you can see that we have integration with the IT uh, management tools. Say for example, ITSM, IPAM, Infoblocks, etc. Third party integration is there. We can go and connect with the SD WAN, ACI, uh, security, uh, stealth watch. Those are uh, used inside the security monitoring. But even a stealth watch is doing more than that. Even a stealth watch can take the input and send somewhere for further analysis or other stuffs as well. So, but Overall, we have the integration with other domain, cross domain as well. But where is the intent? Now, intent you can see an intent based API you can see on the top where you have the business and network intent, where we have the application policy, assurance, plug and play topology, uh, wireless provisioning, network discovery, uh, software management, etc. So the list is long. And here we are using the API. Uh, at this point of time, we know that when we are using a RESTful API, uh, obviously we are doing HTTPS call and the methods are say get is something like show command means you are getting the output or result. Post if you want to create a new object. Put if you want to update object. Delete means if you want to uh, delete any object. Okay, so means the Im uh, important thing here is to understand that uh, whatever uh, technology we have, either it's a ACI or SD WAN or DNA, every year you'll find that same type of structure is has been used for RESTful API. So once you understand the API and the calls, then 
that is applicable for all the cross network domain or all the other domains where this api restful api is going to be used now again uh, if we use this approach overall uh, cost of ownership will reduce the optimization for night uh, network will improve and again we can uh, add or we can have new capabilities in the network how we can do that uh, i'll show you i'll log into the dn and i'll show you that where you'll get it but if it is a new installation you can go to the software update so here you can see that we can go to software update and then uh, we can go and install the software update here in the bottom you can see that we have the updates now once you do the installation then you should go and enable the uh, DNS enter rest API once you enable DNS enter rest API then you can go to the development toolkit Inside development toolkit you can see now you have the get post put all those methods Suppose if you want to uh, check the health of the network or the health of the devices So this particular first uh, API get site health it will give you the health of site return overall health information of all the site so once you do this get method means you want to see this is something like show command uh, if you, you want to see that health of the network you, you can go there click run and then it will go behind the scene it uh, this particular api will run and you will get the output so here in case you can see that uh, you are going to use this rest api where you have the dna intent api version 1 network devices and then you will go and as per the query you will get the result now while you're getting the result if the code is 200 that means successful and likewise you have all the codes here so for example 403 that means server recognizes the authentication but client is not authorized to perform the request so likewise we have all these uh, success code or uh, the messages a success code is 200 but suppose if you are running the api and uh, how could you know that which particular state you are in so if you go and check these codes you'll come to know that up to which particular point you have any issue related to rest api all right again so here you can see the model schema for the uh, api and you can go and click uh, run and you will get the output in the json format but again you can convert the output as per the desired all right so let's stop and the next section i'll log into dna and i'll show you that where you will find this api all right so let me show you that how you can go and verify any of the api so once i log in inside the dna here you can see uh, the dashboard and it's quite robust you can go deep inside the DNA dashboard and you can see so many things here so what we want to do here that first of all let me show you that where you'll get the information about the API so here you can go to the uh, document section here you can see that you have the uh, API references you can open this particular page and you can get the information about the API let me open this and let me show you this particular page that once you open how it look like so here you can see that and developed by devnet and then you can go and see the intent based apis and there's so many revisions and you can learn a lot from this place correct so you have the sta apis how it is going to work what are the methods we have like post get put delete etc each and everything you can go and understand from here in detail so this is the documentation page for the dna api all right so let me walk you through that if you are doing this first time from where you have to go to enable it and then how to use it so for that reason you can go and check the platform once you are inside the platform here you can see that you have the bundle now in the bundle you can see bundles are easy to use feature set for consuming intent based api so if you go and click there now here you can see that suppose 
your API REST API is not active. So what you have to do, you'll get one button called enable. You can click there and it will get enabled. So for example, IT is, uh, ITSM service now is not enabled and other integrations are also, you can see that not enabled, but uh, our RESTful API is enabled. If it is not, you can go and click enable it. Now, once you do the enablement, then uh, on the top, you can see that you have the manage bundles and configuration. You can just go and verify the configuration as well. But if you want to check the REST API, so for that, you have to go inside the develop, uh, developer toolkit. Here you can see that you have the developer toolkit and API. You can go there and then you will get the uh, RESTful API related to authentication, know your network, site management, connectivity, operation task, policy, etc. So suppose if I go here and click know your network and inside know your network, you can go and check the site, topology, device, clients, user, etc. Then site management, you can go and check the site management related stuffs. Uh, in policy, you can get, go and check the policy related stuffs. Again, you can see the color coding is also there and that's true uh, for uh, all these methods uh, in most of the uh, API runner so for example ST1 we have swagger where we are running the API's so here you can see that uh, the green you know for get and then put and then post and delete is red okay so what I want suppose I want to know my network and say for example if I go to topology Inside topology, I want to know that uh, what type of VLANs I have. So here you can see this particular API will run. Let me go back. So here you can see that you have this get the VLAN. You can go and click here to this blue get VLAN detail or you have to, uh, three dots. You can go here and then try it. Both is OK. You can go to any of the place and click it. So now you can see that the public URL and you want to run this uh, API and success code is 200 that means correct and then you are getting the response. So all the VLAN in your infrastructure you are able to get from here. If I go and click here also. So here you can see that this is the uh, API and again it is telling all these codes that we have seen earlier. Then I, here you can see that root map option response and version. So here you have little bit uh, much more output and that is adding the uh, model schemas as well. Now again, if you run, it will go and reach to this place and you'll get the output. Okay, so this is the way that we can go and execute the API and we, we can go and check all different methods as well. Let us check ab about our lab. So the lab you have, you can go and use Cisco sandboxes. Here you can see the URL, username and password. Two sandboxes are there, sandbox dnac cisco.com, sandbox dnac to cisco.com. And you can see the username and password. Definite user is the username and the password. Now, this is the lab and uh, we are going to run our APIs with respect to this lab. Plus when uh, we built our post related APIs, uh, we built our delete related APIs, then I will use private uh, sandbox or private lab. And at that time, I will show you that on uh, the lab topology and other stuffs. All right, so now we are ready for our first program and that is related to authentication API. Now what is happening that suppose if you're running the APIs for certain task at that time you need some sort of authentication token means you are the valid user or you are the valid API user. Once you have that token then using that token that will be associated with other API other task related APIs and we can execute certain tasks. Correct. So I'm going to show you this post method that um, how you can go and get the tech token. I am going to show you the token as well that how with the program we are going to uh, generate and get the token. 
Now in upcoming sections, we have to learn and execute so many different tasks such as site management APIs, uh, know your network APIs like client, uh, your devices, client sites, etc. Uh, we have the command runner, template runner APIs as well, uh, discovery APIs, connecti uh, connectivity APIs, etc. So long list of APIs are there that we have seen in earlier videos and in the upcoming section, we are going to uh, learn about that. Now for lab one or for the first program that we are going to execute now, what are the things we have? What are the programs we have in this program? Now you'll find that we have actually three different type of Python program. So one file I will show you config.py or you will see that I, I am going to use say env underscore lab.py. Basically, this will be one small Python program where I have stored the DNAC URL, the username, password, port number, etc. Now, this is a variable file and suppose if I'm going to use this variable file, so suppose uh, this is the first program and second program, obviously, I have the library API or library python program i will show you that the library name is uh, dnac underscore api dot py correct and third thing that we have is the main program correct so main program now connecting program number one program number two program number three uh, we will execute a certain task Correct. So what I was telling about that uh, program number one, that is the config or environment lab, or env lab dot py, that this will be your variable. So you are not going to do any change inside your library program. You are not going to do uh, changes inside your main function means obviously you have to generate and develop your program but once you develop your program then uh, if you are running those program what is the reference which particular dna you want to run you want to run with respect to sandbox one you want to run with respect to sandbox two or you have any private or enterprise lab or network correct so that's the that's the thing here that's the scalability here that the environment lab we have to change the variables and once we change the variable then the library and the main functions will be as it is now in future if we have the library so suppose in future uh, if we have a new task right so suppose if i have new task then you can write your program i'll write pr as a program and then that program will point to the library so that means inside the library, I have to go and create new function like function one, function two, etc. And then in the program, well, the program will go and call that particular function inside the library. Correct. So you can see the reference point here that you have something called the uh, variable. And then the variable is referenced inside the program and program is referenced by the functions inside the DNAC uh, API or the library. Correct. So let me quickly show you uh, the program first and then we'll go and proceed according to that. So here we have the program and here you can see that I have my main program or this main program is doing that it's a, uh, always a small program here and inside this a small program let me take the drawing tool here let me take a pen here yeah so here you can see that i'm importing certain packages so import date time uh, time request json url library all those all these uh, functions or all these packages that i'm importing it's not required for this particular program Okay, but what we need, we need to import the URL library and from request.auth, the HTTP basic auth. And again, from URL library three exception, import insecure request warning. Otherwise, whenever you run the program, it will generate some sort of certificate errors, correct? 
And then finally, uh, so what important things we are importing here? Let me clear the drawing. So we are importing very important thing here is the DNAC APIs, line number 15. And then we are importing the DNAC URL. You can see URL, the password and the username. That's the line number 16 from one of the function one of the Python program that is environment underscore lab, env underscore lab, correct? Now, you can see the main body here. So the main body here, it's uh, get the token. So dnac auth is the name. And this dnac, dnac underscore auth is calling something from the DNA, a dnac API. So you can see that dnac underscore APIs is my library uh, Python program. It's a big program. From there, we are calling one function that is get underscore dnac JWT token. And then we are printing that token. And that's the whole idea about this particular program is that we want to print the token. So you can see the program itself is only of two lines but you can see the overall structure of the program uh, where we are importing certain packages or functions then we are defining the main function inside the main body we are writing our sub function or sub routines and then finally we are closing the main function correct and this is the overall structure of uh, uh, of the program we have now what we can do that we can go and refer the other program so let me quickly show you the uh, variable that we have that we are calling actually so that name is environment lab and now here you can see that the dnac dnac user the port username url password and suppose if in future i will use some private lab section so here you can see this is my private lab section uh, credentials that i will use in upcoming sections as well and because we have used this comment here that means they are not used means in python if you use this pawn symbol that means they are not used inside the program and then finally we are referring our main function this is the library function and you can see this is a big so many lines are there, but again, we will learn understand this in future more and more. So we have already understood the import functions that we have. And then you can see that we are calling this function. And in this function, we have the API for the token. Correct. So let me highlight those things. Let me scroll a little bit down. And let's check the API related to authentication token. So the API related to authentication token is API system v1 auth token that was there in the slide as well. Then we have the header and then we have the response where we are using the post method and that's the key. So we have different different methods like get, put, post and delete. So we are using this post method and from the response, so here you can see that from the response, we are taking only that field related to token and then it is returning the token. So this is one of the classical example that how we can build a function with argument. So what's argument we have? The argument argument we have is the dnac underscore auth. Correct. So now this is the execution time. I can go here and my code is inside this particular folder. So simply I can go and run that code and what's the program name we have the program name is get token py so i can go and use get uh, token py so let me write that and now uh, behind the scene the query is happening and we are getting the valid token now this token is belonging to which particular sandbox you can see here the sandbox is sandbox uh, sandbox tina correct and suppose if i make this two and if I go back to the program, because that is the different sandbox. So now you can see that this time it will generate a different token because this is belonging to different um, sandbox, correct? You can see how easy this is, but there are so many uh, baby steps involved here. And this is the same way that in future we are going to build our uh, programs, correct? So let's just stop here.
In 4.2c, we need to understand the BNAC multi-vendor support. So what does it mean? Now we can think like this, okay, the enterprises we have at this moment, all those enterprise networks, they don't have 100% Cisco devices, correct? So enterprises may run non-Cisco product like Juniper, Iowa, uh, HP, etc. There are so many other vendors as well, correct? Now since your DNA is single source of truth, that means from the DNA, we are managing the IT infrastructure. So what will be the use case or how we are going to manage the non-Cisco devices? And that's the answer we have with help of multi-vendor support. So with help of multi-vendor support means that DNA can download some sort of packages uh, for other vendors and with those packages, DNA can manage different like non-Cisco uh, product. Here you can see two examples, HCL. Uh, what they have done, they have done the automated provisioning of HP switches and third-party devices using Cisco intent-based uh, API, PNP plug and play and multi-vendor support. Wipro, they created app policy through Cisco DNA Center to prioritize the critical application using the intent-based policy APIs. And there are some other examples as well where we can go and we can uh, manage the non-Cisco products with the DNA. Now, what are the features we have? So suppose uh, it's not like that we we have all the features that we have in the DNA supported to Cisco devices that can be supported to uh, non-Cisco devices. But you can see the list of features that is supported after one, two, five, they are discovery. So we can discover the non-Cisco devices first. Inventory, we can see uh, inventory list. So when we go inside the inventory list, we can find that uh, inside the inventory, we have those non-Cisco devices listed. We can go and check the topology. We have the topology view, that feature that we have in DNA for Cisco devices we have there. Then assurance is also supported. So with help of SNMP polling, it can give you CPU memory temperature informations. And finally, we can run some basic command runner um, commands as well. So with, with the help of command runner API, we can go and execute certain basic commands in a non-Cisco product. So these features are supported. If you want to know more, you can go and click this link here. And then it will redirect you towards Cisco DevNet and you have this multi-vendor SDK. Once you are inside the multi-vendor SDK, you can see that you have the download nodes. So SDK for Linux, SDK, SDK for Windows, etc. Et and then uh, you will get the guide as well, means once you download those packages, then how you can go and utilize it. So have a look on this reference document. In case if you have non-Cisco devices, you can manage uh, from DNA as well. We know that DNA has capability to do the integration with ITSM or management tools. It can do the integration with the uh, webhook servers as well. So we can send the event and notifications to the webhook server. And then once we have the integration, I'll show you that we have uh, various listed notification and events that we can subscribe, we can send to webhook servers. Correct. So apart from ITSM, that's the uh, IT automation, or you can say that that's the IT management tool. And again, in ITSM, we have the CMDB integration as well. So that means that entire inventory that we can see inside DNA that can be uh, synchronized or that can be synced with the CMDB and the tickets and the priorities that we are getting inside DNA, again, those can be reflected inside the ITSM tool. Correct. That's the one aspect of DNA integration, uh, integration with IT automation or IT management tools. The other aspect is that the integration with events and the notification webhook external servers. Now this new capability, new feature we have in Cisco SD-WAN as well. There also you can integrate with webhook that I will show you in a while. Now, if you go and check the history of monitoring, so now you can see in, in the screen that 
um, generation one we have ping except uh, expect and then the syslog syslog is still we are using still we are using snmp uh, get snmp trap method for polling versus alerting but what is there in the next next generation alerting in next generation alerting we are using or we have that option to use api based monitoring and that's nothing but the webhook it's lightweight and it's faster than snmp because we know that um, what are the things we have what are the hurdles we have the with the snmp uh, it has some time stamp sampling etc means after a few interval uh, it is running this polling this nmp polling will happen and then you will get the information or maybe if timers are set in in terms of snmp so we are not able to get the real time events although in other hand with the api and the web hooks we can go and get the uh, real time alerts now how we can go and do the integration what are the steps so um, again, you can see here the API plus webhook. So API based of uh, of a webhook, how we can do. That's actually inside 4.3. So implement Cisco DNS Center event outbound webhook. So let me log into the DNS Center and let me show you all those steps. Inside DNS Center, we will go and check that. So let me log into dashboard we are inside a dashboard where you get the option this is a little bit older version but um, it, it will also do the same work so let me show you that this version is let me show you one three three x and what you can do that you can go to i can show you inside the platform as well uh, but you can go to the settings. So let me go to the system settings. Once you are inside the system settings, go to the settings. And inside the settings, you can see that you have events and subscription. Once you are inside the events and subscription, then you can see that we have the list of events related to WLC was rebooted, um, power supply. These are the events that is already there. And you can see the subscribe column, it's everything is not subscribed, not subscribed. And even you can see the name and we can go and check these events one by one. So let's check any one event here that you want to subscribe and we want to send to the external webhook server, right? So for example, uh, interface flapping on network devices, correct? So now it is telling that it is not subscribe. You can go and click select this and go click subscribe. And then it will give you some more information. So the subscription details that you want to fill, I can go and give uh, network flap as a name. Subscription type, you can see the REST API, RESTful API method will get used here. Then select an is existing endpoint or create a new endpoint. Yes, new endpoint. This is for network endpoint. Endpoint description and then the url so i need to put the webhook url let me copy my webhook url and paste here and my webhook url you can also go and check hook.io and they're providing the webhook uh, external services you know we can go and install the microservices over there all right Trust certificate, no. HTTP method, post, yes. Authentication, no, auth. Later and other fields, we can leave it, click subscribe. Now, once I subscribe this, then you can see that network, okay, so this is not that that I have subscribed. Let's go, so here you can see that we have this interface flap on network devices that is subscribed. 
And let me show you detail about this particular method, this particular event. So here you can see that uh, active subscriptions count and instances. And we can go here. That's the same thing. If you want to edit it, you can go ahead and edit it. But we don't want to edit. Let me close this and let me show you the event details. So once I go inside the event detail, you can see that a port interface is flapped on a switch. This is the event ID. The name space is assurance subdomain category. The DNA event link you can see with the instance ID. The version, domain, uh, type, severity, node, etc. Now, if you want to see the detail about this particular event and all, so here you can see that uh, detail about this model. So the type, event source, the assurance issue, priority, etc. And then the rest schema. Here you can see the rest schema as well. And we have subscribed that. You can see how easy this is to configure and this is to subscribe and we have given our uh, webhook destination as well like that you can go and check all these methods that we have all these actually events here and um, you can get the detail as well now for these particular events that you have here if you want to do any modifications in this then in that case you have to go inside the platform once you are inside the platform, then you can go and check the manage and configurations. And then you can see that you have the event setting. Now event setting related to network flap. So here you can see that now I, we have so many network. So let's, let's just scroll this and you should have um, interface flapping on network device or anything just just to showcase this so you can go here interface flapping on network devices and you can see the type category severity the workflow is incident you can go and click edit and then we have the option to edit that so let me scroll up just to see that we see inside that event. So one selected and you can see uh, so many things that there's. Let me, uh, let me go back. Uh, I want to cancel this and let me go back here and let me show you this one more, more time. But meanwhile, you can see here that these events settings are only applicable for the ITSM integration use case for webhook uh, server and destination click here. So webhook I have already shown you. This is something that when you change the severity, now if you have the ITSM integration, so any of these events, when it will go and synchronize with ITSM, so those priority you will see here in in the itsm tool you can see there okay so for example uh, fabric device connectivity border overlay if this event will get triggered from dna to itsm it will show you the severity as a two that's the high priority correct now, if you want to change those priority and also we always have options so here you can see that we are in this particular line and we can go and check here the priority let me scroll down so for example, make this four, it's not advisable. And then you can see the info. So the device connectivity border overlay, I made this as a info and severity is four. This is the incident, problem, event, RFC, etc. And then we can click save here. But this is the synchronization with respect to ITSM, correct? And if we have the uh, webhook plus the APIs integrations and all then here you can see that we have already done that uh, Subscription so we have two subscription one in the top and one we have just now we have done that subscription and Let me show you here so you can go here click is already subscribed if you have any other guy subscription 
or if you want you can take a bunch of events as well and then you can go and give the name i'm just giving any random name but you can go and give the name if you have any endpoint that you have created earlier you can go and select now you can see that webhook url and other stuffs are coming now the authentication uh, the method because initially we have to the post method so post is coming if you want to update an object you can use put click subscribe and that's it okay so this is the way that you can uh, you can edit the events for itsm and second thing that you can uh, you can subscribe uh, these events and then that will be triggered so whenever these events will get triggered the alert the event notification will go and you can check those inside the uh, webhook server correct all right so let's just stop here and now we reach to section 4.4 where we have to learn these apis little bit in detail and how we can do implement how we can in, integrate these apis with python and other examples so 4.4 implement api request for cisco dna center to accomplish network management task related to intent api command runner site api so let's break this section into multiple sections or subsections so first of all let's check 4.1 a b and c because here we need to understand these api in terms of management task and in section 4.5 we whatever we are going to understand here in 4.4 we have to go and do the implementation correct so what are things we have we we need to understand the intent apis the command runner api and site api now where we can find this inside the dna so you can go to the dna center this is the latest one this is 2.1 series 2.125 and here you have new menu tab where you can go to the menu you can go to platform and then you can go to the developer toolkit where you have the api and you can see that the categories so what categories we are looking for we are looking for intent based api command runner api and site api these these are just few examples but they are a lot correct so here you can see that intent and if i scroll down here you can see that you have the intent get the site count get the site correct get the site health and likewise you can go and check you know know your network then you will get sites topology etc then site management then connectivity operational task policy etc although we these things we have discussed earlier now if you want to check the number of sites in this particular dna so dna is managing response is three so it is managing only three well, let's check the uh, site name so we can go and check so what are the information it will give you site id type offset limit etc but we are looking for site name and here you can see that you have one global that's the site name hierarchy and then you can go and check inside that you have the location luxembourg then you have uh, the name is space then you have the lux but these things i will show you later on that we can go to our program and from our program with our python program we'll get these list of information we are getting this information in json format but we can convert that format it's up to us you want output in a text or the csv or json it's up to us likewise if you are looking for vlan details you can go and check that vlan details so running these apis is not a big thing from here the problem here is this that with help of dna based this api tool if you need uh, information if suppose uh, if if you need information in a way that one api will get connect to other api and other api will get connect to other api means if you have nesting of api so one api output may be the input for other api and that input may be the input of other api and then finally you are running the api to get the final output Right. So that means the nesting of API because we know that's the power of API. That one API can be 
input for other API. Correct. So if you want to do the nesting or if you want to run the API with certain condition with for loop or some condition like if else condition or any other condition, then those things are not possible when you're running this API in a flat manner. Means if you go and run this API one to one, obviously you get some output, but you will not get the output as as in this desired format. Correct. So then in that case, you have to go and use the programs and all. Finally, you can go and check the command runner. Uh, command runner will give you CLI type of command outputs. So you can go here and you can see these commands are there. And what you can do that selectively. So uh, we, we have examples related to command runner as well in future. Uh, in the upcoming videos and you will understand more about that but what this command runner is doing exactly that you can go here to the provisioning and inventory for example once you are inside the inventory then you can go you go to any of the device selectively and then you can see that you have run command now this run command basically whatever output that we are getting here this is with respect to command runner. You can see command runner. So this is one of the program passed with the device uh, with help of command runner. And then we are getting the output like this. Any command like show run or show IP interface. We etc. But remember you will get uh, only the commands related to show means read command. If you want to do any post, if you have to do any configuration in the standardized format. So for that you can go to the tools and template and from that their tools and template you can go and create the template and then you can push the template to the devices correct so those things are there uh, at this point of time i assume that you fully understand that from where you can go and uh, open your api toolkit or api reference now this is the place where you will get a list of all the apis and if you want to do bit basic testing at least the get related APIs you can execute from here but if you if you are looking for a certain big task if you're looking for some deployment uh, you know implementation and all those things then you have to build your program you have to call those APIs modify those APIs and you will then you will get the final output great so those things uh, we will check inside the implementation section in this section only but the next half in next video so you can go and watch the next video where we are going to learn about the implementation of these api with respect to api dna api and the python integration in section 4.4b we have to understand about the command runner api and how we can go and execute or implement this particular api integrate with python and get the results so let me quickly show you here the command runner program that i have can see that uh, first of all we have the import statements that we can go and import various things that we have related to the environment variables then if we have any specific functions like json or time or sys uh, url library etc then we have some user defined function how we want to print we want to get the token now these things that we are seeing here we can put these information inside the dnac api library as well but if you wish you can make a local to this program as well so we have the get dnac token function then we have get all device function and here you can see the api so one of the api that is used here is dna intent api network devices then you can see that the device name where we are matching so we are calling the a get all device info function inside other function and then we are getting the device id as a return so this will give you the device id information and then main functions related to command runners will start so first of all here you can see that we have the get the legit cli command runner function this function what it will do that it will get all the cli legit cli commands supported by the command runner so if you go to dna and inside the api 
if you go and check the list of commands whatever list of commands we have uh, you will get uh, with this output you can see that it is returning the cli list although i can show you this as well so let me quickly copy this uh, function here and i can scroll down to the main function and here i can go and call this function and then we can go and put this uh, token because we need that token so now uh, what will happen if we run this program if, even before running the program it will come so let me do this thing let me cut this and let me put here so that means once uh, we'll get the print statement related to application is running then first of all we'll get the list of uh, um, all those commands legis command correct so that's one of the api that is used here and you can see the API network device polar CLI legit reads then uh, we need uh, these functions so whenever we are running any type of configuration we need it to put inside the file so now for that we need get content file ID and this will give you the uh, content file ID that means that uh, once we go and run this with the file ID it will give you the content of that particular file actually and the API you can see here is the API version 1 uh, file and then we have to put the file ID now this file ID will go and get from the output command runner so here you can see that we have file ID that will get called here and this is the main function with respect to command and device name it will so once we run this program we'll see that in the main function uh, we have to call get output command runner it will run and then you can see that for device id we are calling other function here we have the main api related to command runner the device polar cli and read the request once we execute this particular command with respect to post method then it will go and generate the task id we need the task id plus we need the file id as well and then the command will get executed with respect to that device with respect to that command and then we will get the output correct so here you can see the task id uh, and then the output I check the task id and output we have some uh, verification as well for the task completion as well now one key thing here is that while you are running this program it depends that what's the round trip time we have with the dna and the device so suppose if there is a latency that uh, uh, say for example uh, i am connected by the vpn and then with that vpn i am requesting dna to run some commands to dna hosted or dna managed infrastructure so here you can see the round trip timer in terms of that uh, my request will reach to dna and the dna will run that script and that the script will query to that particular network device and then the request will come to dna and then response i will see over the screen okay so if you have certain uh, time limit if your network is not that fast enough then you can go and put little bit more sleep timer there you can vary from two second up to maybe 25 or 30 seconds depending upon the um, latency you have in your network correct otherwise most of the time you will see failure message correct all right so that's the program explanation now in the main function you can see that once we run this first of all it will give you the list of supported commands that we have added now then the command list whatever command that we are going to execute here and then with respect to the device it will go and run that command and we are going to get the output correct so let's save this and let's go to the cli mode and let's run this program here i'm in the cli let me check the command runner is the program name so what i can do here let me go and run this program so we can do python exe and command runner here we need to give the the host name and the command so let's see that it is asking two argument and i should give some help function as well here so 
let's see that how it is. So first of all, I have to give the command and then the host name. So let's do this uh, like this. So I can go here and I can give the command, say for example, show IP int brief. And then one of the supported network devices, we have this network device. Now let's run this program. Now when you run this program, let's see, so we have given the program and two argument, argument one and argument two. Argument one with respect to the show IP int brief and two is with respect to network device. Now because we have given some sleep time delay there, so it will take at least 10 seconds of time because five second, five second timer is there and then it will go and run that command so it is telling that it is not reachable do i have my vpn connected so i don't have my vpn connected i need to connect my vpn let me connect my vpn and come back so here you can see that my vpn is connected now and let me press upper press enter and we can wait till 10 seconds to get the result command runner is started the command starting with show is supported okay and then it should show us our program return as well related to supported command list and uh, the output we got it but um, show command show ip interview so the result is okay only thing i'm not getting here is so let's scroll down and uh, you can see that uh, we are not getting the output that I'm looking for related to this. So what I can do that support equal to this and then I can go ahead and print the support. Save this. Let's go back and run this command one more time. And here you can see that we are getting the command supported command list here, correct? Show is there, SH is there, standby, syschat, trap, test, trace route, verify where everything is there, correct? And then we'll go and get the show IP end brief. So this is the way that we can go and run execute our command runner. Suppose if you have uh, n number of commands and if you have n number of devices so in that case you can go and loop there uh, so you can create different type of loop condition where you can loop number of devices and you can loop number of commands and one by one those commands will get executed and we will get the result in 4.4c we have to learn about site related apis now i'm going to show you three different program related to site based api in dna with one of the program we'll get the list of sites with one of the program we will create the sites inside dna and then how to delete those sites correct so let's understand that how we can get the sites and what is the api for that now here you can see the program and in this program you can see that if you want to uh, get the number of sites, how many sites you have. You can use this API group count and the query is group type equal to site. So basically we are doing the query to the site and how many sites we have uh, in, in that particular DNA, in that particular DNAC URL, we'll get that. Next, we want to print what are those site. So with this group and the query is group type site and then obviously we have offset and limit with those information we are going to get the details first of all the number of sites and then nextly that uh, those sites detail correct so let's run this program so I can go and run this site.py and at this moment I should go and change the environment variable so the environment variable I have here I want to run with the the other environment variable that you're seeing in the bottom 
so let me go and enable that let's run this site.py so now this is the url you can see and then the number of sites we have 15 here now with the next run it will give us that those 15 sites what are the detail correct so we can wait and you can see the details name type address and id these are the site we have with the detail with these information correct now let me go and delete a few of the sites and then again we'll go and create now if you want to delete the site you do not delete the global one or maybe we can take one list here in the bottom you can see so for example if i want to delete these sites let me copy these first we need the site id for the deletion program so i have the program where if i go and put the site id as per the site id it will go one by one check the site id and then it should delete those so let's do one thing let's create one file with the site ids that we have and here you can see the site id should be like this so these are the site id i want to delete from that list that we have and then i have this delete sites program uh, it's very easy you can see that uh, we are going to use the site id one by one one by one and we are going to put those site ids into this particular file so that means let me go here and save this with this name oops uh, with this name dot txt seems it is already there so i do one thing i will make this one so one dot txt save this and in the main program i'll go here and edit this as one so here you can see that the api that we have is uh, delete so let me show you this delete site and uh, if you want to see this it's uh, there in our library so if i go here and check this delete i should have this in inside my library otherwise the delete will not happen seems this particular delete site is not there in my main library and let me check one more time delete seems it's not there i need to create one function related to delete the site so let me let me add that function somewhere in the bottom so it can go and delete that let me check one more time here my delete sites delete site and site id so see the input is site id and the dnac also let me write that code inside the dnac and then we'll run this program so let me go and add that code here in the library that we have in the bottom i can go and add the delete site code here you can see that delete site code we have where it will get the site id and then it will go and delete that so it's done let's check here and before going there i should go and do delete the sites in that obviously we have given that the site list and I, again i will go through that program as well site id for the audit purpose delete id uh, delete status is not defined no problem let's check uh, this code one more time so what error it is throwing that delete status is not defined all right so let's check this here if we go and if we go to the library we have the library and i can go and uncheck this and here i should give message because it is giving the message let's run this one more time 
and let's see if it will throw in any error site id for audit purpose this is the site id so these are the site id it is printing okay five six seven how many we have put okay okay great so if we go here and if we check how many we have seven and i can see here also seven got printed now if you go and check this site let's see how many sites we have now so initially it was 15 now still it is showing 11 but still i can see that few of them have been deleted so if i scroll up and let's see how many it was initially it was 15 maybe still uh, that is in progress because um, dna is generating the task id and that task id is taking a little bit of time to refresh in the database so uh, you can see that uh, here one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven still i'm seeing eleven and what was the actual number here so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen so let's wait for a couple of minutes and we can check so it means that few of the sites deletion is successful and few of the sites not got deleted and that's the automation script we have so you can see that um, we, we are not getting exact what we are looking for and if you go back to the code and uh, let's see our code so if i go back to the delete pack and we are getting the message uh, we are returning the status and if we go back to our main program delete sites and here you can see that deleting the sites it should it should return some message as well correct so what i can do here is if i will uh, message or something anything related to this and then print message let's go back and let's run this program so already few of them few of the site id have been deleted let's check if if i got the message as well correct so site id request has been ex accepted for execution so that was the message i was looking for so request has been accepted and maybe it is taking some time to get fulfilled meanwhile if we go back to our dna let's go there and from the dna center if we go and check how many sites we have in the dashboard let's verify from the dna as well let's go there so what i will i will do next here that i will go and add few more sites as well and then we'll delete that one more time correct so dna is still loading meanwhile let's go back to the program it's coming now let me open the dashboard as well so we can verify from the dashboard as well it's coming up it's popping so here i'm inside dna and i i can see that number of sites showing nine only correct and if you go and run the program one more time the sites let's see the count 
so it's coming up it's taking a little bit of time you can see so yeah you can see clearly here that DNA is taking some time uh, before generating the result so we can see that how we can view these sites how we can delete the site in the same way fashion we can go and create that site as well now while creating the site so you can see the create site uh, function that you can go and create uh, here you can see that uh, you have to use the post related function or the method the api is api v1 site and then the, we have to give the payload now important thing here is this that in this payload uh, we should give what is the format we want to create our site so for that i have one json file uh, let me show you this this is one of the example so here you can see that the area and then the name parent name is the global and again you have uh, area inside area area one area two area three that's the hierarchy and this area one is inside a global eu like that then area and building you can see you can see uh, we have the area and then we have the building and like that we want to create the site apart from that i i should have one more example or maybe the same example we can try so let's try uh, site example one json and let's run this and let's see that when we go and create the site so how this is the payload simple program only only thing here that uh, create the area create the building we have the apis for that and get the url and create the url those are the common thing but then in the main function that you are going to assign the file in the json for format and then it will go and check the fields that we have inside the json so area name and parent all those information it will take one by one and then it will load inside the dna once it is completed it will tell you the building creation is completed the site creation is completed correct so let's run this we want to create the site and then uh, we should have the uh, json file so i want to give site example json is okay so let's go with that now you can see it is reading because we have given the pprint function here to read these information so if i scroll up you can see that we have the pprint function here so it will read the information from the json payload one by one so it is reading those things one by one and if it is already there it will tell you it's already there area one is already there and if it is not there if it is a new site if it is a new area and building then in that case it will tell that i i am creating it correct so you can see the site ids as well here in the list and with this site id in future if you want to delete you can group the site id that we have done and according to that you can go and uh, delete it so it's already exist here you can see this creation complete is successful uh, you can see that site creation is successful like that we are getting the messages so it is going as per the hierarchy it is creating all those site one by one once it will create this then we'll get the final message the final message is that the site and the let me scroll down so final message is the site creation completed building creation completed correct great so one by one it is creating and we can wait for a few seconds here you can see that it's successful now if you go here and check the site detail meanwhile let me quickly go back to the dna if i go and refresh this page clearly we'll see that number of sites will be more so it's refreshing and once you can see now it is 15 correct so we can see that the number has been increased so these are the important function you want to see whatever available sites information you have 
you want to create if you don't have those sites with help of your payload and then if you want to delete it you can go and delete with respect or with help of api all right great let's stop here now we are ready to do the implementation in section 4.5 uh, we have to look and do the implementation related to network discovery device apis etc so what i'm going to do here that i will break these sections into multiple subsections where one by one we'll go and check different type of programs related to api and we can learn more in 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 this particular fashion so first of all network discovery apis how they look like and then how we can convert equivalent to python and then execute the task so let me go here to the DNA. Here you can see that we have the DNA center where I have three devices that has been discovered and assigned to sites. Now, if you can go to the menu and tools, let me quickly show you first of all the uh, discovered devices and the name of the discovery. So here you can see the view all discoveries and in that discovery, now we can see that we have one discovery router switch where three devices has been discovered successfully correct now how we can do the discovery we know that you can go to the discovery add a new discovery and you can do that discovery correct now point here that this is from the dnac and uh, what are the related apis we have inside the dna so for that you can go to the menu you can go to platform you can go to the development toolkit once you are inside the api section then you can look for operational task and here you can see inside the operational task so it is coming up you can see that we have the discovery so all the discovery apis are grouped here inside that you can see that we have group of good amount of discovery related task where you can go and check the get count for all discovery jobs get the network device from discovery these apis so for example if we go to first api uh, check the count of the discovered discoveries how many discoveries you have done so you can go here and then you can click try it let me show you that how this particular api look like here you can go and it will tell that you have one response means total discovery that we have is one correct and you can go and check the code preview and etc now once you check that how many discoveries that you have done now if you want to know little debate uh, detail about that particular discovery here you can see that you have the get discovery by range option so i can go here get discovery by range click there try it it is asking what's the start index in my case the start and end index one one only so i can go and run this and now you can see that we are getting the result so this is the correct result i can copy this to the notepad and i can show you this let me copy this to the notepad and let me open this so we can check that exactly what are the things there clearly you can see that it is telling that which ip range you have discovered the protocol order and rest of the information if you have n number of discoveries obviously we'll go and get from there but now if you have n number of discovery and those discovery if you want in csv format or any other printed format it's diff it's difficult uh, from this uh, api output correct from here so for that what i have done that i have converted the program so let me quickly show you the program here you can see that get discovery program and this program on top you can see we have the import functions then uh, some of the print function in the main function after the authentication we are calling the get discovery one from the library and then i'm opening one csv file where i am putting the information related to discovery name and pool name and then i am printing it now if you want to see that get discovery api which api we are calling so the same range api that we have seen uh, i am calling here in the api 
So this response will come here in the main function and then that particular response with help of Python function and CSV file function, we are putting inside this particular CSV file. Correct. So let me quickly go and run this program. Say Python exe and get discovery.py. Now it is running. Since I have given pprint for the discovery, so you will see that JSON output here as well that we have seen inside the DNA output, DNA API output, and then you have this IP range CSV file that you can go to this folder from where you are running the program and you can go and check that information. So here you can see that the discovery name and then you have the list of IP lenses, whatever. Now again, if you have good amount of discoveries, all this discovery will get printed here line by line. Okay, great. So this is the way that we can go and run uh, the discovery so from GUI we can discover the devices and then for the operational things task if you want to get the information either in CSV format or maybe in the table format then with help of Python you can go and get like this next two program we have related to how to take the device backup and then how to get the device list as well so let's start with the backup function program first and then we'll check the device list. Here we have the backup program. So first of all, what this program will do, that this program will go and create the log file as well. Then once the program will start, here you can see this is a little bit new type of program that we are using because we are not using our inbuilt uh, DNA library. But you can go and you can do pip install DNA center SDK. So once you go and do this, say pip install, and then you can install this DNA center SDK. So it will get installed in your system. Already it is there, so that's why it's telling that it's already there. But it will get installed in the system, and then we can import different type of APIs. Again, if you go copy this. A name and if you check in Google you'll find the complete document related to DNA Center SDK and there are programs functions or function modules those things um, nicely defined and nicely explained so you can go and have a look the other thing here that from the environment variable uh, when we are taking the backup the folder name we are defining so if I go here and you can see that the folder name if I can go here and give say sandbox backup this is the name of my folder i want to save the configuration inside this folder name so that's the use of this now once the program will start first of all it will uh, take obviously i want to take all the apis from dna center and this dnac.api is becoming my library so device count for that again there are inbuilt function so if you go and check that document, you'll find that get device count is one function that will give you the list of devices. Likewise, we have a device get device list. This is the get device list. So from DNA underscore API inside devices folder, you have subfolder or sub programs like get device list. You will get the device list. Correct. Now, once we have that device list, obviously what we want we want to put all those configuration inside user defined folder correct so here you can see that one by one we are taking the device uh, devices from the device list so devices from the device list and then for those devices so device a b c d etc what we are doing here is that first of all we are getting the device id because uh, inside dna center whatever configuration uh, we are getting those configuration we are getting in that API with respect to device ID correct so device ID we are putting here inside this particular function that is giving us the device configuration so get device configuration by ID is just the name with the ID we are getting the information and the response function will be your show run command correct then it will go and put those saved configuration inside that folder 
correct so let's go here and run this device backup i can go and run python exe and then the device backup now you can see that application run will start it will generate the log file and here you can see that four devices are there in the sandbox you can see asr cat 912 and it is putting those configuration backups inside the sandbox folder that is getting created so if i go here and if i go and check see you have the sandbox and yep you have these configuration here you can go and open and read check those configurations so these are the backups that will get generated and uh, stored here in this folder it's lightning fast it's good and this is the way that we can go and take the device backup correct now let's check the next function related to getting the device a report either in excel sheet or uh, or the tablet format in this example although you will find the report or the result in the csv file so let me show you this from the top so first of all we are getting the device info this is the api although these things we can put inside dna apis that's our library and we can call from there otherwise uh, if you want to read from here both options are there so we can call these functions in the main function from here as well so get the device info and first of all get the token once we have token uh, we can get the device info once we have the device info response from that particular response we can go and filter whatever things we need it so here you can see that all the device get all device info then the device count if device count is zero it will tell you that none is there if it is not zero then the condition will start i want to open a file called device report csv where i want to put certain information from that particular response inside the csv correct so this is the response is it is a big response if i go and print this uh, api result you'll find that this is a big uh, information from there we are uh, filtering device host name type software management ip serial number but there are so many things correct so this is the way that we can go and generate the report and we can save, in, uh, save inside this particular csv file so let's run this and verify this device report say device report run this and you can see four devices and it has been saved what's the name of this device report dot csv so i can show you this device report dot csv and here you can see this information the same it has generated here as well so if i go back to the main folder and you can see that device report timestamp also you can see if i go and open that you can see that yeah you have the information correct so this is uh, the way that we can go and uh, run this program and we can get the uh, device related apis and the management related task we can complete now we reach to 4.5 where we have to learn about template api and we need to learn about that how with the help of a script we can apply a template so let me show you the format and a script that we have here so we have one script program here with this program what we are going to do that first of all that this program will go and create one project the project name is cli templates or we can give any name now under this project it will go and create one template so template name i am giving basics.txt now this basics.txt you can see I have some configuration here related to NetFlow, related to Loopback 11, correct? So clearly you can see that what is the purpose here? The purpose here is this, that, that the script with help of API will create project, it will create a template, and then the script will ask us that what is, what is your device, which is your device, that you want to push this template and once you give the device uh, 
this particular program will run and it will go and push that uh, template to that particular device now we have option either we can give that device a host name correct uh, in a program as a user input so one device host name as a user input or we can create some sort of loop so for example while loop where the device host name will put somewhere in a file and the program will read those files one by one and uh, suppose if i have a file of 100 host name so for those 100 host name this is script will get pushed one by one one by one one by one because so it's very easy uh, that's the power of program either you are doing uh, this is scripting for one device or n devices so if it is an end device, just put those uh, names inside the while loop or for loop, and then one by one it will get executed. Correct? That's the overall idea. So what we are going to do that this program will create a template. First of all, it will create a project. Inside that, it should create a template, and this is the content of the template. And then it will go and ask you that uh, which is the device, what's the device name you want to push this template. Once you give that, then it will go and push that configuration. Here you can see that we have the data input from this data input It will get the project name. It will get the template name and For the device host name we have given as an input function. So it will ask that what's the device name you want to push this configuration Then you can see that it is creating the project so you can see the project ID so it will go and create the project and then it will go and uh, create the templates a blank template and then it will feed this this particular template Information in that blank template. So name of the template is basics and Then once we have the project once we have the template then the next thing is to uh, Push that template to the devices. So for that you can see that once you have the uh, project name once you have the commands uh, CLI config name is just the template file name, etc. But here you can see that we have the deployment, and inside the deployment, you can see that you have the uh, config name, you have the project name, you have the device name. So basically, you have the template name, project name, and the device name. And the, obviously, the authentication should be there, and it it should go and pushed. Now here I'll go and increase the time slip. So if I have any latency connecting to my dna to vpn to devices it will wait till that point and then you can see that we have the deployment status as well so it is failed success unknown etc it will go and give you those messages once it is completed we'll get the success message correct so before running this program i just wanted to go here and i want to run this program with my private dna configuration so let me go and uncheck these variables save this that's the uh, another important aspect we have now what i want here first of all i just wanted to know that uh, which devices we have inside this particular dna so i will go and run this program and seems that permission okay seems this file is already open this is with related to sandbox but this time we are running the program with new variables obviously the new information will get fitted inside that we can go and check the devices so now we have 3850930044451 etc initially we have sandbox devices now we have our own private lab uh, type of devices with the vpn connection Great. So what we want we want to push this configuration. So let's go here and The DNA config template py is the program name so I can go here and before Running this program. I just wanted to show you that inside the VPN uh, I don't have any old template. So let's first of all go and verify that do we have any existing project like CLI template and existing template like basic.txt because if it is already there then our purpose will not get fulfilled so let's go inside DNA and verify that we are inside DNA let's go to the tools and the template 
tools and the template editor and let's see that what templates we have so at the moment you can see that we don't have the project called CLA template and inside that we don't have any template so let's go back to the program and run that script so I can go here and click enter now if everything is okay the script is okay so it will work here you can see the script is running now it is asking about the uh, device name so I can go to 3850 but you can choose any and then we can wait so now it has some problem dnac apis has no attribute call create the project so i need to map this with the with the correct library functions i have one other file as well so let me correct that let me go and remap with the other dnac apis library function file that i have so what basically I'm doing here is that I have other library function where I have more functions dnac underscore api is one and then I should go back here and when we are calling those functions I can make this one save this and then I should do all those uh, import dnac api is one in other other files as well correct but if even if I do not do this this is okay okay so now let's go back and check device name and DNAC API is not identify in oops okay so let's check line number 56 line number 56 we have some so I think that I need to go and uh, yes, I should go here and replace this with all this, replace all and save this, not only in the import statement, but everywhere, correct? And now let's run this, oops. So the import statement, it got two ones, great. You can see that the problem we have while running this, but let's check this. So enter the device to which deploying the template. I have given that name and okay. So it's still the project ID result task data. Still it is uh, creating some small issues here. Uh, let's fix this issue. While fixing this issue, what I will do this time, I'll go step by step and check. So let's see this time. Okay, the project with the name CLI template found and DNAC APIs do not have any attribute called check IP before uh, duplicate. All right, so you don't have that attribute that I can go and check in my other files, you know, and let's go here and copy. And then I can go to my DNAC API that is inside basic two. And then I can go and add so this is basically checking this function is checking that if you are deploying the template and already if you have certain IPs that you have in the template existing in DNA so it will not go further and push so it will basically it is checking the duplicate IP before address the stuff now run this one more time the project with the CLA templates found great and then utils so it is telling that utils identify this function is not found great i need to go and copy the utils function as well in the same folder where i should have this ip for matching parameters correct so let's do that now, now what i'm doing here is that i'm creating the new utils inside basic 2 and inside that I should have the 
matching function that it is querying. So let's go ahead and check here. Yeah, I have that. Now let's run this program one more time. Let's see that what function it will ask one more time. So now you can see that CLI template found. Okay. Then uh, we are getting some uh, more problem inside DNAC APIs. Okay, so what I have done that uh, I just fixed the utils and the DNAC one APIs. And let's go back and run this program one more time. I like to press up arrow and print and that's the problem that inside these files I should have the ENB underscore lab. And in the utils also, if I have any function that is called, so it's okay. Things are good and let's check this. Device, what is your device? So this is my device. Then you can see now it has the ID, project ID, and that's, we are doing good. And anyways, let's check the program. I'll come back to this DNA page. Now it is working as per the program, step by step. It should go and create the project, should create the template, and then it should go and push that configuration to this particular switch. Correct. Now let's go here and refresh the page. I can go back. We can go back to the tools and the templates. So let's go back to the tools and template editor. And now you can see that we have uh, the CLA template, that's the project name. And then inside that we have the basics. You can see the configuration inside the basics. And then let's check the program. Still it is going on. Still it is in progress. And it should go and push this configuration, correct? Meanwhile, what's the loopback we have? The loopback is loopback 11. Okay, checking the duplicate IP address, if it has any. Then it is generating the ID. And we can wait. So you can see we have the success message. That means that we can go and run our other program. Let's check with the program only. So I can go to Python exe and we have the command runner. In command runner, uh, we can go and give the command show run interface loopback 11. And then we can go here and give the, oops, the device name. So the device name we have here is this. Let's copy this and enter and enter. Great. Check with the device and then the configuration. Last time we have executed this. It is telling that it has some range issue. Let me quickly check uh, the, the command that we have run earlier. Seems you are doing correct. So first of all, give the command and then give the space here. Let's see. It should work. Now it is working. So the space was missing. Now let's see that it is generating the loop back and the IP. So that means that uh, the template push is successful, correct? We can wait because we have given some sort of sleep timer there. 
but once the sleep time will get over we can get the result so here you can see that yes indeed the template has been pushed there and uh, if you want to see the net flow as well you can see here let me show you that from here also you can go and verify that so you can go to the provisioning you can go to the inventory once you are inside the inventory uh, we can go and check our device so here we have I can go to this particular device selectively. You have the command runner. You can go and check the command runner. And from the command runner as well, you can go and check. So show IP int brief. And then you can go and check the other command as well related to NetFlow. Show run. Let me show the show run here. And if I scroll up, just to show you some of the configurations and details, we can see here that somewhere we'll find that our NetFlow configuration is also there. Here it is. Okay. So like that, uh, you can create the project, then you can create the template inside that, and then with the given device, you can go and push it. Then you can use other command runner API to just verify from your CLI. So most of the things, so idea here is good that most of the things you can go and check from here. So you can check your site, you can check your command runner APIs with respect to those devices. You can push the template, you can get a lot of information about the templates as well, correct? All right, so let's just stop here and in next section, we can go for troubleshooting related APIs. Now we reach to the last section of this particular session and that's related to troubleshoot with help of DNA API. Now for this, I'm going to show you two different type of uh, program or the script, one related to DNA assurance, where we can go and get the health related to site, client, network correct and then other the path trace option that we have inside dna this is one of the nice feature that we have inside the dna that with help of path trace it will give you various stats related to interface status device status acl trace and qs status so it's not like path trace or trace route it's a robust path trace option we have in DNA and that it will go hop by hop and give you detail about the ingress and the egress interfaces plus the device information, ACL and QS stats. So let's start with the assurance, assurance API and feature. This particular script, what it will give you is that overall health of a, a client, overall health with respect to IP Mac, plus the average as well. So average with respect to DNA as well. So you can see that we have the argument parser and with parser with respect to Mac addresses or the device name, we'll get the information about that particular device. Then uh, even we have the option to get the output in the JSON format, we have the option to get the verbose output as well. The API used here, so let me quickly show you the API. And API used here is the client detail, is the device detail, but mostly in this particular program, we are looking for three different health. We are looking for client health, network health, and site health, correct? So let me quickly show you this result. Now this particular program, I'm going to test with the sandbox. So let me run this program. If I go here and run the assurance, now you can see that the assurance we are running with respect to Sandbox DNAC, it is telling that all sites, the site type issue, uh, the router health, the access health, the client health, this is the summary, correct? But if you want uh, detail, detailed information. So we have options to get the detailed information as well. Still the program is running now. It is telling you about the client health. So here you can see the site health, client health, and then you have the network health, correct? So overall, 
what is the status with respect to client network and site we are getting now if you go here and check the options so options you have that you can get the mac details with respect to mac details with respect to device name as well and uh, let me go and check the device we have some device uh, name here that no, we have collected from the last run so here you can see these are the device so now if i go to assurance and if i can go here and check the device name and then if we go here and give this particular device name let's see if it can resolve the host name otherwise i can go and give dot abc dot inc let's see so now we want the de detail about this particular device and seems that it is not giving me the result with the domain name. Uh, so now you can see that it is giving you the result. So it is telling that this is this particular switch. The OS version is this. The health CPU score, memory score is like this. Now if you want to get the raw input, so it will give you the JSON output and in json output you can see that you have a much better detail so you have the cpu score memory overall health the stack and all those informations that is required to do first line of troubleshooting now once you are doing first line of troubleshooting or suppose uh, let me give you one scenario so suppose we are doing troubleshooting where client is complaining that they have some issue to reaching to some web application or web server. Now, a client may be at any branch and web application may be in data center or anywhere in the cloud as well. Correct. So from that particular branch with that particular application to reach out to that particular destination, how many hops are there and in between those hops what's the status related to network device acl or qs if you want to check those information for that we have nice api and those apis are used uh, inside the dna and then api is uh, flow analysis so we have this nice key feature um, inside the dna that we know that dna can uh, recognize the application and it can take action based on application as well plus we have this flow analysis very much like we we, we are using such features in as firewall or any other application uh, security appliances correct application security appliances etc so that feature is here what this feature will do that it will analyze the flow so here you can see that uh, in in flow analysis we are giving the path id but and it will it will give you the ingress and egress interfaces and everything in detail so you can go and give the source ip plus the port source port in range uh, from 1 to 65000 likewise you can go and give the same thing with the destination ip and the port number a port number is not there you can just leave it as a null and then you can run this application and it will give you nice output so now if I can go here and run the path trace and enter so you will see that it is asking input the source IPv4 address I have taken the source and destination just for our example purpose so I can go here and use the source then it is asking about the port number if you don't have leave it then the destination so let me go and give the destination ipv4 and address port number we can leave as a blank and leave it blank now you can see that the trace has been started what's the source what's the destination it's completed very fast wow so now if i go up here you can see the detail hop by hop detail correct so information you can see here it is going to get these information then the ip address the source ip is this this is the wired client and this belongs to this particular switch and this particular switch what's the ingress interface input packet output packet flow we are getting all those informations correct and then the interface collection is successful 
all those information then it will give you the egress interface output so now you can see the egress interface detail so it's started with one device checking the uh, ingress and then the egress then it will go to other hop device so it will go to the next hop then and in the next hop there is cat3k where is the ip of that cat3k and for that particular switch also it will give you the ingress and egress uh, packet information and other informations as well so you can see output drop input drop etc correct those detailed information and finally is to reach to the destination and in destination what the ingress interface and then the destination host is connected to which particular egress interface so it will give you the information about that particular egress interface where the destination host is connected once we have all the information then finally it will give you so here you can see that summary is completed and then finally you can see the hop by hop interface by interface detail so starting from this interface going to this interface then reaching to cat 9k then from cat 9k this interface means that's the egress of cat 9k then the egress then the ingress of cat 3k then egress of cat 3k then ingress of cat 9k and then the egress of uh, cat 9k and the destination so you can see the complete flow and detail of the flow is very much needed to do the troubleshooting and once you figure out that what problem and etc then it will tell you that where exactly the problem is hitting so these are the scripts supported to do the troubleshooting apart from that dna has nice go GUI uh, troubleshooting option you can log into the GUI go to the assurance section and you have the visual representation of everything like the client details their diagram the flow analysis everything is there in the GUI as well that we can go and do the troubleshooting from there to cover 3.7 and 3.8 i have recorded two videos one video related to app dynamics cloud monitoring and other added video related to cisco integration so please go complete these two videos and then we are completing our section number three. This section we are going to discuss about app dynamics and Cisco workload optimization manager. Let me highlight this here. Workload optimization manager and app dynamics for cloud monitoring. Now app dynamics is a solution uh, actually Cisco has acquired that company and uh, this is providing actually the visibility inside the data center so not data center but it can be integrated anywhere uh, inside Cisco data center we know that ACI solution so ACI and app dynamics uh, integration solution is there to get the end-to-end -end visibility to get the traffic flow not only that it will show you the pictorial representation of the traffic flow, but it will uh, present nice uh, graph as well, you know. So you have the full visibility for application, the end-to-end -end delivery for those application. We can go deep inside that and we can check different type of reports as well, the App Dynamics is able to generate. Now, App Dynamics has a support for cloud hosted applications as well, like AWS monitoring, Microsoft Azure, Pivotal Cloud Foundry Monitoring, Cloud Foundry uh, Foundations, Rack Space Monitoring. I can see that list is long. Okay, so what's interesting thing here is that that you have one solution which is going to provide you the app visibility into in traffic flow. Okay, so that app visibility that we have if we go and integrate with the workload optimization manager so somehow which resources they are doing what task um, either it's a network related or maybe compute related or a storage related is all overall uh, task related to data center so we know that in data center we have dc networking we have dc compute we have dc storage Correct. So you need integration where you have the visibility and you have the management for the workload. And we, if we go and integrate both in single bucket, then we'll find that we are getting 
So once we have the integration, then the workload optimization manager will perform analysis, anticipate the risk of uh, risk to performance or efficiency, and recommend actions you can take avoid problems before they occur. And somehow you are getting the information uh, about your resources, about your availability, about your workload optimization uh, management. I will go and log in there. You'll find that uh, you have the dashboard where you can go and select cloud resource or what resources you want to check. And then it will give you the detail about the workload information. Correct. So on top, you can see here, I will show you in the dashboard application on prem cloud. Once you go in the cloud, you can see the business application, business transaction services, oops, and all. So those informations are there inside the workload optimi optimization manager. So not only that it will provide you the management related to your infrastructure that is on-prem, but over the cloud as well. Means it is the end-to-end -end, uh, optimization manager or workload manager, uh, which is going to provide you the summary detail about your compute, your storage, database consumption, CPU memory, latency, database transaction units as well. Nice end-to-end -end solution. Okay, so let me show you first of all the workflow, not the workflow, but the overall uh, walkthrough for App Dynamics. Okay, and then I will log into the optimization manager, and then uh, there also I will show you the important uh, tabs. So let me go here to the App Dynamics here you can see. Uh, once you log into the App Dynamics on the top, you can see the home application, user experience, database, analytics, dashboard, and reports and alerts and respond. Inside home, a unified monitoring, getting a started cloud platform. So uh, let me show you one by one that uh, you can go in this deep and you can perform certain tasks related to the app. So here you can see that we have last visited tabs and then I can go here, you can see the application one, uh, AD Financial Light ACI is selected. I can go there and then we can proceed further. Oops. So I clicked uh, on that application and as you can see, we are still in the dashboard. You can see how robust this is and it is creating the flow type of diagram. So I can see that uh, different, different departments and then the flow where they are connecting, where the traffic is moving, etc. So let me scroll down a little bit here. And then I can go to the account management. You can see the flow, how many calls or the uh, latency, all those details you are getting. Then I can go to the web front end. And from there also you can see we have nice visual representation. It is telling you about the information about the calls and the flow. Then I can go to the tier and notes. I want to check the um, business transactions. So let's go and check about that. Now we want to check the process policy. Then I can go and check the order process. You can see the color coding as well. So color is also there, uh, which is telling you that it's a slow, it's a very slow, it's a stale error. Normal is green. Okay, a slow is yellowish, yellow type, that's a slow. Okay, so I want to check very slow. So you can go to very slow. You can check the date time stamp. Once you are in the date time stamp, you can see the user experience is very slow. And if you want to check more inside the order processing, you can go and check this alert, error alert was there. Once we are going there, it is telling that app dynamic sample related to this, you can see the time in millisecond is much higher, 84.5%. HTTP related, here you can see that HTTP exit call, we can drill down, we can see the problem is, you can see how deep we are going inside object object and we are getting the information about that issue. Correct? All right, so it's like this, you can go more, drill down more and more and more, and you can get the information about the app time. Finally, I can go and close this task. Okay, 
Now, next, what I want to show you, I want to show you the workload manager. So let me quickly go and show you the workload manager. Here we have, okay. Now, uh, once we are here, you can see that cloud executive, let me quickly click to the dashboard. On dashboard, you can see on-prem cloud executive dashboard container platform. Once you're inside the cloud exec uh, executive dashboard, you can see the total missed investment, total realized investment, total miss it is telling you the cost analysis as well. Necessary investment, potential saving, efficiency, uh, yeah, efficiency optimization in terms of money, how it is taking. Uh, how much actions, how much money. This complete workload, not only that uh, workload in terms of what task is there, but it is telling you the cost effect as well. And then you can see that cost breakup, build cost. Then you can see the RI utilization, RI coverage. Detail about the uh, optimization options we have. All right, so what I will do here, uh, let's go back to the dashboard. Once you're in the dashboard, and if you want to check detail about this, you see, we have the option. We can check this flow chart and detail about this flow chart. Uh, two hour, 24 hour, this time stamp is also there. Okay. Now what I will do here, let's click to the plan. And some of the plans are there. Uh, see nightly plan is there, user plan is there. Even you can go and add new plan, optimize the cloud. So public cloud and on-prem, both options you have. Once we are inside that, we can go and select the cloud. Cloud provider is AWS. So you can see that uh, we have options, select the cloud. I can go and click run the plan in the bottom. And then the plan is starting, okay? It's loading the plan. It's it will it uh, will give you the detail you know that is required for the plan action. You can see the result overview. You can see in the bottom that you have workload mapping, the current one, the optimized one, which is giving the suggestion as well. All right, so let's go to the place as well. There also I can show you a few of the things. Create the reservation. We can go and create the reservation from there. Okay, uh, I'm not going much deep inside this, but uh, we are checking all these uh, things related to check the options that we have uh, with respect to cloud monitoring. So app dynamics is for visibility. And then we have workload optimization manager where we can go and do various tasks related to resource management. Okay, let me go back to the main dashboard. Once we are in the main dashboard, you can see on top you have the application, you have on-prem and the cloud. Inside the cloud, you can see the business applications, you the business transactions, services, application, component containers, virtual machine, etc. Okay, if I scroll down, you can see a little bit more detail about that. Click to the business transaction, and then you can see the details, policies, list of business transactions, etc. Good amount of information. All right, so this was the walkthrough related to App Dynamics and related to Cisco Workload Manager. Let's stop here. Last topic we have in this section is Cisco Titration. Cisco Titration is a solution that is going to provide you rich traffic flow telemetry and going to add this critical data center operations use case. So what it is doing that uh, it has the telemetry solution, not only with the software, but with the hardware as well. And not only with the on-prem, but with the cloud workloads as well. The good thing about Cisco Creation, I'm going to show you in the dashboard, that it has nice GUI. And from that GUI, we can have all the visualization. We can do all such type of configurations.
Okay, so when I go and log into the uh, GUI, you will find that the dashboard and you have dashboard for all different different sections. I will go and explain there in the in the GUI itself. But for example, if you are looking for titration security dashboard, you'll find that you have this score for the security zero to 100, obviously towards 100 is good, towards zero is not good. So not only that we have the score, but if you want to go deep inside that particular event, that particular task, you'll find that it is giving more and more and detail output related to that event or option. Here you can see that security dashboard. Uh, first of all, it is telling the over, uh, overall health. It's a B plus, uh, different grading systems are there. But then you can see the breakdown for the vulnerability score, the process hash score, attack surface, forensic score, network anomaly, segment compliance score. Now, again, you can go deep inside all these scores and you can see the individuals inside that so here you can see that you have different different dashboards like vulnerability like security etc i'm going to show you in the uh, next section likewise you have vulnerability dashboard where you can go and check the uh, common vulnerability scoring system this common vulnerability and we can go check detail about that so on top you have the filter either it is cvss v2 or v3 and then you can see that uh, different color codings are there for different different vulnerabilities and uh, different different CVE numbers. Yep, you can see that score V2. You can see a score V3 like that on top. Also, we can go and select the V2 and V3 scores. And the nice thing about Tradition is that they have support with the REST API as well. Uh, so we can go and run the commands, or we can go and write the code. Uh, with respect to APIs calls as well. Let me quickly go and show you the dashboard. So here you can see that we are inside the dashboard and you can see on the top that you have visibility. Inside visibility, you have the visibility dashboard. But once I am inside the visibility, you can see that you have visibility dashboard, flow search, inventory search, inventory filter, neighborhood. Once you are inside the visibility, you can see that you have the, um, drill down so top provider uh, addresses top provider port srtt distribution likewise okay then uh, you can go and check the flow search and it's loading you can see the nice gui option is there you have multiple options for filter you, you can go and check the uh, multiple things here you can go and do the filters good amount of filters are available that we have nice dashboard and where we can go and check the information in detail. Likewise, if you go to segmentation, segmentation, you have segmentation dashboard, you can go and check the segmentation. You can go to the security, inside security, you have the security dashboard that we have seen in the PPT as well. Inside security, you can see the vulnerabilities, forensic analysis, lockout, uh, annotations as well. Now here you can see nice GUI related to security dashboard. You can see the vulnerability score 40. And now it is telling about that uh, at what particular time you have uh, most vulnerabilities workload. So 12 workload and if I scroll a little bit down, you can see much more information, detailed information about that. Now. Uh, individually, if you're looking for vulnerability, you can go and click to vulnerabilities and then you will get the, the score on the top. You can see that you have CVSS V2 or V3 distribution. You can filter according to that. You can see 407 remotely executable vulnerability, remotely exploitable vulnerability, locally exploited, etc. So nice, nice drill down, nice graph chart, you can go to the individual graph chart. You can click, you can get the details, correct? Likewise, again, we can go to the security and we can see the forensic analysis lockout annotations. Then we have the for, uh, performance. We can go and click to the performance dashboard. Again, the summary for all overall network. It's app limited, network limited, TCP packet transmission, things will come. 
then you have the data platform, then you have the alert, configure, current alert, and then the maintenance version, etc. Okay, so you can see clearly here that we have nice dashboard, which is giving most of the information with respect to Cisco analytics, Cisco rotation, both on-prem and the cloud are supported here.